This is The Malice Code, a Remy Laurent FBI suspense thriller, book three, written by Ava Strong, narrated by Kevin E. Green. Prologue The Church of St. Augustine, Rome, 7.45 p.m. Gareth Jax considered himself a hunter. While many younger men would chuckle to hear the portly, bespectacled man of fifty call himself such, especially since he had never stalked game or even held a gun, Gareth felt the comparison was more than appropriate. For he didn't hunt animals, he hunted knowledge. He was one of the best in the business, and he only went after big game. Gareth had been all over the world, delving into old books and hidden byways of knowledge, from the medieval Coptic monasteries of Egypt to the great universities of Europe, from the Library of Congress to the family manuscript collections of Timbuktu, Gareth Jacks had made a study of some of the most obscure and difficult works to uncover the rarest of knowledge. But at the moment, he had to admit he was stumped. The church library had some of the rarest works of early medieval theology anywhere, because the Church of St. Augustine dated back to the 8th century, making it one of Rome's oldest, and was run by the Benedictine Order, it had kept its ancient library separate from that of the Vatican. There were books here that could be found nowhere else. So far, that hadn't made any difference. Gareth had been sitting in the vaulted reading room at one end of the basement chapel for two weeks now, straining his eyes as he read the tiny, faded Latin handwriting of long-dead scribes, hoping to come across what he sought. He hadn't. For fourteen days, while above him tourists in their tens of thousands wandered the streets of Rome, taking pictures and eating gelato, he had sat alone in the cold stone vaulted cellar, searching. At first he had been thrilled, reading through sixth and seventh century sermons preached against the heresies of a Catholic church, still forming its ideology and trying to find its way. He had worked patiently, steadily, hunting down obscure references and cryptic hints, hoping to find a reference to what he sought. He had found nothing, at least not anything direct. Some mentioned the book, but since it had already been declared a heresy, no writing said anything about its contents, or if any copies had been preserved. On the contrary, A couple of scribes wrote about how caches of the book were found and used as kindling when their owners were burned at the stake. As one writer declared in a manuscript from 681 AD, Thank Almighty God every one of the copies of the accursed text have been consigned to the pyre. No copy has been found in the hands of heretics for a generation or more. Gareth did not believe that. He did not believe that such an important, potentially earth-shattering book could be lost for all time. He had found far too many so-called lost texts, to ever give up once he had started a hunt. He would have bet his entire personal fortune that a copy existed in the secret Vatican Library, where the Church kept its most controversial documents, but it might as well have been used to burn a medieval heretic. That collection was as far out of reach for someone like him as the moon. Even most cardinals and archbishops were refused entry. Given his background and associations, Gareth Jacks couldn't even get into the public tourist areas of the Vatican without a fake ID. The church wouldn't let someone with his knowledge pass the gates of Vatican City. At least the Benedictines were understanding enough to let him use their library. The Opus Dei and some of the other conservative factions wouldn't even answer his emails. Gareth absent-mindedly pushed up the sleeve of his left arm and scratched the inside of his wrist, where the letter P was tattooed in the Gothic style. It was a habit of his when deep in thought, but he only did it when he was alone. A soft step echoing through the cellar's chill interior made him quickly pull down his sleeve and turn. Brother Luco was lighting candles in front of the icons of the Virgin Mary, St. Benedict and St. Augustine at the far end of the room. His dark blue robes matched the sombre tones the painter had used for the icons. "'It is late, Signor Jacks,' the monk said in Italian when he saw him looking. Gareth rubbed his tired eyes. "'Yes,' he sighed. Suddenly he realised he was hungry, and his back hurt, and his neck. Twelve hours hunched over medieval manuscripts took a toll on the body, especially the eyes. 
A nice pasta dish and a carafe of wine would take care of that. Then, relaxing in his hotel room with Beethoven playing through his phone before an early night. First thing tomorrow morning he'd be fresh and ready for the chase. Gareth rose, stretched and packed up his notes in his leather briefcase. He did not take notes on a computer. Computers could be hacked. At the other end of the room, Brother Lucone stood saying a prayer in front of the icons. As the researcher passed him, the monk asked, Did you find what you're looking for, Signor Jacks? I've found much of interest, Brother Lucone, he said pleasantly, then turned to leave. The Benedictines were a good group of people, and Brother Luco was friendly enough, but it paid to be careful. The church had eyes and ears everywhere. Gareth passed through a small portal that took him to a narrow staircase under a low, vaulted ceiling. Ascending its worn stone steps, he came out into the church. Only a few candles shone. Their light barely reached the vaulted ceiling, despite the Church of St. Augustine being so much smaller than most of the later houses of worship in this city. Gareth passed by the icons and side altars without a glance, even though they would be of great interest to students of the early Middle Ages. They did not offer what he was looking for. No church would be so bold. He could hear Brother Luco following him so he could lock up. No one else was here. Gareth did not turn around. He did not want to make conversation. Good night, Brother Luco, he said once he reached the main portal a heavy thing of wood banded with metal which he had to strain to open. Good night, Signore Jax. Gareth stepped out into the warm springtime evening. The western sky was still the deep blue of final dusk. A few stars shone overhead, competing with the infrequent streetlights on this neglected back street. The researcher paused in front of the church to remove his sweater. It was a good fifteen degrees warmer out here than in that vault. Tucking it under his arm, he took a deep breath, smiled, and walked along the street. He knew a good little place not far from here where he could eat. If he turned left, he would soon get to a main street that would lead him to it in five minutes. But he took a different way. Through the winding, narrow lanes the crowds avoided. At this time in the evening, the tourists and the locals out for a fun evening would be on the main street with their lights and their bars and their restaurants. Too much noise. Too many people. Gareth liked silence and solitude. The back streets lined with buildings dating to the 19th or 18th centuries, but mirroring the routes taken by roads dating back to the foundation of the Church of St. Augustine would lead him there with only a little extra time and a lot more peace and quiet. He strolled along, the frustrations of the day easing now that he was out in the fresh air and moving again. For a time he was alone, but then a footfall behind him made him turn. He saw no one in the darkened lane. Gareth shrugged, some local going home or heading out for a bit of supper like him. A minute later he passed an older man out walking his dog. The man's footsteps receded. Gareth turned a corner. Suddenly the dog started barking. Its owner hushed it in irritated Italian. Gareth kept walking. A young woman came his way, walking quickly, clinging her purse tight to her side, high heels clacking on the cobblestones. Gareth looked away. He had always been uncomfortable around women, especially in a situation like this. She was obviously nervous about being out alone at night. Should he cross to the other side of the street to make her feel better? No, that might seem strange to her and make her even more nervous. But staying on her side of the street would mean she would have to pass right by him. He tensed, looking further away from her as he walked right in her direction. Perhaps he should pull one of his papers out of his bag and read it. No thug would do that. But if he opened his case, she might think he was going for a weapon. No, oh, it was all so complicated. Give him medieval Latin any day. Before Gareth came to a decision, the woman passed in a waft of perfume. Gareth inhaled the delicate scent, thinking how nice it would be to have someone to share his work, perhaps a specialist in ancient Greek, to balance out his focus on Latin. And pretty, of course. Social. Someone who knew how to go to parties. Someone who could help him be a bit more in the world. Gareth smiled sadly. That would never happen. The woman's footsteps increased in pace. Had he scared her? They receded, and all grew silent again. He could see the last turn he needed to take, the intersection faintly glowing from the bigger street he knew lay about a hundred yards beyond the corner. A nice dish of pasta and a carafe of wine would improve his mood. 
It was then that Gareth heard the quick approach of footsteps behind him. He whirled around, suddenly afraid, but the man was on him so quickly he didn't get chance to see his features. An arm of incredible strength threw him into a recessed doorway, his head smacking against the heavy wooden portal, momentarily stunning him. Before he knew it, a cord was around his neck, tightening, cutting off his breath. A knee in the small of his back stretched his spine painfully and increased the pressure on his throat. Gareth dropped his briefcase and sweater and scrabbled up the cord that strangled him. The garrote eased back a little. Gareth sucked in breath. My wallet is in my... Never mind your money. Where is your tattoo? A harsh voice demanded. My... Oh, no. Not after all this time. The unseen assailant tugged at the garrote, jerking Gareth's head back. Where is it? My wallet is in my... The attacker gave another tug. You know what I mean. Where is it? My left wrist. Show me. With a trembling hand, Gareth pulled back his sleeve to show the gothic letter P, followed by a period. Please, I... Those were the last words Gareth got to say. The knee pressed against his back again, and the garrote dug into his neck, choking off air and drawing blood. Gareth fought, elbowing the man and stomping on his feet, but he knew he was already dead. When they came for you, they always got you. As consciousness faded into eternal darkness, Gareth Jacks did not think of the many books he had written, or the many hidden secrets he had teased out of medieval manuscripts. He did not even think of the awards he had won from his peers. He only thought of the smell of that perfume from a couple of minutes before. After Gareth slumped dead in the doorway, his killer put away the garrote. He glanced in both directions to make sure no one was in sight, and pulled out a straight razor. Rolling up his victim's sleeve, he began to cut. Chapter One Georgetown University The Next Day Remy Laurent, visiting history professor at Georgetown University, had a hard conversation ahead of her. She had to ask her department head to cover for her afternoon classes. She needed to have a meeting with the FBI. Again. So far, the university had been very accommodating in giving her time off to work with the FBI. The dean loved the idea and had finangled several free lectures from FBI agents for the Criminal Justice Department. He also liked the positive outreach and bridging the gap between academia and the federal government. Translated into English, that meant he hoped for more federal funding next semester. The head of the history department was less enthusiastic. Cyril Mullen was not only her direct supervisor, he was her lover, and he was not happy with her new sideline. She knocked on Cyril's office door, her heart starting to beat faster. Their relationship had just gone through a rocky patch and had not entirely healed and here she was, about to cause trouble again. "'Come in,' Cyril said, in that brusque manner he used when he was busy. When she opened the door and he saw who it was, that manner disappeared immediately. "'Remy,' he said, smiling and half-rising, "'come on in.' At fifty years old, Cyril was twelve years older than Remy, but looked only in his early forties. He had an erect, muscular figure toned by hours on the racquetball court. Only his salt-and-pepper hair swept back over a broad forehead, and the worry lines stamped on his face from the troubles of running an academic department told his real age. His smile faltered when she did not close the door like she usually did. This was, he could tell, going to be a business meeting, not a few snatched kisses between classes. "'What's on your mind?' he said in a more official tone as he sat. Only his eyes remained soft lingering on hers before straying over her body. Despite her apprehension, Remy smiled back. For a middle-aged academic, Cyril was a remarkably virile lover. Remy paused, glancing around at the shelves of books on nineteenth-century American diplomacy, many by him, before deciding to rip off the bandage with one quick jerk. The FBI asked me if I could go to a meeting at their office this afternoon. Cyril's face darkened. Nice of them to give you plenty of notice. I'm going to the national office here in D.C. I don't have to go down to Quantico like last time. They were down at the Quantico office because the head of the new division was teaching there. Now that the Antiquities division has moved from the experimental phase, 
It has its offices in the main headquarters here in Washington. How wonderful for them, Cyril grumbled. I'll only miss my 2 p.m. class, and perhaps my 4 p.m. As well as several days of other classes while you go running around God knows where chasing dangerous criminals. We don't know that. I might just have to look at some photos of stolen artifacts like last week. That job took me all of about three hours. And was very disappointing. I was hoping to rush off to another adventure. Instead, I was back to my lectures and grading papers by the early afternoon. If it was something like that, they would have emailed you, Cyril said. Good point. I'm sorry, Cyril, but the way the assistant director put it, it sounded important. So, no three-hour job looking at photos, then? Her lover said with a resigned shrug. Remy paused, trying to control a mounting irritation. She understood Cyril's point of view. With the puritanical rules of American universities, they had a hard enough job trying to spend time together. Her absences made it worse. But still, this was her life, not his. Of course he wanted it to be their life. Getting married would stop the objections, and solve the problem of her work visa ending at the end of the academic year. All that made for a good reason not to go to FBI headquarters. The chance for another mission, the excitement of the chase, the opportunity to actually help people in a real way, those were reasons to go. And those reasons won out. Can you get someone to cover me? Remy asked. Only for symbolism in art. Germaine could do it. She has a wonderful lecture on Greek Orthodox icons, all prepared with PowerPoint and everything. She's given it several times, and wouldn't need any preparation. The Italian Renaissance Politics Lecture is a graduate course. I can just send them an email to work on their papers. Cyril huffed, looked out of the window. For a moment he said nothing, and when he did speak the words came out quiet, pensive. After you came back from hunting that cryptex killer, you seemed like a different person. You couldn't stop moving. You talked a mile a minute. I thought it was just the after-effects of being in so much danger. But while it subsided, it never really went away. Then there was that second case that took you to Italy. I took it badly. I was rude, and I'm sorry. But when you came back, you were even more distant, not just with me, but with everyone. At the faculty meetings, you spend most of the time staring off into space. And at that cocktail party Stephen held last week, you barely said a word. It's like you're not here any more. Your mind is a million miles away. A third caper like that, and I think I'll lose you for good. Remy glanced over her shoulder to make sure no one was in the hall, and then reached across the desk to take his hand. You're not going to lose me, Cyril. You know how much I care about you. But I need to do this. They held each other's hands in a tight grip until footsteps in the corridor made the move apart. Three hours later, Remy sat in the office of Keiko Ochiai, assistant director of the Antiquities Division. The corner office was cool and comfortable. Remy eased into a padded, ergonomic chair in front of the assistant director's orderly desk and admired the black-and-white photos of cattle and ranch hands adorning the walls. This was Mrs. Ochiai's hobby, taking photos of her father's ranch and neighbouring areas in West Texas. "'It's good to see you again, Professor Laurent,' Assistant Director Ochiai said in a Texas drawl, an aspect of her that Remy had yet to get used to. If she closed her eyes, she'd imagine some white woman with a plug of chewing tobacco and a shotgun not a middle-aged Asian woman in an expensive business suit. It's good to be here. Where's Daniel? I mean, Agent Walker? He's assisting with some routine investigations. We don't have anything pressing at the moment for the division, although the way things have been in our first couple of months, I don't think that situation will last for long. Because of this, I wanted to discuss your status in the agency. My status? Remy didn't think she had a status. She had twice been a civilian consultant on important cases, and once on a minor issue, but when she wasn't working on something for the FBI, she was a normal citizen. A French citizen, and one whose work visa would be running out at the end of the next semester. Then it would be back to the Sorbonne, the most prestigious institute of higher learning in France. 
and one that, sadly, never got her involved in any murder cases. Yes, the assistant director went on. I've been speaking with my superiors, and we think that you have been an excellent asset to the agency. It would be a shame to lose you when the academic term ends. Requesting an extension to your work visa when you are only a part-time civilian consultant would be tricky. So the agency feels that its needs would be better served if we offered you full-time employment. Remy blinked. She herself had suggested this at the beginning of her and Daniel's second case, but they had dismissed the idea. She had never held out much hope that they would come around. What had changed? I see, Remy said, suddenly unsure of herself. She had become resigned to being only a civilian adviser, and suddenly being offered what she had asked for put her off balance. If you don't mind my saying, this is quite a change from the agency's previous position. Assistant Director Ochiai smiled. You've convinced them. You convinced me after you solved the Cryptex killer case. But those in the higher echelons never thought we'd be getting a second serial killer case that would involve your talents. Now, of course, the chances of a third such case occurring are slim to none. But our division will see a lot of work across borders that will require specialist knowledge. You would make a perfect fit. Would I continue to work with Agent Walker? You've worked well together. I don't see any reason to split up a winning combination. Remy let out a slow breath and leaned back in her seat. Why did Ochiai's answer fill her with equal parts excitement and dread? Daniel was a bit of a brute, but he had a caring side too, as well as a moody side. He tried very hard to camouflage beneath a rough exterior. The man was almost as much of a puzzle as the cryptex she was still trying to solve. She found herself thinking about him a lot and missing him when she wasn't on a case. He was so unlike the pleasant academics with whom she spent most of her time. Ochiai must have caught something in Remy's expression before she went on. I know you have responsibilities at Georgetown, and Agent Walker has mentioned that you might get your visa extended through other means. Ochiai gave her a knowing smile. But the FBI would very much like to have a more established working relationship with you. If I say no, would I be able to continue as a civilian consultant? Of course. You're too good an asset to lose. That made Remy's chest puff up with pride. For such an accomplished law enforcement official to say that was a rare compliment indeed. But then doubt washed over her. What had Cyril said about feeling like he was losing her? Then I'll have to respectfully decline, Remy said. The words came out quickly, and once they were out, Remy regretted them, while at the same time feeling relieved that she had said them. Moving from academia to the FBI would be a one-way path. If she stayed in the agency for more than a few years, and they'd certainly expect that, her academic life would be over. She knew what it was like on investigations. She wouldn't have time for much research. Those who didn't publish on a regular basis soon faded from the scholarly community. All her work, learning Latin and climbing the academic ladder, would vanish and be forgotten. And then there was Cyril's reaction to think of. She hated to feel like his emotions had any control over her. But she loved him, and if changing careers, something she wasn't even sure she wanted to do, hurt her relationship, then it wasn't worth it. Assistant Director Ochai was studying her. Remy realised she hadn't followed up her answer with an explanation lost as she was in her own conflicting emotions. I think it's best if I stayed in academia and worked as a civilian consultant. I'll be staying on after this term, so I'll still be available. Archie I smiled, a knowing, warmer one this time. Then I guess congratulations are in order. Remy managed to smile back. Thank you. She could feel the tension rising in her, telling someone she would be getting married. Even someone who didn't know Cyril made her feel trapped. But why? Cyril could be moody, even petulant, but he was also a loving man, a brilliant scholar, and one who volunteered much of his spare time to charity. There was so much to love about him. So, why this tension? Why this reluctance? These thoughts swirled through her head, and she and Ochiai shook hands and exchanged pleasantries. They chased her down the hall and pressed down on her in the elevator. 
in the underground parking lot. They flitted around her head like ghosts, her echoing footsteps sounding like their mocking laughter. Hey! Remy let out a little squeal as she stopped short to keep from bumping into the man in front of her. Agent Daniel Walker. The FBI agent wore his usual black suit and tie, rather poorly tailored for his tall, broad-shouldered frame. His soft middle didn't help the effect. Remy felt like introducing him to Cyril's tailor, not that he'd go. He didn't care about fashion any more than he cared about nutrition. Daniel wore his brown hair cut short, his brown eyes, often hard, were at the moment soft with amusement. "'Are you psychic or something?' the FBI agent asked. "'Oh, hello. Psychic?' Remy said, still flustered. "'I was about to call you, and here you are.' "'Oh, I, um, had a meeting with the assistant director, Ochi.' Daniel looked confused. "'Oh, didn't know that.' What were you going to call me about? Daniel smiled one of those lopsided cocky smiles of his. I want to whisk you away to a fun-filled vacation in Italy. I beg your pardon? An American expat has been murdered in strange circumstances. Very strange circumstances. I thought we could go check it out. It's right up your alley. Remy wasn't sure what alley he was referring to. She still hadn't learned the American idioms. There were almost as many as there were in French. Was the assistant director approve my going? She will if I ask. I don't think she's familiar with the case. It just came down the wire. When would we have to go? Now? Remy's breath caught. Daniel cocked his head. Is that a yes? Yes. The word came out as quick and as unplanned as her refusal to Ochi, but with far fewer mixed emotions. CHAPTER TWO That evening Remy and Daniel sat on the plane to Rome, going over the case. Despite the long flight and cramped seats, Remy could already feel her pulse pounding at the chance for another mystery to solve. That excitement was mingled with guilt at leaving so abruptly. The FBI had smoothed things over with the Dean as usual, but Cyril, in their few minutes together as she packed her bags, had been sullen. That had her worried, but she told herself that there was nothing she could do about it while she was in the air. She'd call once she landed and try to make him feel better. In the meantime, there was a case to focus on. There wasn't much yet. Daniel had held off telling her anything until they got on the plane, enjoying her anticipation and impatience like a parent telling his child to eat their breakfast before opening presents on Christmas morning. But now she finally got to unwrap it. He put a slim folder on the fold-down tray in front of her seat. Gareth Jacks was a private researcher from... Gareth Jacks, Remy said. You knew him? I knew his reputation. He was one of the best independent researchers of early medieval Latin texts there ever was. Really? Did you ever meet him? No, I wish I had. I had a great deal of respect for him. He really pushed the boundaries, forged new avenues for research. Such an inspiration. But no, I never met him. He was a recluse. He hardly ever came to conferences. I've read many of his publications, so... Daniel grinned. I knew you were going to be helpful on this case. Well, Mr. Jacks was researching some old books at the Church of St. Augustine in Rome. After leaving the church last night, he got strangled to death just a few streets away. Garot. That's a thin cord that... I know, Garot is a French word. Well, la di da Anyway, he got garroted but not robbed. A wallet with two hundred euros in it wasn't taken. Neither was a fairly expensive watch or his phone. He was strangled in a doorway, then laid on his back. His shirt was removed and thrown to the side. And here's where it gets really weird. Open the folder. She did as she was asked. There was a picture of the body. A rectangular section of the flesh of the inside wrist had been cut out. Remy gasped. So did the woman sitting next to her. Sorry, Remy mumbled, closing the folder. The woman looked pale. FBI work. The Italian CSI say the flesh was removed with a straight razor, Daniel went on, as if they were alone. The wound wasn't deep, more of a thin slice like you'd do with a Thanksgiving turkey. 
There was the click of a seat belt and a rustle of clothing as the woman next to Remy got out of the seat and hurried to an unoccupied row. So that wound wasn't life threatening? Remy asked, matching her partner's nonchalance. It was kind of fun. Not at all. And it seems to have been done after Jax was killed. The lines were straight, as if the body was already lying still, and there wasn't much blood. Any ideas? Perhaps to remove an identifying mark or tattoo? Remy asked. Daniel gave her a thumbs up that warmed her heart. Why she cared about this man's approval was beyond her, but she did. That is generally the case in acts like this, Daniel said. I've seen it before. But if the killer wanted to remove identifying marks, why leave the phone and wallet? Good point, Remy conceded. She thought for a moment. What about his notes? Notes? You said he had just left after a day of researching in the church. Did he have any notes on him? A laptop? No laptop and no notes. He might have left them in the church library where he was working. Remy shook her head. Not Jax. He was famously secretive about his research. No one knew what he was working on until he published it. No. What did he specialize in? Early medieval heresies. Did he publish a lot? Not very often. But when he did, his work would always have a major impact. He had a knack for finding books that were assumed lost, digging into the most obscure and remote libraries in order to find what he was looking for. Sounds like you two would have gotten along. I never met him. Most of us never met him. But he was certainly one of the most capable independent researchers in any field of history. Yeah. I saw he didn't have any university affiliation. How did he make his money? I don't know. Perhaps he inherited it. Interesting, Daniel said, flipping through the CSI report. So, why would a specialist in medieval heresies get strangled to death and have a portion of his skin peeled off? The man in front of them turned around and stared. When Remy met his eye, he quickly turned to face forward. Remy suppressed a chuckle. When she and Cyril flew to conferences, their conversations never turned heads or made someone go to another seat. She suppressed her amusement. A colleague was dead, horribly murdered for mysterious reasons. As exciting as these manhunts could be, they were in deadly earnest. They weren't on an adventure, they were fighting evil. And the first thing they needed to do was to go to where Gareth Jacks was last seen, in the church of St. Augustine. As was typical with flights to Europe, they got to Rome in the early hours of the morning, red-eyed and yawning. The church wasn't even open for visitors when they got there, but a Benedictine monk waited outside to let them in. He was a thin man in his early forties, with sunken cheeks that were highlighted rather than hidden by his neatly trimmed beard. Remy addressed the monk in Italian. "'I and my partner are with the FBI,' she said with more pride than accuracy. "'I believe Interpol called ahead to tell you we were coming.' "'Yes, they called. I am Brother Luco, the church librarian. Poor Signor Jax, God rest his soul, was working in our library for several days.' He shook both their hands and turned to open the old portal with a heavy brass key longer than his hand. The door opened with a creak, and they entered the cool interior. The lights were off. The morning sun passing through the stained glass windows of the east wall provided the only illumination. While the stained glass was obviously fifteenth century in style, the church itself dated to the eighth, with a few additions and modifications here and there. Remy glanced over it with a practised eye, as Brother Luco led them down the nave and to a door tucked behind a pillar near the altar. She did not ask to stop so she could look at anything more closely. Gareth Jacks was a man of books. Whatever he was looking for wasn't up here. They walked down a stairway of well-worn flagstones, the cool air welcome after the warmth of an Italian spring. At the landing they passed through a heavy wooden arched door that had probably been there for centuries and entered the cellar. Remy smiled. This was the sort of place that put her at ease and her late colleague, too. Near the door hung Renaissance icons of the Virgin Mary, St. Augustine and St. Benedict, an array of votive candles standing before them. In the cool air hung the smell of burning wax and incense. The cellar was rectangular, almost like a wide hallway, arched, 
and with a few niches in which stood statues of various religious figures. At one end were several long bookshelves, full of tomes bound in leather or vellum. A couple of desks stood in front of these bookshelves. On one was a stack of books. Remy hurried over there. This is where Signor Jack sat, Brother Luco said unnecessarily. I need to examine these, Remy said, taking the dead man's place. They might be pertinent to the case. Jack's made quite a few ripples with his research, stepped on quite a few toes, and I can't think of any other reason why someone would want to kill him. If you know of any other volumes he consulted, could you bring them to me? It was customary in these old manuscript libraries for the librarian to bring the books. The researcher, even one of Jack's calibre, couldn't just go pluck books off the shelf. Brother Luco dutifully went down one aisle and started taking down books. As he did so, Remy looked through the four volumes on the desk. All were early manuscripts. The latest was Guglielmo's Early Heresies Against Mother Church, from 1532. It was an uncommon volume, but not a rare one. It was also a thick volume. In the early days, when the Catholic Church was still hammering out its doctrine, there had been many alternative views, most of which quickly fell out of favour. Some became popular and had to be suppressed as heresy. Guglielmo's book was an important early summary of this period, bringing together a wide variety of sources. Jax had almost certainly read it before, and had only needed to consult something in it. The other three were more interesting. Two were collections of sermons from various Italian bishops of the 6th and 7th centuries, handwritten on vellum. A note on the first page, dated to the year 1087, noted that this precious book has been in the library of the Church of St. Augustine since its founding. The last book was an extremely rare copy of the collected letters of Pope John II, who reigned from 533 to 535. Remy turned their ancient pages carefully, not sure what she was looking for. All but Guglielmo's volume were handwritten in faded ink, with some pages eaten by bookworms, so these weren't the kind of texts you could just skim. I need time with these, Remy said. Take all the time you need, or at least all the time we can afford, Daniel said, fiddling with his phone. I can't get any reception down here. An officer from the local police department is supposed to meet us here and show us the crime scene. I'm going to go upstairs and see if I can get in touch. You need a translator? They texted in English, so I guess I'm getting someone who speaks English. Probably not American, but beggars can't be choosers. Stop pretending to be a barbarian. It doesn't sit well with you. And after we see the murder site, we'll go get some McDonald's, OK? Remy rolled her eyes as he left the room. Brother Luco returned with a stack of books. This is all I can remember him asking for. Others might have slipped my mind. If I remember anything, I'll tell you. Thank you very much. Remy started looking through them. The Benedictine monk stepped away, then stopped, his robes rustling as he hesitated. Yes? Remy asked. Well, I would not mention this if Signor Jacques had not been murdered. But I got the impression that he was troubled. Troubled how? Brother Luco thought for a moment and said, We get all sorts of visitors here to study in our library, and while it is not fair to generalize about people one doesn't know, I have noticed they fall into certain types. There are the academics, like yourself. Remy blinked. She had introduced herself as FBI, and the monk had seen right through her. And then there are men of the cloth. Then there are the misfits, those on the fringes of society, those with strange theories in their heads, or who simply have never fit in. And what type was Jax? A bit of all three. At first I took him for an academic. I'd heard of him, of course. His research skills were second to none, and he wrote about church history, so I've read some of his work. But he was secretive, obsessive. I could not bring him out in conversation. That is common with academics, too, but that is because they are so self-absorbed. He was that, but secretive, too, as if hiding something. After a few failed attempts at conversation, I left him to himself, but then I noticed something else about his character. 
What was that? Brother Luco motioned towards the icons. I caught him praying sometimes. Caught him? That was an odd turn of phrase. Yes. Sometimes when my duties called me away, I'd return and find him praying at these icons, or praying upstairs in front of the altar. He would quickly leave what he was doing and walk back to where he was working, pretending he had simply been taking a stroll around the room to stretch his legs. Did he say anything when this happened? Never. And there was another strange thing he did at these times. What was that? He would roll down his sleeve. It had been rolled up while he was praying. Which sleeve? The left one, I believe. Remy leaned forward, hopeful. Did you see anything on his skin? His skin? No, why? Remy was saved from having to answer his question by Daniel coming back into the room. Our guy is here in the church. He'll take us to the crime scene and then the morgue. These books will have to wait. Remy felt a chill go down her spine. In her short time with the FBI she had already seen a lot of death, but she had not gotten used to seeing dead bodies and now she had to see the body of one of the most respected researchers in medieval studies. She rested her hand on the stack of rare manuscripts, knowing she needed to get back to examine them. The secret to why he was in this obscure library was contained in them, and she sensed more than she knew that they also contained the motive for his murder. Chapter 3 Daniel led Remy up the stairs, it was nice having her along on this case. He had worried they'd never team up again. Find out anything? he asked. I didn't have much time to look at the books, but Jax was sneaking prayers when Brother Luco wasn't looking, and did it with his sleeve rolled up. I suppose our monk buddy didn't notice anything on his skin. No. Civilians, Daniel grunted. They always make such bad witnesses. They stepped into the church's sombre interior, empty save for a uniformed officer looking up respectfully at a wooden sculpture of Jesus on the cross. So, this church is named after the guy who wrote the confessions, right? Daniel asked. No, it was named after St. Augustine of Canterbury. He started the conversion of the Anglo-Saxons from paganism to Christianity. You're thinking of St. Augustine of Hippo. Hungry, hungry hippos. Daniel sang to cover up his embarrassment at trying to impress her with his knowledge and getting it wrong. Angry, angry hippos. A game from my childhood. Hello, Sergeant Esposito. How about you show us the crime scene? Good morning, the officer said to Remy, making a slight bow. He was a short man with a thick moustache, stocky and strong but with a bit of a belly that showed he liked pasta too much. This way. Take us the shortest route to the crime scene, Daniel said. The officer nodded and led them down a narrow side street. Daniel noted that the street lights were few and far between, and used an older, underpowered brand of bulb. He also noticed that the wider, busier street they had arrived on ran in the same direction as Officer Esposito was leading them. So, why had Jacks taken the dark back route at night? Was he really that much of a recluse? Or did he have something to hide? Or did he know he was being pursued? and he thought he could elude whoever was following him by taking a back route. "'Here it is,' Officer Exposito said, pointing to a recessed doorway to an old stone building divided into apartments. "'Our team had to work quickly because it is the only entrance to these apartments. Even the blood is gone now.' The officer held up a photo of the crime scene, positioning himself so they stood at the same spot where the photographer had stood. The photo was one of the ones they had been sent, but it helped to see it at the actual place. It showed Gareth Jacks with his shirt off, body twisted, and left arm outstretched. The officer held up another photo of a close-up of the arm, and then another of the neck. Remy grimaced, but she did not look away. A thin cord, Daniel said. Not piano wire. Officer Exposito nodded. This is what our theme say. Uh, we'll not go off if you pass through... Uh, how would you call it, uh, the metal detector, uh, but just as deadful. Deadly, Daniel said absent-mindedly, looking around. Did they find anything else? Hair and skin samples? Many, but this is the entrance to the building. 
Daniel moved closer to the doorway and crouched down. While the bloodstain had been removed by someone, probably the apartment cleaning lady, he could see where it had been. The stone was shiny and worn from scrubbing. He looked both left and right. The narrow lane curved here, reducing visibility in both directions. The previous part of the two streets they had been on were relatively straight. They had turned a corner, but there had been no doorways near to that corner. The killer had chosen his spot with care. He had known Jax was going to take this route. Daniel tapped his thumb against his thigh three times, then stood. Take us to the morgue. I want to see the body. Rome City Morgue was much like any other morgue he had ever been to, antiseptic, quiet and chilly. The calm efficiency of the medical staff did nothing to relieve the depressing atmosphere. A petite female doctor with streaks of grey in her hair led them to where the grim metal pull-out shelves stood that contained the bodies. It's this one, she said, reaching for one of the handles. Thank you, Dr. Giuliani, Daniel said. She pulled it out, and they were confronted with a naked man in his middle age, of less than average height and above average weight. His arms were thin and his hands uncalloused. No exercise, not even the gym. He couldn't put up much of a fight, Daniel thought. Not that it would have made much of a difference. I have a feeling we're dealing with a pro. The neck was deeply indented and bruised from a rather thick cord, too thick to be fully efficient for the job. Was the murder weapon quickly made from whatever was at hand? Is the windpipe crushed? Daniel asked. Yes, uh, no displacement of the vertebrae, though, Dr. Giuliani said. He glanced at the doctor and saw she was thinking the same thing he was. Whoever killed him was strong, but not overly so, or perhaps he wanted to extend Jax's agony. Next they examined the inside of the left wrist, where a rectangular piece of flesh about two inches wide and three inches long had been removed. The lines were straight and regular, the cuts at the corners overlapping somewhat, so they could see it had been done with a very sharp edge. The coroner went on. As you can see, the skin was removed in a professional manner, with which I believe was a straight razor. A slight incision was made on all four sides, and then the flesh was peeled back, perhaps with a pair of tweezers, since it would have been slippery to the touch. Pretty tidy work for someone working in the dark in a hurry, Daniel said. Remy made a strangled sound and looked away. Briefly, Daniel felt sorry for her. This is what she had signed up for, though. The job could be pretty grim sometimes, and these details could be vital. I agree, Dr. Giuliani said. This show evidence of calm methodology. There are no other wounds on the body except some scrapes and bruises on the hands from where the victim struggled, and these. With the gentleness one would use to turn an elderly bedridden patient, Dr. Giuliani turned the body on its side to reveal a large bruise at the base of the spine. From where the attacker pressed his knee into the victim's back, she said. Daniel nodded. This guy knew what he was doing. Many amateur attempts at strangulation from behind didn't use the extra pressure of a knee to the back. This not only gave more leverage for the garrote, it helped immobilise the victim. This unfit academic wouldn't have stood a chance. Any drugs or alcohol in the bloodstream? Daniel asked. None. Anything else you can give us, Doctor? Sorry, but no. Thank you. They walked out of the morgue, Daniel giving Remy sidelong glances. While he was glad she had come along, he felt bad for pulling her into this. She looked a bit ill and kept her eyes downcast. Sergeant Exposito waited for them out front. I have spoken with the owner of Signor Jax's Airbnb. He says he will meet us. It is not much far from here. We can walk the way. What's this about an Airbnb? Remy asked. Now that they had left the building, she had begun to collect herself. Our Chicago Bureau talked with Jax's parents, Daniel explained. They didn't know what he was researching, but he told them he was staying in an Airbnb here in Rome. His mother has some health issues, and so Jax always gives them his travel details, just in case they need to get in touch. They gave us the contact information. The thing is, just two nights ago he left this Airbnb and moved into a hotel. We're going to find out why. The night before his murder, 
Remy murmured. Right. That could be relevant? Maybe, maybe not. But it's certainly something to follow up. Sergeant Esposito cut in. The man who owns this apartment is not a suspect, however. We checked on his whereabouts on the night of the murder. He was in a suburb playing the football with his neighborhood league. Many of his teammates and the referee testified to his presence. When he says football, he means soccer, Remy explained to Daniel. I know, Daniel said with a smug smile. You guys stole the name of the world's greatest sport because you couldn't come up with one yourself. Very funny, Remy said. They walked along one of the main roads lined with older stone buildings. On the ground floors were shops and restaurants, mostly catering to the tourist crowd that thronged these streets. The upper floors contained apartments, their shutters closed against the noise and rising heat of the day. The crowd of photo-snapping tourists grew thicker, and they had to shoulder their way through knots of people speaking English or German to keep on going. The Italians, busy with their daily affairs, looked as impatient as Daniel felt. He wondered what it would be like to live in a city so flooded with foreign visitors. Of course, D.C. had plenty of tourists, but only in a few areas. Here in Rome, they seemed to be everywhere. They passed a narrow side street, and Daniel glanced down. What he saw made him stop in his tracks, overcome by a sudden memory. He was twelve. Daniel and his mother were here for one of Mom's innumerable research trips to Europe. He had recently learned the word innumerable. Mom said, You complained about this trip innumerable times already. You don't need to again. Why complain about ancient ruins and gelato? He hadn't replied other than to ask what innumerable meant, because he wasn't really complaining about the trip. Ancient ruins were okay, and the gelato was awesome. He didn't even mind the long flights because they had movies on them, and he always got a big stack of comic books to keep him busy. No, what he didn't like was that Mum's boyfriend always came along. Uncle Roy, as he had been told to call him, took care of him when Mum was busy, which was most of the time. That was just fine by Uncle Roy. Look down that little side street, Uncle Roy said, pointing. Between the newer buildings, still older than anything Daniel had ever seen in the United States, spanned the weathered stones of a Roman arch. Daniel could tell it was Roman by the figures carved on it, and the faint Latin inscription still visible on the top. Uncle Roy was teaching him how to read Latin. The old bastard was teaching him how to do a lot of things. Amazing it's still there after all this time. Let's go take a look, Daniel. There was no one down that street, and it was growing dark. That's okay, I can see it from here. Uncle Roy put a hand on the back of his neck and pushed him gently but firmly in the direction of the side street. Come on, Daniel, let's do a little exploring. I know how much you like it. You coming? Daniel shook himself, snapping back to the present time. Remy and Sergeant Esposito stood a few steps ahead of him, staring at him curiously. "'Do you see something?' the Italian sergeant said, moving back to him and taking a look down the side street. "'Nothing,' Daniel said as he pushed past him. "'Just some old ruins. Let's talk to this Airbnb guy. Maybe we'll get a lucky break and get the hell out of here.' Chapter 4 Remy followed Daniel as they walked up the narrow staircase to the third-floor Airbnb. He had been acting strangely ever since they had arrived in Rome, seemingly on edge and always looking around him as if he was in danger. He only did this in public places, though. Seeing that crumbling Roman arch, he had been transfixed. Once inside this typical apartment building, though, he visibly relaxed and started acting his usual self. After two investigations with this man, she still did not understand him. But now they were on the landing of the third floor, and Jax's former landlord was opening the door. The Airbnb host was a skinny, tall man with a ponytail. He looked in his mid-thirties and a sporty type. Just inside the front door, a tennis racket leaned against the wall. "'Are you Signor Lastra?' the police sergeant asked in Italian. "'Yes,' You mentioned Signor Jax was murdered? Yes. Signor Lastra crossed himself. 
God rest his soul. Do come in. They entered a mid-sized flat. The front hall led to a bathroom and an empty bedroom. Beyond was a living room. I'm sorry, but I don't speak English very well, Signor Lastra said, continuing in his native language. Signor Jack spoke to me in Italian. This was his room. They entered and looked around. There was nothing to be seen, but Daniel began to give it a more thorough inspection. Interesting he knew enough Italian to understand this was the dead man's room, Remy thought. He pretends not to know any Italian at all. Strange. May we see the rest of the apartment while my American colleague searches the room? Sergeant Esposito asked. Certainly. The landlord led them down the hallway into the living room. A large crucifix hung over the mantelpiece. A few personal photos adorned the walls. A large flat screen and a furniture set that looked new filled the rest of the room. My room is in there, the bathroom over there, and the kitchen in there. Sergeant Exposito nodded to Remy and went to check out the rest of the apartment, leaving her alone with Lastra. That made her slightly uncomfortable. While she didn't really suspect this man to be the culprit, he had been arguing with Jax enough to kick him out. We apologise for the inconvenience, Signor Lastra, she said in a quiet voice. It's all right, I have nothing to hide. You told the police you kicked him out. May I ask why? Signor Lastra grunted and gestured at the crucifix. Because of this, and the picture I have of the Holy Family in the kitchen, and the Bible I left in the guest room. Imagine objecting to a Bible. I visited America. There are Bibles in every hotel room. He objected to your faith? Remy asked, recalling that the monk at the church of St. Augustine had caught Jack's praying. She couldn't recall the researcher making any expressions of faith in his many publications. Yes, and in a very strange way, Lastra said. He didn't seem to be an atheist. He conceded the existence of God, but said the Catholic Church was a sham, a trick set up to fool Christians down the wrong path. Imagine saying that of the Holy Mother Church. Even my unbelieving friends are more respectful. So you thought? I tried to be polite. I get all sorts of people sharing my place, and I'm usually pretty tolerant. Otherwise I wouldn't do Airbnb, but he was downright insulting. I tried to ignore him, but he kept at me. What did he say exactly? Remy asked. Did he criticise the church's wealth or complain about paedophile priests? What's this about paedophile priests? Daniel asked, walking into the room. Remy paused. They had been speaking in Italian. She told him in English. We were discussing the argument Signor Lastra had with the victim. Daniel seemed to catch himself. Oh, yeah, I kind of caught a word or two. He looked flustered, so Remy turned away and switched to Italian to speak with the Airbnb host. Go on, Signor Lastra. No, he didn't make any of the usual criticisms which I could have understood. I too think the church needs to be reformed. No, he criticised the very foundations, the rock of St. Peter himself. He said Catholic theology wasn't the word of God, and that, one day, true Christianity would be revealed and change the old world. Did he go into more detail? Signor Lastra shook his head. No, I'm afraid I didn't listen or press the issue. I just wanted him gone. Although he stayed three nights, I gave him a full refund. Why, do you think it has something to do with this case? It might, Remy mused. And considering some of the other controversial religious subjects he's published on, what Jax was studying on this trip might hold the key. As Daniel did some background work with the local police and the FBI back in the United States, Remy sat in the basement of the Church of St. Augustine, poring over the manuscripts that Gareth Jax had studied in the last few days of his life. She had quickly found they all had something in common, one main overlap of subject matter that tied them all together. They all discussed heresies in the early church, specifically in the 5th and 6th centuries A.D. It was a tumultuous time for the embryonic Catholic Church. Paganism, while outlawed in much of Europe, still had power over the hearts and minds of many people. Also, there were various differing interpretations of Christianity that competed to become the dominant one. Arianism, for example, 
taught that Christ was not eternal like God, but created in time and subordinate to him. The mainstream creed, back then as now, said that the Father, Son and Holy Spirit were equal and eternal. Arianism was almost as popular as what would later be called the Catholic view, and it took the work of several emperors and popes to suppress it. More disputes came later. In the 4th century the Ebionites taught that Jesus wasn't even originally divine, but a sinless man adopted by God to be his divine son. At the same time in North Africa, the Donatists taught that members of the clergy had to be as sinless as Jesus, and even the smallest infraction could lead to their defrocking. In the meantime, the Church itself argued over many basic doctrines, such as the nature of the Trinity, the role of the priesthood, the Eucharist, and many other aspects of the Church that modern Catholics take for granted. The problem was, these books talked about so many of these differences of theological opinion, it was impossible for Remy to tell which one Jax was actually researching. She needed something clearer, some thread of commonality that stood out. So far, she hadn't found it. It would be in his notes, but those notes seemed to have been stolen. Brother Luco said that Jax had a briefcase with him, and wrote notes by hand. That briefcase was not found with the body. Sergeant Esposito had checked the hotel room after they had spoken to Lastra, and phoned to say that no notes or printouts, or even a laptop had been found there. So the killer was interested in what Jax was researching, too. There had to be a connection. But what? Remy leaned back, rubbing her eyes. She checked her watch and found she had been at it for three hours. Three hours of getting nowhere. Just then Daniel came in. Any luck? he asked. No. There's so much to read here, and I don't know what I'm looking for. I can't get through it all in less than a week. Daniel shook his head. A week is too long. Any general idea? Heresies in the early Catholic Church. Daniel thought for a moment. Hmm, maybe that's why he was criticising modern Catholicism. He thinks they went down the wrong path. Who would believe in a fifteen-hundred-year-old heresy? Remy asked. You said he was a bit of an obsessive weirdo, Daniel said. Then his face cracked into a cheeky grin. And you believed in an eight-hundred-year-old medieval Rubik's Cube. Remy had to concede the point. She had spent much of her career studying the cryptex, a legendary device said to have contained the key to wisdom. She had tracked it down, due in large part to help from a killer they had tracked down on a previous case. With the combination the killer had come up with, she had opened it, only to find herself on the trail of further riddles that had led to an encrypted note she had no idea how to read. "'Are you calling me an obsessive weirdo?' Remy asked, smiling back. "'Oh, hell yeah. Anyway, while you've been doing some light reading, I've been on the phone with the U.S. I called his parents.' "'But it's night time there.' "'You think they're getting any sleep? I asked them if they had any idea what he was researching, and they said no. He didn't talk to them much about his work, and only after he published something. They also don't know of any marks or tattoos on the inside of his left arm. Does he have any brothers or sisters who might know? Only one sister. They're estranged. Estranged? Why? The sister became a Baptist. The parents hadn't raised them with religion, but the sister began going to church. Gareth Jacks never objected until about a year ago, when he suddenly started haranguing her about her poor choice in churches. Remy perked up. What did he say exactly? That it was the false form of Christianity created in order to send the people on a path away from God. That sounds a lot like what he told his Airbnb host. It sure does. Looks like your colleague found religion. But a different sort of religion than what's accepted, Remy mused, staring at the stack of early medieval manuscripts. I'm going to the station with Sergeant Esposito and we're going to look through the murder files from all over Italy. I'm also sending a request to Interpol. We're going to look for any murders of academics or scholars or librarians, and anything where a portion of flesh was cut off. Remy wrinkled her nose. I think I prefer my reading here. Right, keep at it. Maybe you'll find something. You think there has been another murder? Remy asked. Daniel bit his lower lip. My gut says yes. 
It sounds like Jack's got involved in something weird. If his killer is as driven as he was, I doubt he's done with killing. Daniel left, and Remy went back to searching through the stack of rare tomes Jack's had been studying. As she told Daniel there was so much material here she didn't know where to begin, so she just kept on reading. And reading. She began to slump. Her eyes grew heavy. Now that the initial excitement of the case had worn off, and she sat alone in a quiet reading space, jet lag began to catch up with her. It wasn't until Daniel's voice snapped her awake that she realised she had drifted off. Wake up, sleepyhead. Back so soon, she said, rubbing her eyes. I thought only students fell asleep in your class, Daniel said. Very funny. I thought you left. I did, two hours ago. We didn't have to search long. Do you know Milan? Yes, Remy replied, fully awake now. Good, you'll be our guide. There's been another murder. The body had a rectangle of flesh removed. Chapter 5 Basilica di San Vitale, Ravenna, Northern Italy That evening The last convert watched from a distance as Professor Lawrence Winkler, esteemed researcher at Cambridge University, puttered around beneath the brilliant gold mosaics that decorated every interior surface of this basilica of matchless beauty. The library on the Ravenna campus of Bologna University had closed an hour before, and the last convert, nursing a coffee in the student café across the street, had waited for Professor Winkler to show himself. As he expected, Winkler had stayed until closing time, and then the hunched old man had walked leisurely to the Basilica di San Vitale to take in the Byzantine mosaics. The last convert knew why Winkler liked to come here, because he liked to come here himself. Built in 547 to grace the capital of the Byzantine exarchate, at a time when Constantinople was trying to reconquer the tattered shreds of the Western Roman Empire, it was meant to impress those living in Italy with the Byzantine Empire's power and to show that Constantinople was the true heir to the Roman Empire, and the highest authority in church matters. The last convert's lip curled in a sneer. Sure, it was impressive, and yes, Byzantium was the only real survivor of the disintegration of Rome, but what did that matter? They had been as lost as the early Church of Rome. Neither had known the truth faith, and when they finally split into the Catholic and Eastern Orthodox churches, they had both already been firmly set on the wrong paths. As he could see from the stunning gold mosaics around him, showing the purple-cloaked emperors and diademed empresses, holding scepters of office and models of the churches they had commissioned, none held the true book, and none of the biblical scenes displayed were of anything other than what had been sanctioned in the narrow and incorrect view of the established religious authorities. Lies! Lies, lies, all these golden images on the walls and arches and domes seem to mock him. They seem to say, we're so beautiful, everyone stares at us and doesn't want to know the truth. We're candy for the mind, while the life-giving nourishment you really need is hidden from the whole human race. Well, he'd changed that. He glared at Professor Winkler, who, unaware he was being watched, strolled around the church interior, eyes upraised like the other tourists. But Professor Winkler saw. Oh yes, he saw. He saw that the decoration was a lie. He saw that this was all a sham. And he was part of keeping it hidden. That's why he needed to die. And for the last convert, he'd gain another piece of the puzzle. So he tailed Professor Winkler through the church, pretending to admire the art while really keeping an eye on his quarry or, rather, the notebook he had tucked under his arm. None of them used computers. They were afraid that they'd get hacked, not that the last convert knew how to do that. Instead, they wrote out their notes in Latin, trusting that most people wouldn't be able to read it. Fools! Anyone who really wanted to explore the important secrets of the universe knew how to read Latin as easily as the morning newspaper. Professor Winkler stopped in the presbytery looking up at that glorious vault soaring overhead. Flanked by four arches, all covered in mosaic, was a golden dome. At the very top, 
the Lamb of God stood in a starry field. From the four directions the Lamb was supported by angels. The rest of the dome was decorated with intricate mosaic, showing elaborate scroll work, fruit, birds and various animals. The vault symbolised the text of Revelation 5.13. Then I heard every creature in heaven and on earth, and under the earth and on the sea, and all that is in them, saying, To him who sits on the throne, and to the Lamb be praise and honour and glory and power for ever and ever. This scene also emphasised God's softer, gentler side, and his creative side to make the abundance the world enjoyed. The last convert stopped a few steps away, and a little to Professor Winkler's side, glancing in his direction. The professor's eyes glittered with admiration. They searched, looking at each detail of the fifteen-hundred-year-old art. "'You won't find what you're looking for there, Professor,' the last convert thought. "'You should know better than that by now.' "'But no,' he thought sadly. "'They didn't know better. "'They were worse off than the poor deluded fools who called themselves Christians. "'They knew part of the secret, and yet still clung to the old erroneous beliefs. "'Killing them was an act of mercy. "'And he would kill him tonight. "'He just needed to get the professor in a quiet place.' Winkler wasn't like Gareth Jacks. That recluse had been a creature of strict habits. He could set your watch to that man's movements. Winkler was a more challenging prey. While he stayed in the university library's special collections room from opening to close, one never knew what he'd do after that. Some evenings he went to the cinema, others he went out with colleagues or friends. The last convert had been stalking him on and off between other easier hunts. Winkler had been here all summer doing his research, no doubt filling up that notebook he always kept in a tight grip. "'We are closing in five minutes,' a voice echoed through the church, then repeated the announcement in Italian and German. People started making their way for the entrance. The last convert moved immediately so as not to attract Winkler's attention. There was only one way open for visitors to enter or exit, so he knew he could pick up Winkler outside. Perhaps he would get lucky and tonight would be the night. The last convert felt in the loose pockets of his trousers for the garrote and the straight razor. All was ready. He just needed to trail him until he got him in a good spot. He passed out of the doorway and stopped outside, pulling out his phone and taking a photo of the arched entrance. Then he moved a little back to take another shot. Actually, there was little to see in the exterior of Byzantine churches. The walls were of simple, unadorned tan brick. The domes were covered with tiles of a slightly darker red. Looking at it from the outside, one would never guess that such a plain building would hold such a rare jewel. A bit like those dusty archives his quarry searched through. Winkler came out. Apparently he was the last person to leave, because a security guard followed right after him and closed and locked the door. The last convert continued to take pictures, playing the tourist. Winkler didn't even glance in his direction, instead heading for the street. Marco, good to see you again. The last convert peeked over his phone. Winkler was shaking hands with an older Italian gentleman in a suit, both warmly smiling at each other like old friends. I know just the place for dinner, Marco said, putting a hand on Winkler's shoulder and leading him towards downtown. The last convert cursed. Those two looked like they'd be chumming around all night. He'd follow at least as long as to see where they were dining, then check on them in about an hour. Perhaps Marco, who looked like a businessman, might have some other evening appointment, or an early start tomorrow. With luck, he'd pick up Winkler's trail later, when he was alone. But he didn't really need luck. He had God on his side, and he had persistence. He'd get Winkler, and he'd get his notes, sooner or later. Chapter 6 Milan, the next morning Remy had never liked Milan. Industrial and modern, it was the antithesis of the beautiful cities of Italy that she savoured, Florence and Rome, Palermo and Turin. The northern city, situated close to the French, Swiss and Austrian borders, did not feel to her entirely Italian. But she wasn't here to sightsee. Daniel and Sergeant Esposito had come across a similar murder to that of Gareth Jacks. A Jesuit priest named Antonio Neri 
had been found with his neck broken at the base of a bridge in the old historical neighbourhood just two days before Jacks had been killed, and so they had flown up to Milan first thing the following morning, and gone to visit the coroner's office. Remy had wanted to go up the previous evening, but Sergeant Esposito told her the morgue would be closed. Odd. She had never thought about morgues having business hours. Ah, the morgue, Daniel had joked, slogging back his third coffee of the morning. Always the highlight of any trip to Italy. I've never been to the Milan morgue. Is it every bit as good as the guidebooks say? Remy joked, to cover up her distaste. Daniel had laughed. Never been to Milan. It was strange, but his mood had improved markedly since they had left Rome, as if he was glad to be gone from one of the world's most remarkable cities. She decided one mystery was enough for the time being, and put her curiosity about her partner's strange behaviour aside. An aged male doctor, rake thin and wheezy, led them to where they kept the bodies. Normally, with a priest, we give the remains over as quickly as possible to the church, the man croaked in Italian. He looked half a corpse himself. But I have marked it down as a death in suspicious circumstances. Do you think he was murdered? Remy asked. He befell some strange end. Whether he was murdered or not, you can perhaps determine that for yourselves. He opened up one of the refrigerated drawers that held a body. This had become a familiar experience for Remy, although it still gave her the jitters. The drawer contained a handsome, fit man in early middle age. Father Antonio Neri's cause of death was obvious, even to a layperson who tried to avert her gaze. The neck was at an impossible angle, and his hair was matted with dried blood. The coroner wheezed. He was found at the foot of a bridge early one morning by a jogger. A good ten-metre drop onto the cobblestones below. His neck was broken and he had fractured his skull, obviously landing at first. It was at first thought that he had jumped or fallen. But when we removed his clothes for the autopsy, I discovered these. He pulled the sheet down to reveal the priest's lower body. A rectangular portion of skin had been removed on the right thigh. It measured about two inches by four. The skin was carefully cut off with a straight razor, just like Sergeant Esposito explained to me happened to an American academic in Rome. That got me curious, and I took a second look at the neck and head. Further investigation revealed that his neck had been broken, not by the fall, but being struck with some heavy curved object, perhaps a steel pipe. The head wound appeared to have happened because of the fall, showing someone had dumped him over the side of the bridge head first. To simulate suicide? Perhaps. Or perhaps just to make one take the obvious interpretation for the broken neck. The coroner seemed embarrassed to admit his slip. He quickly added, We hardly ever see men of the cloth come to an unnatural death at the hands of another person. It's almost unheard of. Remy explained all this to Daniel, who asked, So, what's the status of the investigation? I understood the question, so you don't need to translate, Professor. But my spoken English is not so good. I will continue in Italian. The Milan police are searching for leads, but from what I hear they haven't found any. His wallet was in his pocket, with a few euros inside, so the motive does not appear to have been robbery. Time of death appears to have been around midnight, when that neighbourhood would have been quiet. Have they spoken to the Jesuit order? Yes, but they had little to say about him. While he did his duties as a Jesuit, teaching religion and mathematics at a Catholic school for the disadvantaged, he kept himself to himself. He also spent much time at the Association of Devout Students. What's that? Remy asked. Some sort of religious society. I don't know anything about it, even though I am a practicing Catholic. There are hundreds of such associations in my country. The Association of Devout Students. I thought Neri was a teacher. The coroner only shrugged. We'll look into it, Remy said. Thank you, Doctor. 
As they left the morgue, Remy filled Daniel in on the details of the conversation. Two people studying religion killed in Italy in the exact same way within a few days of each other? Daniel said. This has got to be the same guy. It looks like we have another serial killer on our hands. You think so? Remy asked. She felt ashamed that she felt more excitement than horror. Perhaps Cyril was right. Perhaps she was getting too emotionally involved and obsessed with all of this. I'm sure of it. Just as I'm sure he's not done. You don't come up with an ammo like that unless you're going to do it a bunch of times. Let's check out this religious order. It seems like our best bet. It wouldn't be an order. Antonio Neri was a Jesuit. He couldn't be in a second religious order. Society, association, whatever. Let's check it out. Remy searched it on her phone and didn't find it on Google Maps. She did a Google search and once again didn't find any matches. She queried in Italian, English, French and even Latin. Nothing. The association didn't have any online presence. Odd. Coming out of the hospital, she sat down on a bench out front and dug deeper, Daniel sitting next to her. She continued the search, checking major websites like Facebook and Instagram. The Association of Devout Students didn't have any presence at all. No website, no social media, no contact address or email, no listing in the Vatican directory, not even a listing in the Italian telephone directory. She tried in every language she could think of, then used an online translator to try several others. Still no luck. Are you sure you got the name right? Daniel asked. Remy shrugged. Maybe Zakarina got it wrong. Oh, I know what I can do. She logged into JSTOR, an online database of academic articles. It was shielded from online searches and subscription only, but of course Remy had an account. Unfortunately, JSTOR had a terrible search engine, no doubt designed by academics rather than computer technicians. This might take a minute, Remy said. I'm going to get some pizza from that place over there. Want some? Pepperoni, please. All right. Daniel left. Remy dug into the search engine of JSTOR. For some inexplicable reason, the more specific your search, the more results you got. Remy had been using JSTOR for years and had never quite gotten the hang of it. Neither had any of her colleagues. This was made even worse since she couldn't search by author. She was left searching for Association of Devout Students and Milan. This, as she expected, gave her pages upon pages of citations on everything but what she was looking for. Educational Studies of Secondary Schools in Milan Communist Associations at the University in the 1950s Religious Devotion Among Seminary Students She began to trawl through them. It was a long, tedious process. Yet, nonetheless, she found herself savouring it. This was like tracking down clues to the cryptex, or the other medieval ciphers she had untangled. And it was for more than simple knowledge, it was to save lives. She paused for a moment, looking around to see if Daniel was coming back. He was nowhere in sight. She wondered if that offer from the FBI was still on the table. There would be no reason why it wouldn't be. Perhaps she should think it over a bit more. Perhaps this was her true calling, applying her expertise in history to fighting crime. Well, if she wanted to fight crime, she had better get back to work. She dug into the references, passing by all sorts of studies in obscure journals that had nothing to do with what she was looking for. And then she found something that made her lean forward, finger poised over her phone. It was the introduction to a medievalist conference proceeding from 1971, in which the participants were listed by their names, affiliation and city. One was a man listed only as Brother George, devout student, Church of St. Lazarus, Rome. Remy cocked her head. Could this be a match? She had never heard the term devout student before, although she supposed it could apply to any student who was religious. The fact that he came from Rome made it more plausible. But the proceedings were from 1971, and although she had been all over Rome over several long visits, she had never heard of a Church of St. Lazarus. Get anything? Daniel's voice made her look up. He carried a large cardboard box. I think I have a match. It would involve going back to Rome. Darkness flickered over Daniel's face for a moment before he shrugged it off. 
These investigations take us all over. He sat and set down the pizza box between them. They didn't have Hawaiian. I thought this was a civilized country. Hawaiian? What's Hawaiian? Pepperoni and pineapple. Remy blinked. That sounds horrible. Why would you do that to a pizza? Because it tastes delicious. At least we got pepperoni. He opened it up. There were six thick slices. A delicious steam wafted up to her. This is far more than we can ever eat. Oh, come on. I could eat all these myself. But I don't want to slow myself down. They dug in. As Remy predicted, she only got through one slice, made a poor attempt on the second, and Daniel wolfed down the rest. He really was a terrible eater, Remy mused as she watched him. He ate far too quickly, not seeming to enjoy his food, and he ate far too much. The man practically lived on junk food. She felt amazed that his spare tyre, as the Americans called it, wasn't bigger. The long hours and stress were probably the only things keeping him from becoming obese. I need to take you out for some real Italian cuisine, she said. This is real Italian cuisine, he said through a mouthful of pizza, another habit he desperately needed to be cured of. She recalled he had an ex-wife somewhere. Obviously she hadn't succeeded in civilising him. Oddly, she didn't mind it so much. Her usual dinner companions were all academics with perfect table manners and sparkling conversation. Eating with this beast was somehow refreshing. Daniel let out a little belch. Well, not entirely refreshing. I found a possible location for the Association of Devout Students, a church devoted to St. Lazarus, Remy told him, as Daniel began to lick the tomato sauce off his fingers. Lazarus? He was made a saint? Wasn't getting raised from the dead good enough? Daniel asked, picking up the half a slice Remy hadn't finished. Yes, you may have that, Remy said immediately realising the irony was lost on him. It's in the suburb of Rome. I'd never heard of it. You can't know everything. Let's go. Remy checked her phone. There isn't a flight until this evening. Can't we take the train? I looked it up before we headed up here. It's only four hours. Remy laughed. Four hours? If an Italian train schedule says four hours, count on at least six. The flight will get us there earlier. But it's an evening flight. This place might have closed when we get there. It's a church. Sure, the church might be open, but this association probably has an office or a school or something. That's going to be closed. Remy smiled a little. We're the law. We make them open. Daniel laughed, flashing her a bit of half-chewed pizza she really didn't need to see. Now you're learning. You like being an honorary agent, don't you? Remy flushed. Well, I'm technically a civilian advisor. Technically, my ass. Reserve those flights and make sure to put it on Uncle Sam's tab. We have some buck to kick in Rome. And I want to take another look at those books Jacks were studying, she said thoughtfully. I have a feeling what we're looking for is hidden in them somewhere. You'll get your chance. While we're waiting for our flights, I want to check out Neri's apartment. Sergeant Esposito got the address for me. He's pretty useful. As useful as me? Hell no. Now, eat up your pizza and let's go. Father Neri turned out to have lived in a residence owned by the Jesuit order, a small house in a quiet neighbourhood that he shared with four other Jesuits. An older man, who acted as the head of the little residence, showed them Father Neri's room. He was a good man, the Jesuit said. Although a very reserved one, he kept himself to himself. Did he get along with the other residents here? Daniel asked. Being a Jesuit, the man was highly educated and spoke perfect English. He never caused any animosity, if that is what you are asking. He didn't mingle much, though. Oh, he would come to services with us and do his share of the housework, and he was always punctual with his duties at the local church but otherwise he spent most of his time in his room or one of Milan's many historical libraries. Did he have any enemies? Daniel asked. The police already asked these questions. It's shocking that he was murdered, absolutely shocking. I'm afraid I can't answer. Nelly was so reserved that although I lived with him for eight years, I can't actually tell you all that much about him. The Jesuit led them upstairs to a tiled hallway 
flanked by modest rooms. He opened a door. This was his room. They saw a narrow bed and a small metal desk with a crucifix above it. The rest of the room was entirely taken up with bookshelves. Tomes of all ages and several languages were double-shelved or stacked haphazardly on top. More were piled on the desk and even the floor. Underneath the bed, Remy spotted several boxes she guessed also contained books. "'He was quite a scholar, as you can see,' the Jesuit said. "'Did he have any special branch of study?' Remy said, scanning the titles. "'It was odd, but he rarely spoke of his research. He did show an encyclopedic knowledge of the early church, however.' Remy could see that from the titles. He had all the important works, and many of the minor ones. Not too many rare books, though. The Jesuit vow of poverty would have kept him from obtaining those. It was amazing he had collected as much as he had. And with his access to church libraries, he, like Gareth Jacks, could have seen almost anything he wanted to. "'Do you need to go through these?' Daniel said, looking doubtfully at the hundreds of volumes. "'There's no time,' Remy said, to Daniel's obvious relief. "'They tell me enough of what we need to know.' "'Which is?' He was studying the same things as Gareth Jacks, and I bet that's the reason he ended up getting killed. Let's get back to Rome. I need to take a look at those rare books Jacks was studying. I have a feeling Father Neri studied similar ones. Chapter 7 They got to the church of St. Lazarus at seven that night, Remy still carrying an airport coffee as they got out of the taxi. The hectic pace of their investigation so soon after the jet-lag of an international flight, was beginning to take its toll. Remy had found the church's location easily enough on Google Maps, with no reference to the Association of Devout Students that supposedly was also based there. The church was a small one, built in the Baroque style of the 18th century, in what was then the outskirts of Rome, and now a poorer quarter of run-down tenement buildings and cheap shops. She noted a large number of Africans and Arabs, no doubt from the flood of refugees that had been coming into Italy in recent years. The country had been a prime destination for those fleeing poverty and war in their home countries, because if they could get to Libya, they could take a short but perilous boat ride across the Mediterranean and end up in Sicily. From there, many moved north to look for work in the capital or continue their journey to Germany or Scandinavia. The church was well located to serve them. St. Lazarus was the patron saint of the ill and destitute, and, true to form, Remy saw a soup kitchen set up at the side door. A black-robed priest oversaw a couple of women in lay clothing, serving meals to a long line of people, both foreign and Italian. Remy and Daniel went to the front of the church, where an iron door stood open beneath a modest arch, flanked by figures of Jesus and Lazarus with the dead man coming out of his tomb still swaddled in his grave clothes. Once they had stepped inside, the familiar smell of incense and burning wax filled their nostrils. The two investigators looked around. A few Italians, mostly older, sat at the pews. An old woman on crutches lit a votive candle in a side chapel, while a young man, perhaps her grandson, stood nervously behind her, hands slightly outstretched, as if afraid she'd fall. The interior felt dark and gloomy. It was twilight and there was not enough street light to illuminate the stained glass windows. The other decorations were spared just a few dusty icons and some mediocre sculpture from the 18th century. The whitewashed arched ceiling was bare of decoration. Remy had never much liked the Italian Baroque, and this was not a good example of it. At least the soup kitchen was a good example of Christian charity. Remy had been raised a Catholic. Her mother had been fairly devout, but not strict. Her father, the police officer, had never had much time for religion, but paid for Remy to go to a Catholic school. That had seemed enough for her parents, and Remy had never gone to Sunday school. As for her own religious beliefs, she had never really explored them. She knew that her studies of the intricacies of church history were, in part, an act of exploration of her faith, but she had never fully believed, and after leaving home for university had stopped going to Mass. Her last confession was a long time ago, and she felt deeply troubled by some of the recent scandals that had rocked the church. Still, she could not help but feel at home any time she stepped into a Catholic church. 
The traditions of her upbringing reached into her adult heart, even if her views on many things had changed. Like premarital sex, Remy thought wryly as she and Daniel walked down the aisle. Sister Selene always told us to guard your virtue as your greatest treasure. That teaching didn't last me through high school. I wonder what she think of me breaking medieval statuettes of the Virgin Mary in my hunt for cryptex clues, or tracking down murderers in churches, or sleeping with a divorced man. Cyril. She hadn't contacted him except for a brief text to say she had landed. She reminded herself to call him when she got the chance. If she got the chance. A priest appeared from behind the altar, no doubt coming from a hidden door to the vestry. The man was older, with close-cropped white hair, around a large bald spot. His lighter skin suggested his origin as northern Italian, perhaps part Swiss or Austrian. The blue eyes that settled on them sparked with suspicion. Had he already pegged them as law enforcement? Remy went up to him, Daniel following half a step behind. "'Good evening, Father,' Remy said in Italian. "'Do you know where we can find the Association of Devout Students?' The suspicion in his eyes grew brighter. And why would you want to find that? We are with the American FBI, and we are here in Italy investigating the murder of an American national in Rome a few days ago. We believe it might be linked to the death of a Jesuit priest named Antonio Neri in Milan. We know he was a member of the association, and that the association has its address here. Remy had been about to say that the association had its address here in the 1970s, but changed her words at the last instant. She had noticed Daniel often said something he wasn't sure was true in order to confirm its accuracy. It worked. Yes, the association has its offices here, the priest said, switching to good but heavily accented English. The accent couldn't hide his reluctant guarded tone. His brow furrowed. You sound French. You work for the FBI? She is a civilian consultant, Daniel said, pulling out his FBI identification. That usually impressed people. It didn't with the priest. May I ask your name? Father Emmanuel Ambrogio. I am the priest here and also a member of the association. Perhaps we could step into my office. Thank you, Father. That would be great, Daniel said. They walked down the aisle, led by the priest. And why does the FBI need a French woman to help them in their investigations? This question was posed to Daniel, not her. Professor Laurent is an expert on medieval history. The murder victim was studying early medieval manuscripts when he was killed. Father Ambrogio looked at her, the hostility fading and being replaced with curiosity. Professor Remy Laurent, of the Sorbonne, he asked. Nice to be brought back into the conversation, Remy thought. Yes, I'm teaching at Georgetown for a year in Washington, D.C. I read with interest the case of the Cryptex killer. Remy tensed. She had managed to keep her name out of the papers, but the story, involving, as it did, several murders and thefts from several prominent museums, had made international headlines. And apparently this priest, whose association she had never heard of, knew about her scholarly interest in the cryptex. Yes, I read about that too, Remy said, not quite able to keep her voice level. I'm surprised the FBI didn't hire you to be a civilian consultant in that case, the priest said. He was trying to draw her out, but wasn't as practised at it as her partner. They called... Remy said, flushing a little at uttering a half-truth through a man of the cloth. It was all over so quickly. I guess they didn't need me. Those bright blue northern eyes fixed on her for a moment. Remy did not meet them. Father Ambrogio took them around the altar to a small door hidden out of sight behind a column. Passing through this, they came to a narrow hallway with a threadbare green carpet. A couple of doors on each side were all shut. The priest opened the second one on the right, and they found themselves in a windowless office. The priest sat behind an orderly desk stacked with papers. A file cabinet stood on one wall. On the other stretched a long bookshelf filled with books in Italian, Latin, and, Remy noted with interest, Aramaic. 
Not many people could read the language of Jesus. Other than a crucifix, there was no adornment on the grey stone walls. Father Ambrogio gathered his robes about him and settled into the red leather chair behind the desk. After letting them stand a moment, he gestured for them to sit in the pair of hard wooden chairs facing it. Daniel was already halfway into sitting down before he got invited to. The priest fixed his gaze on Remy. So tragic what happened with that murderer hunting for the crypt eggs. I myself must admit I wasn't entirely sure it was real, despite it being mentioned in various texts. Do you know if he actually found it? The papers were vague on this point. Remy blushed again. She struggled to find an evasive answer that would not be an outright lie. But what could she say? He had obviously studied the case, and perhaps delved into the lore of the cryptex. Much of it was freely available, and he was a devout student, after all. Daniel saved her. That case is closed, he said. Not really, Remy added silently. We are currently investigating the murders of Antonio Neri and Gareth Jacks. Were they members of the Association of Devout Students? The slightest pause. Yes, they both were. Remy's heart leapt. She leaned forward. Really? That's interesting. Did they know each other? I don't know. Did you say murder? I thought Neri committed suicide by throwing himself off a bridge. That's what we were told. It was made to look like suicide, but the coroner found evidence that he was murdered before he was thrown off the bridge. Father Ambrogio let out a slow breath and crossed himself. Thank God. Remy's eyebrows shot up. I beg your pardon? Suicide is a terrible sin. If he had really killed himself, he would suffer eternal torment in hell. Having been murdered, such a pious man as Neri will almost certainly be with God now. Remy and Daniel glanced at each other. Daniel cleared his throat. <sighs> be that as it may, Father Ambrogio, we wish to bring his killer to justice. Of course. Which is why we came here, since he was a member of the Association of Devout Students. Could you tell us a bit about this association? Father Ambrogio shrugged. It's a loose association of lay and religious scholars who study the history of the church and who compare notes. And its offices are here, Remy continued. The priest gestured around the simple room. You are looking at them. Nothing terribly mysterious. We are dispersed compared to most academic institutions, especially the ones you are accustomed to, Professor Laurent. No large buildings, no extensive bureaucracy. It's more of a network of like-minded individuals. Remy shifted in her seat. She got the feeling that Father Ambrogio knew a lot about her. If he studied early church history, he might know a bit too much. Do you have any idea why two of your members would have been murdered in the past week? I don't know. It's terrible. But we have a large membership. It could be simple chance. God, this is like extracting teeth. Remy controlled her patience and went on. The FBI doesn't think it's chance, Father Ambrogio. Neither man was robbed for money. Their wallets were on them. Mr. Jacks appears to have been robbed for his notes as he was studying in the Church of St. Augustine here in Rome. Father Neri might have been robbed of his notes as well. I'm working under the hypothesis that they were both studying something the killer wanted to know about. Father Ambrogio leaned forward. Do you have any idea what that might be? We're hoping you did, Daniel said. The priest sat back, raising his hands in a helpless gesture. It's impossible to say. We're a large organization with a diverse membership. I was just talking to one of our members who recently returned from a research trip into the monastic libraries at Wadi Natron in Egypt. Another is making a study of the art in the famous medieval wooden churches in Norway. Others are less adventuresome and operate out of the great libraries of Paris or Cambridge or Rome. The killer could be looking for any number of things. Do you have any leads on that? Slight pause. Daniel wasn't saying anything, so Remy stepped in again. 
Since we don't know what Father Neri was studying, we can't make any comparisons to Mr. Jax's work, so we can't make any connections. The main connection, and the reason we know the murders are connected, is that the portion of flesh was cut from each man. Father Ambrogio turned white. What? A rectangular portion of flesh, a little smaller than a playing card. On Mr. Jacks it came from the inside of the left arm. On Father Neri the flesh was removed from the right thigh. How shocking. Why? That's what we're trying to figure out, Father, Daniel said. We're thinking it might be a tattoo or something. That would fit with removing the flesh, Father Ambrogio agreed. As for what the tattoos depicted, I could not say. My good lord, how terrible. Here's what I'll do. Since I am a resident priest here and the association's office is my office, I act as secretary. I'll telephone members here and in Milan and try and find out what Mr. Jacks and Father Neri were studying. Come back in the morning and we'll have another discussion. Remy and Daniel glanced at each other again. Daniel gave a little nod and they both rose. Thank you for your help, Father Ambrogio. Remy and Daniel shook his hands. Come around nine tomorrow and hopefully I'll have more for you, the priest said, leading them out of the office and back down the hall. He left them at the door to the church. Remy felt like a bad student being dismissed from the principal's office. Not that she had ever been a bad student, but she had heard. You notice something about that office? Daniel said in a low voice as they got back into the street. Father Ambrogio could read Aramaic. That's unusual. I was wondering what language those books were in. No, I noticed something else old school about that guy. What? No computer. Remy blinked. That was true. There could have been a laptop somewhere. People keep their laptops on their desks and the briefcase he had leaning on the wall wasn't padded like a laptop case. Also, when he moved, I saw the bulge of the phone in his pocket. Old-style flip phone. Of course, some older people still use them, but I have a feeling that he didn't want to be connected to the Internet. Just like your colleague, Gareth Jacks. Father Neri's room didn't have one either. Remy stopped short. He wasn't being honest with us. If these people want to avoid the Internet, they must have something to hide. Even the most old-fashioned professors emerita use computers. What's he hiding from the police? Of course he didn't directly lie, so I guess he didn't break his vows. But he certainly didn't tell the whole truth. No, he wasn't, Daniel said. Usually I'm pretty good at detecting a lie, but I have to admit he got me. Perhaps it was the priest's robes and his accent that distracted me. Well, he's not going to evade our questions again, Remy said, turning around. Let's go in there and make him talk. He's hiding something. His evasions prove it. Chapter 8 Remy was about to storm back into the church when Daniel put a hand on her arm. Let's take a look around first, he said. See what we can see. Remy hesitated a moment, then nodded. All right. You have to stop being so impulsive. Confronting him will guarantee he'll clam up. Remy didn't know what clam up meant, but she got the general meaning. And Daniel was right. She was too impulsive at times. She guessed it was because investigating murders were so unlike her usual work that she got overly enthusiastic. This work with the FBI gave her a thrill. While she still loved history and the slow pleasure to be had by teasing out hidden meanings from ancient texts and scraps of evidence, this was more exciting, more rewarding, and it got her out into the world. It also, she realised, brought her closer to her father. She had always resented her father's long hours, the hours that took him away from so many girlhood milestones and moments, and eventually led him to a heart attack and an early grave. Now that she felt what he had felt, and she could forgive him a little for missing her tenth birthday party, and her twelfth, and her high school graduation, What's a little girl's birthday party compared to catching a dangerous criminal? At last she understood. If only he had explained it better. They walked back around one side of the church and saw the soup kitchen still buzzing with activity. A little park stood just across the street, 
and many people who had lined up for a free meal now sat on the grass or the lip of an old baroque fountain, eating from plastic plates. Remy and Daniel tried to go round to the back of the church, but a later building abutted up against it. Weaving their way through the dinner crowd, they went round to the church's other side, and struck gold. A narrow alley between the corner of the church and a newer apartment building led to a small courtyard behind the church, impossible to see from the front. At the back of this courtyard stood a small baroque-style home, two stories tall, made of white marble. Remy guessed it was the priest's lodgings for the original church, although it was far too big for most priests in modern times. Father Ambrogio was making his way across the courtyard, headed for it with long steps, and casting a nervous glance over his shoulder back at the church. Keeping halfway hidden around the corner of the building, they watched as the priest went up the three steps to the front door, unlocked it, and disappeared inside. "'This looks like it was built as a priest's residence,' Remy said. "'But now it appears to be a bit more populated.' Daniel nodded. All the lights were on, their view obstructed by white curtains in every window. The FBI agent pointed to a window on the ground floor. The curtain was open an inch. "'Let's go take a peek.' he said. Without another word, they crossed the courtyard. Remy glanced at the back of the church and saw nothing but an unadorned wall and a closed door. They were alone and, hopefully, unobserved. They went to the window and discovered a problem. It was set too high above the ground for them to look in. Unusually, there was no window sill, so they couldn't pull themselves up. "'Guess these folks like their privacy,' Daniel whispered. "'I want to see in there,' Remy whispered back. So do I. Shall I give you a boost? Remy blinked. What? Well, you're not going to lift me up. Remy chuckled. All right. Daniel got into a wide stance, knees slightly bent, and made a stirrup with his hands. This reminded Remy of a pony ride she had gone on when she was a girl. Remy stepped onto his hand, held onto his shoulders, and lifted herself up, fingertips grasping the narrow ledge between the wall and pane of glass barely enough to get her fingers onto the first knuckle. Daniel lifted her up further, showing far more strength than his spare tyre hinted at. A good thing, too. If Daniel lost his grip, she'd fall immediately. Steadied by Daniel's firm hold, she was able to peek inside the gap in the curtain, keeping her head low. What she saw made her breath catch. Inside, she saw a large room filled with bookshelves. At the far end, she saw a doorway leading to another room, also filled with books. A figure passed across the open doorway between the two rooms. Remy ducked down out of sight, the back of her thighs brushing against her partner's face. She almost whispered an apology but didn't want to be heard. Daniel leaned back a little, his grip keeping steady. Remy waited a moment and peeked over the window sill again. The figure was gone. She studied what she could see of the bookshelves. What impressed her wasn't the size of the library, Many old churches had libraries made up of books collected by generations of priests, or collected for Sunday schools. No, it was the quality of books that she saw. From her limited vantage point, she could see a King James Bible, apparently a first edition, open on a lectern. On the shelves she could see a theological treaties from the 15th and 16th century, lovingly bound in leather with gold embossing. And those were only the books she could read from the window. Others were too far away or were bound by the early style of having a wrapper of vellum around the pages, the title written in pen along the rounded spine. "'Let me down,' she whispered. She knelt, wobbled a bit, and for a frightening moment thought she was going to fall onto the cobblestones. Daniel let go of her foot. She dropped a heart-stopping few inches, and his strong hands clasped her waist. She ended up suspended in the air, nose to nose, with the FBI agent. A moment later, he plunked her down on her feet. Phew, he said, wiping his hands on his slacks and stepping back. Good thing you weren't wearing heels. Remy cocked her head. Are you saying I'm effy? Light as a feather, but you squirm too much. Look, I got footprints on my hands. But enough about you. What did you see? Wonderful things, she said breathlessly, then smiled. Could you be a little more specific? I was referencing Howard Carter, Tutankhamun's tomb. Never mind. There's an extensive library in there, a collection of rare books worth millions. This association has more resources than Father Ambrogio let on. 
Let's go pay him a visit. This library proves he was lying to us. A dispersed group of like-minded individuals? My ass. If we show him that we know he dodged our questions, he'll be more likely to answer a second time. All right. They went to the door. Daniel tried it and found it locked. A brass plate by the side of the door said private property in Italian. There was nothing stating this was a building for the Association of Devout Students. Daniel pressed the little round ivory doorbell. Somewhere inside, chimes rang softly, as if not to disturb the students. Students of what exactly? Remy wondered. Father Ambrogio had been vague about that. There were many larger organisations for those who wished to study theology, so it didn't make sense to have another one unless it specialised in some way. The door opened suddenly. They hadn't heard anyone approach. Father Ambrogio scowled at them, then rearranged his features to something more acceptable when facing the police. "'I have many calls to make before I can help you further. It would be best if you came back tomorrow morning like we agreed.' You led us to believe that the Association of Devout Students was nothing more than some people communicating with one another, Remy said. I led you to believe nothing. I said my office acted as the Association office, and that is the truth. What's this building, then? Daniel asked. The library for the church. My quarters are upstairs. He still stood in the doorway. Past him, Remy could see thick carpeting, panelled walls, and an open door to the left that led to a library much like the one she had seen on the right side of the house. Father Ambrogio, two of your members are dead, Remy said. Killed by the same person, or at least for the same reasons. I think you should be a little more forthcoming. It's all in God's hands. Remy and Daniel stared for a second, stunned. No, Father. Remy said, collecting herself. It's in the hands of the police. Not just the Italian authorities, but the American ones as well. This has become an international incident. Daniel took up a cue. One that will attract the interest of the media sooner or later. Father Ambrogio's eyes narrowed in what Remy thought would be a dangerous look in anyone who didn't wear the collar of the Roman Catholic Church. We value our privacy here, the priest said. We'd like to value your privacy too, Father, Daniel said, and actually made a little bow. Remy wondered if it was sarcastic. It would help our investigation if we could know a bit more about the organisation the two victims were members of. Perhaps it would be okay if you showed us around. Father Ambrogio's sigh showed it was anything but okay. Not that he had much choice. At this point they could probably get a search warrant. Very well he said in a voice that almost managed to sound civil. While the building is for members only, these are exceptional circumstances. Come this way. Father Ambrogio opened a side door and led them into the reading room, to the right, the same one she had peeked into through the window. Several tall bookshelves divided the room into aisles, and an open doorway led to another large room in the back of the house that was also full of books. The priest took them through both rooms, then through another connecting doorway to the other wing of the building, where two more large rooms were stuffed with books. She studied the titles as they strolled through the stacks. While there were many modern reference works, the bulk of the collection was rare, older books, some of which, despite all her years of study, she had never even seen. And in a wealth of languages, too. She saw works in all the modern languages, as well as Hebrew, Latin and Greek. There were even sections for Coptic, the ancient language of the Egyptian Christian Church, descended from the tongue of the ancient pharaohs, and Jez, the liturgical language of the Ethiopian Orthodox Church. An impressive collection, Remy said, keeping her voice lower so as not to disturb the readers who were scattered here and there, hunched over small tables at the ends of the stacks. The result of centuries of collecting, Father Ambrogio replied warming a bit as he showed off the library. I saw you staring at the Gies books. The Ethiopians have some lovely illustrated Bibles and hagiographies. As I'm sure you know, they are one of the oldest Christian churches after the Catholics, the Armenians and the Copts. We have sections for Georgian and Old Church Slavonic too. 
Remy nodded. Another two early churches. And she had noticed that, while the books ranged all over the broad subject of the Christian religion, there was an emphasis on early church history and the many theological disputes that consumed it, just like the books Gareth Jacks had been studying. Once they had made the circuit of the ground floor, Father Ambrogio took them into a small break room, its bare white walls and modern kitchenette, in stark contrast to the intellectual air of the rest of the building. They sat around a formica table on hard metal chairs. "'I've been thinking about our membership, and there's one fellow who you should try and find. Father de Sanctis is from here in Rome. He is not attached to any church, but rather works in a number of Catholic organizations involved in historical preservation and helping pilgrims. Those keep him so busy, and the Vatican is so happy with his good works, that they think being attached to an individual church would only distract him from more useful pursuits. Father de Sanctis is an avid student of theological history, in the little spare time his duties give him. He comes here most nights, but he hasn't shown up for several nights running. I called him a couple of days ago, but his phone was switched off. Also, he hasn't shown up for work. That is most unusual of him. Give us his phone number, Daniel said. We can track him. Father Ambrogio pulled out his phone, which Remy saw was an old flip phone, just like he said, and gave Daniel the number. Why didn't you tell us about this before, Father? Remy asked. I only just now thought of it. A lying priest, Remy thought. How disgusting. Remy was surprised at the strength of her reaction. The old Catholic education was coming back to her. Daniel turned to Remy. I need to get down to the station ASAP. They can track the phone, find out where he is. But Father de Sanctis has his phone turned off, Father Ambrogio said. We can still find out where he powered the phone down. And if he turned it on at all, even for a second, it would have pinged the nearby cell phone towers. We'll find him. I certainly hope you do, Father Ambrogio said, standing. And I'll ask the other members what they might know. Call me tomorrow. They headed out. He sounded a bit more accommodating this time, Remy said. That's because we cornered him. Do you need me to come to the station? Remy asked. No. They gave me a contact info for officers who speak English for every shift. Good, because I want to get back to the Church of St. Augustine and look at the books Jax was studying. It'll be closing now. Daniel said, checking his watch. If I get a taxi, I should make it in time. I'll ask Brother Luco to stay late. He seemed helpful. Certainly more helpful than this guy, Daniel said, jerking a thumb back in the direction of the secret library. He's hiding something, I agree. Jax must have spent quite a bit of time in this library. He probably only went to the Church of St. Augustine because they had a few texts this place didn't. Besides a couple of reference works, all the books Brother Luco showed us were incredibly rare. And do you think those books will tell you more than Father Evasion back there? I certainly hope so. We can't catch this killer if we don't know what he's after. Chapter 9 Remy rubbed her tired eyes. She didn't know how long she'd been at it. Brother Luco had been kind enough to stay and had gone to a back room in the church upstairs to stretch out on a sofa and doze. That left her alone in the cold cellar, hunched over medieval texts. Daniel had popped in a while before to tell her that they had gotten a judge in a night court to grant a search warrant for the phone, and now the Rome police were getting the phone company to track Father de Sanctis's phone. It would take some time. Then he had left. That had been, what, two hours ago? Three? and still she hadn't found what she was looking for. Remy yawned. She should have asked Brother Luco for the location of the coffee machine. She continued through a medieval copy of sixth-century sermons by Italian bishops, written on smooth vellum, the ink still clear, although the handwriting was small and difficult to read. Staring at this kind of text for too long made anyone's vision swim. Remy rubbed her eyes and kept going. Then her vision came into sharp focus. A line practically jumped out at her. It was from a bishop in Palermo, 
speaking to his flock in the year 534. These sinners, these fools, who call themselves devout students, read false gospels and call themselves Christians. Devout students? Of course, it was just a simple phrase. In the two thousand years of Christian tradition, it must have been used countless times but for it to come up in a rare work consulted by a member of the Association of Devout Students seemed too much of a coincidence. Daniel had once said that he didn't believe in coincidence. She used to, back when she was what the officers of the law called a civilian. She wasn't so sure now. She read through the entire sermon, suddenly wide awake, every nerve ending alive, but her eagerness soon began to fade. The bishop didn't say anything more about the devout students, It was only a passing remark about the various ways a Christian can go astray. Remy leaned back, staring at the page as if it would suddenly yield up more information than it had. So, assuming the priest had been referring to the same devout students, an unprofessionally big assumption based on incredibly slim evidence, then the organisation had been around since the early days of the Church, or, more likely, was a modern revival. But what was it? It obviously embraced some sort of unorthodox theology. The priest had mentioned false gospels. What could those be? Arian texts? Probably not. They were well known enough, and hated by the mainstream church enough to have been criticised by name. Another possibility came to her. Perhaps the Bishop of Palermo was referring to one of the apocryphal books of the Bible. There had been many in the early years, suppressed and rejected by the mainstream church. Most had vanished without trace, like the Gospel of Eve, known only from a few quotes in the fourth-century works of Epiphanius. Others had been preserved in whole or in part, such as the Gospel of Peter and the Gospel of Mary, or the Acts of Pilate. Some had been preserved since ancient times, while others came to light as part of the Dead Sea Scrolls. One had been rediscovered as recently as the 1980s. The Gospel of Judas was at first thought to have been a fake, until carbon dating on the papyrus it was written on showed it to be from around 280 AD. This Gospel, purported to have been written by the Apostle who betrayed Jesus, stated that the Son of God had actually instructed Judas to tell the Romans where he was, so that he could be crucified and save mankind. It goes on to give teachings Jesus supposedly gave only to Judas, because he was the only disciple who truly understood what Jesus preached. So, perhaps Jax and Neri had been looking for evidence of a lost gospel. If so, a gospel by whom? The sermon dated to 534 AD. This was in the time of Pope John II, who reigned from 533 to 535. His correspondence was another of the books in the stack on her desk. Remy picked it up and began to look through it. Luckily, the scribe who had transcribed it had written the dates for most of the sermons on the top of the page. Generally, he only put the year, or sometimes also the feast day the letter was written on. In other cases, he didn't put a date at all, in all likelihood because he didn't know. Internal evidence from the correspondence itself could probably fill in most of the gaps, but Remy didn't have time for that. She turned the pages as quickly as she could while still taking care with the old parchment scanning the papal letters from the year 534. It went faster than she thought it would. From the opening of many letters, she could tell if it wasn't a good match. Much of it was routine work for managing the papal lands, letters to managers of farms or the treasurer. She ignored these and focused on the letters to bishops and other ecclesiastical leaders. While she did not find a letter to the Bishop of Palermo, She did come across a letter circulated to all priests attached to churches. It was titled, Correcting Errors of the Gospels in Sermons to the Ignorant Flock. It opened with the instruction that, while most services at that time were conducted in Latin, these sermons should be given in whatever vulgate the people will understand. Vulgate was a term for the common language. By this time, many people in Western Europe had stopped using Latin, Services were still held in Latin and would be for many centuries to come, so it was obvious that Pope John II wanted to make sure that this particular message reached as many people as possible. The letter opened with, 
There is currently circulating in many unholy groups of students who call themselves devout Christians a text claiming to be a testament of the crucifixion of our Lord, written by the very man who pierced his flesh with a spear while he hung for our sins on the cross. This text is not Holy Scripture, and contains blasphemies and distortions of the Word of God that would imperil the immortal soul of any who set eyes upon it. Therefore preach to your flocks the error of reading such lies, and sternly warn them of the consequences of doing such a foul act. Consult with the lay authorities in your cities and towns, and if any such sinners are found, have the lay authorities execute them away from the public eye, so they do not become esteemed by those who have strayed in a mockery of the lives and deaths of the martyrs. And that was all. Remy felt a tingle all over her. Again the term devout student had come up, or something close to it. And this time the text even provided details of the book, a book that might have been called The Gospel of Longinus. The man who pierced his flesh with a spear while he hung for our sins on the cross was a Roman legionary, unnamed in the Gospels but called in later tradition Longinus. This figure, who should have been hated as much as Pontius Pilate by Christians for his role in the crucifixion, had become a revered figure in many traditions in later centuries. It was said that he converted to Christianity. The Roman Catholic and Eastern Orthodox churches even made him a saint. Despite Longinus becoming a part of Catholic belief, no writings were ever ascribed to him. A gospel by him, telling an eyewitness account of the crucifixion by one who participated in it, could possibly shake the foundations of Christian belief. Pope John II had certainly thought so. He gave out his edict before Longinus had become known as a holy man. The Pope thought he was suppressing a book by a murderer of Jesus, a man condemned to the worst tortures of hell. Indeed, writings from the Pope's time said that Longinus had gone to hell on this earth while still alive. He had been trapped in a cave, where every night a lion would come and slowly tear him to pieces. At dawn his body would reassemble, and he would have to wait all day in nervous anticipation of the lion's return. God had decreed that this torture would continue until the second coming. And these devout students were reading and promoting a book by him. What could it have contained, and did it still exist, hidden away for centuries like the Gospel of Judas? Hey! Remy yelped, spinning around in a chair. Daniel stood next to her. "'Why are you sneaking up on me like that?' Remy demanded. "'You scared me half to death.' "'I didn't sneak up on you. I said hello twice.' "'Oh, I must have gotten a bit absorbed.' Daniel grinned. "'Like always. Anyway, there's been a hitch with the phone tracing. Some sort of bureaucracy about how the president of the phone company needs to be informed, and he can't be reached. Some stupid thing like that. The guys at the station say it won't be sorted out for a few hours, which means we should get some sleep. I need it, and you sure as hell look like you need it, too. You have a wonderful way of flattering a lady. Just calling it as I see it. Let's go. Remy looked doubtfully at the stack of books. I'm on the trail now. I really should continue. Daniel covered a yawn. Remy, it's almost midnight. Poor brother Luca was three-quarters asleep when I banged on the door— and your eyes are redder than most potheads I've arrested. Let's go. But— One thing you have to learn on this job is that if you get a chance to rest, you should take it. Being fresh for the start of a new day will help you get more work done in the long run. If you grind and grind and grind, you'll only wear yourself out and the perp might get away. Remy sighed. I suppose you're right. She stood, feeling the tension in her lower back and stiffness in her neck. Too bad Cyril wasn't here. His back rubs were wonderful. Oh, God, Cyril. I still haven't texted him. How must he feel when I keep disappearing on cases like this and forget to even say hello? Let's go back to the hotel, Remy said, reminding herself to text Cyril as soon as she got there. On the way, I'll tell you what I have found. I am glad you found something after all this reading. What's the highlight? Daniel asked as they left the underground library and went up the narrow stone steps. The highlight is that the Association of Devout Students might be at least fifteen hundred years old, and they might have a serious motive for keeping their members in order. Motive enough for murder? 
Perhaps, Remy mused, we don't really know what we're dealing with yet. Hopefully once we trace Father de Sanctis's phone, we'll get him to provide us with some more answers. Chapter 10 Back in her hotel room, Remy opened up a laptop to take a look at the code she had found hidden in a little medieval statuette of the Virgin Mary, the one the map inside the cryptex had led her to. It was written in a small and tidy hand on a little roll of parchment. She had taken a photo of it so that she didn't have to keep unrolling the centuries-old paper. X3F6OEE7C7 BE336 UNGL2 6 PHOISTMIL Remy had gotten into the habit of staring at it every night before bed, hoping her subconscious mind would hit upon an answer her conscious mind could not. So far that hadn't happened. She had thought about bringing in a colleague who was an expert at such codes, but he was a former lover, and things were tense enough between her and Cyril. She didn't want to endanger the relationship further. Cyril! She had promised herself to text him as soon as she got in, and here she was trying to unravel a medieval mystery. Feeling guilty, she reached for her phone. Maybe Cyril was right. Maybe she was too obsessed. She checked the time and calculated that he had his office hours at the moment. Considering how few students actually came to office hours, he probably had plenty of time to chat. She sent a simple hello. As she expected, she got a response almost immediately. Are you safe? Remy smiled, even though she had declined to mention some of the nastier aspects of her previous two cases. He knew she had been in some danger. Totally safe, she texted back. We're on the trail of a murderer, but he's nowhere near us. When will you come home? I don't know. Estimate? I have no idea, sorry. I understand. Remy cocked her head. That was unusual. Before she could reply, he texted again. I found something for us. For us? There was a pause. Then a real estate listing appeared on her phone. It was for a small three-bedroomed house in a nice neighbourhood near Georgetown University. Remy's hand trembled a little as she looked at the image. It was a lovely little place. And as she clicked through the real estate site, she saw it had a nice private back garden with a few trees and a well-lit and newly remodelled interior. Cyril texted again. I think we can use the spare bedroom as a home office and library. We can put a pull-out sofa bed there for when my daughter wants to visit. Remy continued to stare at the images. A house. With Cyril. He texted again. The price is good too. We'll have to act quickly if we want to snap it up. She put her phone down and let out a long, slow breath. This was a big step. She would be living with him day to day. While she saw him every day already, this would involve sleeping together in the same bed every night, sharing a bathroom, lounging on the same sofa in the evenings. This was sharing a life. Why did this frighten her? She loved Cyril. She looked forward to every date she had with him, and her only real objection to marrying him was that her visa made her have to rush into it. Or was that really her only objection? Cyril texted again. So what do you think? She realised she had to respond. She picked up her phone again and stopped, fingers poised over the screen. What would she say? She texted back. I need to see it first. But you're in Italy, and you don't know when you're coming back. I've looked it all over, had a contractor come to examine it, and he gave it a thumbs up. I even brought cattle in to take a look. Get the female perspective. She loves it. Remy's eyes bugged. Cyril had brought his daughter to see the house. Had he told her they were going to get married? In a panic, Remy texted back. Did you tell her? She couldn't quite write that we're getting married. No, she suspects, though, asking all sorts of roundabout questions. Smart girl. This was followed by a series of smiley emojis. Remy raised an eyebrow. Cyril never used emojis. He was the least emoji-type person she had ever met. And until now, she had never suspected that Catalin knew she existed. I can't deal with this. Not now. 
wearily she texted back. Let me think about it. The housing market is fairly good at the moment from what I hear. There's no rush. Actually, the market is pretty bad. This is a find. Remy groaned. She had made that up and got caught by someone who had obviously done their homework. It's past midnight here. Let me sleep on it. Pause. Remy stared at the screen. All right. Tell me in the morning. OK? My morning. Give you some time. OK, I will. Love you. Love you. Followed by more emojis. What was going on? Remy put her phone on silent and set it aside, not knowing what to think. She had texted him to settle things a bit more, and now their relationship had become even more confusing. Wearily she got undressed, turned off the light, and snuggled under the sheets, looking forward to getting some rest at last. Only to find she couldn't sleep. At first, as she stared into the darkness above her bed, she thought it was stress about Cyril's new idea of buying a house. But, after examining her feelings for a while, she realised that the case was pushing out any other thoughts. More and more, Cyril and the house faded into the background, as the evidence they had uncovered came to the foreground of her mind. The few scraps of information she had found in the texts Jax had been consulting went around and around in her mind. Because they were so vague, so fragmentary, her imagination could fill in the blanks with all sorts of intriguing possibilities. The biggest of them was the idea that the Gospel of Longinus, if it could be called that, might still exist. Gareth Jacks and Brother Antonio Neri apparently thought so, or they wouldn't have been researching it so avidly. The killer obviously thought the same. But where to go from here? Father Ambrogio wasn't going to be much help. What was he hiding? And what if the phone trace on Father de Sanctis didn't turn up anything? He might have had his phone turned off the entire time, or left it somewhere. The members of this strange and perhaps ancient organisation seemed to have a suspicion of modern technology. Remy cursed. Maybe she should have stayed all night to read the texts. Daniel was right, though. If she didn't get some sleep, she'd be useless tomorrow. Too bad she couldn't be two people at once, a researcher and an investigator. She chuckled. Cyril had said she had to be one or the other, and now she needed to be both. Wait, she could be both. Of course. Kimberley could help her. Kimberley was in her first year of her master's degree, only twenty-three years old and already the lone bright light in the depressing darkness of American student apathy. Remy had been continuously disappointed with the lacklustre demeanour of the average American student, both undergraduate and graduate. More interested in phones and flirting, they did not have the same verve and hunger for knowledge as her generation on both sides of the Atlantic, or indeed the modern students at the Sorbonne. But Kimberley wasn't like that at all. Intelligent, hard-working to the point of obsessiveness, and always ready for a challenge, she already knew Latin almost as well as Remy herself. She also knew the ins and outs of computer databases far better than someone Remy's age could ever hope to. Indeed, she could even find things on JSTOR. Remy pulled out a laptop, and suppressing a big yawn, fired off an email to Kimberley, providing her with a few things she knew about the Association of Devout Students. Find out whatever you can, Remy finished the email, and quickly. This is for the FBI case I'm on. I'm giving you a two-week extension on your paper so you can work on this. Remy hit send and smiled. She wasn't sure she was allowed to give students extensions so they could work on FBI cases. In fact, she wasn't sure a civilian advisor was allowed to subcontract her work. She also found she didn't much care. A murderer was on the loose and needed to be hunted down as quickly as possible. Everything else took second place. I'm beginning to understand you, father, Remy thought. It's too bad I didn't understand you when I was young. Kimberly emailed back. I'm on it. Remy smiled. This had been the right decision. She put away her laptop, switched off the light, and got into bed. This time she fell asleep immediately. A smart officer of the law knew when to rest, so she could resume the hunt fresh the next day. Chapter 11 When Remy awoke the next morning, still feeling the muzzy after-effects of jet-lag and two long days of work, 
she found a text from Daniel saying the phone company had finally gotten their act together and given up the location of Father de Sancti's phone. Come down when you're ready, Daniel texted. We're in the breakfast room. Remy checked the time, cursed to see it was already 7.30, and rushed through her morning preparations as quickly as possible. She had seen that Kimberley had sent an email. She'd deal with that on the way to wherever they were going. Once ready, she rushed downstairs to find Daniel and Sergeant Esposito sipping coffee in the breakfast room. Where are we going? Remy asked without sitting down. Sergeant Esposito answered in Italian, A town called Cavriglia, about an hour north of here on the road to Florence. The phone company traced Father de Sancti's mobile there. He switched it off before leaving Rome a couple of days ago, just after Signor Jax was murdered, and kept it off until yesterday afternoon, when he got on for a few minutes to check emails and messages, none of which he replied to. Daniel cut in. Did he tell you the good part? I was saving this for you, Daniel, the sergeant said with a wink. Daniel gave him a thumbs up and turned back to Remy. He made two calls to Gareth Jacks the day before Jacks was murdered. Both lasted less than two minutes each. Why so short? Remy wondered aloud. She can't have discussed Jacks's findings. I think they were making arrangements to meet up in person, Daniel said. The calls were too short to do anything else. Now we're getting a warrant to search Jax's phone records. I should have thought of it before, but he was such a recluse I didn't think he'd call anyone while out of the country. Stupid of me. Let's go, Remy said. I'll skip breakfast. This is urgent. Oh, no, you don't. Daniel held up a paper bag and a coffee cup with a lid. Cappuccino with one sugar. That's what you always have, right? That's right. Remy said, lighting up. Daniel shook the bag. A croissant, some fruit, and a cereal bar. That should keep you going until we catch this guy. And we have this to help us, Sergeant Esposito said, pulling out a printed web page. It was from a Catholic news site and was about a meeting of theologians. Several men, including priests, monks, and laypeople, stood smiling at the camera in a formal shot. One man in front... A tall, thin man with salt and pepper hair and a stern visage was circled. This is Father de Sanctis, the sergeant told her. Do you think he's our killer? Remy asked Daniel. It was Sergeant Esposito who answered. He spoke with and probably met the victim, then disappeared to a provincial town he has no business in. But what about Father Neri in Milan? How does he fit in? De Sanctis had the day off when Neri took a dive off that bridge, Daniel replied. He kept his phone switched off the entire day. We need to go, Remy said, grabbing the breakfast from Daniel and heading out the door. Daniel laughed. Wrong way, Remy stopped. What do you mean? We're parked out back, Daniel said, pointing down a hallway that led to the hotel's back door. You were in such a hurry that you didn't ask where the car was. Remy flushed and followed the men down the hall. She would be in more of a rush if she knew about the fire, Sergeant Esposito said. Fire? What fire? A church in Cavriglia burned down last week, Daniel said. There's evidence that an accelerant was used. Accelerant? Something to speed up the fire, like gasoline or kerosene. Arson, in other words. Have the police search it, Remy said. We have, the sergeant replied. They have not found the missing priest. They are keeping an eye out for him all over town. Remember that he might have made a move since the last time he used his phone, Daniel said. The trail might have gone cold. It might, Remy agreed. I want to see the inside of this church, though. As Sergeant Esposito drove a police car through the morning rush hour, using his sirens to make way, Remy read the email from Kimberley. Hey, Professor Laurel. Remy smiled at the mixture of informal and formal address. No student at the Sorbonne would dare start an email to a professor with the French equivalent of hey. I spent all afternoon and evening tracking down the Association of Devout Students. Wow, what a secretive organization. Sounds interesting. Thanks for bringing me aboard. Here's a list of references I found. Sorry I didn't find more. Remy edged forward in the back seat of the police car until her seat belt constrained her. 
First on the list was the same conference proceedings Remy had found. There followed three more items. The Otto of Bremen's Chronicle of the German Lands has an entry for the year 983 saying, among other unrelated events, a group of heretics was uncovered in Goslar. These vile persons claimed the Roman who stabbed the Son of God with a spear, while he suffered for our sins on the cross, was in fact a saint, doing the Lord's will. The books from which they read this vile lie were confiscated and burned, and their property seized. Sadly, the heretics themselves were able to flee the region and have not been found. The next reference I am not sure about since it's way off in time and place. A witch trial in the Connecticut colony in 1693, the same year as the Salem witch trials, mentions someone who might be a match, one Ebenezer Martin, late of Newport, and more recently of Stamford, was hanged as a witch for professing that the Catholics are correct and speak the true gospel when they say that one Longinus, the soldier who tortured our Lord while he hung on the cross, was a saint and most holy. He said with evident pride that he had learned this from a travelling peddler who had a certain book that asserted the same. The last one was the weirdest. It came up when I did an exact search for variations on the name. A society of devout students got mentioned in an account of the Sudan campaign of 1898 when the British retook the Sudan from the radical Islamic army under the Mahdi. A British officer named Sir Jonathan Neville wrote a memoir of the campaign. It's available on archive.org. He says that Among the many civilian assistants and followers with the army of varying degrees of utility, the most curious was a German priest who was a member of an organization of which I had never heard, the Society of Devout Students. He was most interested in studying certain medieval Christian monasteries in northern Sudan and rescuing any texts and church artifacts which had been overlooked by the Mahdi's destructive followers. He was of great assistance in providing spiritual comfort and medical aid to the sick and wounded. That's all I've found. I'll keep looking. Thanks once again for letting me help with your FBI work. Everyone talks about how awesome it is that you work as a consultant for the FBI. You're the coolest professor we have in medieval studies. This was signed with a heart and a smiley face. Remy chuckled. What a bright, enthusiastic student. Maybe she could get Kimberley a semester abroad at the Sorbonne, after a lesson in scholastic etiquette, of course. The only thing that troubled her was how the students were all talking about her FBI work. Remy already knew that information about her side job had percolated through the department gossip mill. It was too interesting not to. The details had remained secret, but how much had they guessed? Judging from his demeanour, Father Emmanuel Ambrogio had guessed the truth, and he didn't even know the timing of her consultancy work. With Remy disappearing on a case just as the cryptex killer was committing his murders, it wouldn't take much for the students to put two and two together especially when Daniel had barged into her lecture, identified himself as FBI, and dismissed the class. This could be a problem, a big problem. She had been so wrapped up in the cases and her troubles with Cyril that she hadn't thought about the potential effect this work might have on her professional reputation or standing in the academic community. It might even attract the attention of the press. That would be fatal to her career. These worries began to subside as Sergeant Esposito took them through the suburbs of Rome and out into the glorious Tuscan countryside. Rolling green hills, vineyards, little villages with roofs of red tile, and rocky promontories topped with medieval castles, all passed unseen, as she mulled over what Kimberley had discovered. An account in a medieval chronicle, a witch trial in colonial New England, a German priest in nineteenth-century Sudan, a secretive organisation in a modern-day suburb of Rome, could they all be connected? It seemed impossible. Could the association of devout students really have endured for that long, and over that much of the world? At first she thought, given that her previous two references were centuries apart, that the modern association was a revival of the medieval one, but now that some intermediate dates had cropped up she wasn't so sure. Still, it remained pretty slim evidence. Hopefully Kimberley would find more. Remy had made the right decision bringing her into the investigation. 
But what of the department rumour mill? Remy pulled out a phone and fired off a quick email, asking Kimberly to keep quiet about this. Hopefully she hadn't talked about it already. Remy cursed herself for not taking this precaution sooner. She put her phone away and sat back, wondering just how organised the Association of Devout Students was, and how ancient. It looked like they had come across something far, far bigger than a simple series of murders. Remy did not come out of her reverie until the sergeant announced that they were entering the town of Cavriglia. She looked around and saw a mostly modern town by a small river. Most of the buildings looked twentieth century, with a few older ones patched up with more recent repairs. Remy guessed it had been the scene of a battle during World War II and got flattened. Many towns and villages had suffered such treatment. Thankfully the Germans had retreated from Rome before the Allies advanced into it, otherwise the Eternal City might look as uninspiring and inconsequential as this place. "'I did some research on the church that burned,' Sergeant Esposito said. "'Seventeenth century and not too famous. A local church, but it was one of the few buildings left standing after the war. The government restored it in the 1960s. They had to replace the bell tower.' Some American tank had blown off the top. The Crouch probably had a sniper up there, Daniel said. Stop talking like an old war movie, Remy said. I'm talking like my grandfather. He might have been the one to make the shot. That got a sidelong look from the sergeant, who decided to ignore the comment and continued. I couldn't find out much more about the church except that an anonymous benefactor donated a large number of books to the church library in 2008. Really? Remy said, looking around the modern streets with greater interest. Have you been able to track down the benefactor? Is there any information about the books? The only thing I was able to find was an article from the local newspaper. It said that a large personal collection of theological books was donated to the church by an elderly man. A lifetime of collection... Interesting, Remy mused. You think our guy has added book burning to his list of crimes? Daniel asked from the front seat, glancing at her through the rearview mirror. It's possible. With someone who will peel the skin off a murder victim, anything is possible. Chapter 12 Remy gazed at the burned church as Sergeant Esposito parked the police car across the street. It was a simple baroque structure, large but rather unadorned. While some examples of the baroque were overly decorated and ended up exhausting the eye with colour and detail, this church kept the general lines of baroque architecture without the expensive frills, as if the patron wanted it to look grand but did not want to spend too much money. Still, it was a historic building, and it broke Remy's heart to see the collapsed roof, the shattered stained glass, and the black smoke marks above every door and window. "'The local police have given us permission to investigate,' he told them. "'They aren't joining us?' Daniel asked. The sergeant shrugged. "'These small police departments, they do not want the work.' Daniel snorted. "'Fine. We don't need them anyway.' They got out. A few pedestrians were on the street, mostly the elderly, since this was start of a weekday, and younger people were at work. No one walked on the side of the street where the remains of the church stood. It was blocked off with police tape, which flapped forlornly in the wind. As they crossed the street, an old lady called out to them in Italian. I hope you have found the people responsible. Imagine burning the house of God. Sergeant Esposito turned and said, We will catch the culprits, madam. I promise you. The arson had been in the news? Remy asked him. Yes, the local police told the reporters. Remy grimaced. That only made their work harder. Several other people stopped and watched them as they ducked under the police tape and came to the entrance of the church. The doors hung open, charred and half off their hinges. Wait here, Sergeant Esposito said. I will talk to them. He pulled out the photo he had of Father de Sanctis and went over to the small crowd. Curious, Remy followed while Daniel stayed behind, peering into the blackened interior. As Remy came up to the officer and the little crowd of locals, she heard one elderly woman say, Oh yes, I saw someone who looked like that, but it couldn't have been the same man. She was dressed in widow's black, 
a tradition that still endured in the smaller towns and villages of Italy. "'Tell me more, madam,' Sergeant Esposito said. "'Well, he was at the corner store. You know, the one owned by that nice Chinese family.' "'I don't know, madam. I'm with the Rome police.' "'Oh, it's just up via Immaculata,' the woman pointed vaguely. "'Anyway, I was in there just last night. Gloria was there too, weren't you, Gloria?' Another old woman, identical in a black dress, black sweater and black shawl, nodded eagerly. "'Please tell me more,' the sergeant said. "'Well, he had the same features as the man in this picture, and that same sour look,' the first woman said. Gloria giggled as if making fun of someone who even resembled a priest was a venal sin. "'We were buying a few things when he came in. I thought he was homeless man.' "'Definitely homeless man,' Gloria said. "'He was all dirty.' "'Very dirty. His clothes were all smudged, and his face was too. He looked like he had made some attempt at cleaning himself, probably so Signor Chin didn't throw him out. He doesn't like homeless people in his store. He says they try to steal the wine.' "'They do,' Gloria confirmed. "'I've seen them.' "'I see,' Sergeant Esposito said. "'Now, could you tell me a bit more about this man?' "'Yes, he looks much like this man in the photo, but he wasn't a priest. He was dressed in regular clothing.' "'Could you describe the clothing?' "'Dirty.' "'Was he wearing a suit? Jogging clothes?' Sergeant Esposito said with increasing impatience. "'Oh!' "'Regular button-down shirt and slacks. "'Very respectable-looking for a homeless man.' "'Except for the dirt,' Gloria sniffed. "'Except for the dirt,' the first woman agreed. "'And what time did you see him?' "'Last night it must have been around seven. "'No, it was nine, Gloria said. "'No, I'm sure it was seven. "'It couldn't have been. "'We were at Astafania's house at seven. "'No, silly, that was the night before last. "'No, it wasn't.' "'Thank you, ladies,' Sergeant Esposito said. He and Remy walked off. "'No point questioning them further,' he told Remy once they had gotten out of earshot. "'We can always check the security footage at the convenience store.' They came up to Daniel. "'There's been a sighting of Father de Sanctis,' Remy told him. "'Really? Where? When?' "'Last night at a local convenience store.' "'At around seven, Sergeant Esposito said. "'Or nine. Remy said. The two exchanged smiles. "'Why not midnight next Thursday?' Sergeant Esposito said. "'What did I tell you about civilians making terrible witnesses?' Daniel said to Remy, "'His clothes were dirty, right?' Remy blinked. "'Yes, how did you know that?' Daniel gestured toward the interior of the church. "'Someone's been walking in and out of here. An adult with dress shoes, so no teens or kids exploring the scene of a fire.' "'The criminal returning to the scene of the crime?' Remy asked. "'Could be,' Daniel replied. "'We should investigate,' Sergeant Esposito said. He turned to Remy. "'Wait here.' Daniel laughed. "'She's not going to wait here.' "'But she's not police. Try telling her that.' Daniel turned to Remy. "'If I told you to stay out of a ruined building that's structurally hazardous and might house a murderer, would you listen?' Remy put on an innocent face. "'You make me sound hard-headed.' Daniel snorted, shook his head, and stepped across the threshold. Sergeant Esposito followed. Remy smiled and followed. Once they got a better look at the building, they saw the destruction wasn't as bad as it had first appeared. The wooden roof had collapsed, and now they walked on the charred heap of beams. The walls, although blackened, did not appear cracked. Some of the statues had even survived in their niches, and with a great deal of cleaning might even be displayable again. What she worried about most was the floor. It was of stone, no doubt held up by arches in the crypt, but they couldn't see much of it through the fallen roof. Every step sent up little clouds of soot that stained their pants. "'I'm thinking this is why Father de Sanctis looked like a homeless guy,' Daniel said. "'Walk most careful,' Sergeant Esposito said. There are the nails. They kept a slow pace, testing every step and shifting boards to the side with their feet. Why was he in here? Remy wondered. Maybe we can find out, Daniel said, pointing to a faint path leading towards the back of the building. He isn't very good at hiding his tracks. They kept to the aisle, 
To either side the shattered pews made for rougher and more dangerous going. When they got to the altar they paused for a moment. The marble platform was cracked and chipped. The altar covering all but burnt away. A large central beam had landed directly on it, the beam splitting in two and nearly destroying the altar itself. Behind, a large crucifix of alabaster was entirely ruined. Only the four ends of the crucifix, where they were attached to the wall, had stayed in place. On the floor beneath, mingled with the blackened roof beams, lay jumbled pieces of the figure of Jesus and the cross on which he had died. Sergeant Esposito crossed himself. Remy automatically did the same. Daniel glanced at them, then indicated the path they were following. He went in two directions. One goes to the left of the altar and one to the right. Remy nodded, impressed. She could barely see the left-hand path and would have missed it if her partner hadn't pointed it out. I guess he went to the left less than to the right, she suggested. Maybe he went back and forth several times on the main path. Daniel nodded. Looks like. I wonder what he was up to. Anyone know where the library was stored? We've only come about two-thirds of the length of this building, Remy noted. It's probably behind this wall. They followed the trail around a large pillar. Sergeant Esposito and Daniel both drew their guns. An open doorway led to a room beyond. Remy could see several boards that had been shifted to make a path through the door. Daniel held up his hand to tell them to stop, and, gun levelled, went through first. Oh, hell, she heard him say just after he went out of sight. What? Remy asked. She tried to push past Sergeant Esposito, but there were heaps of splintered boards to either side, and she couldn't. You don't want to see this, Remy. What is it? Sergeant Esposito asked. He moved through the doorway and stopped just beyond, letting out a little groan. Remy peeked over his shoulder and let out a groan herself. It was the saddest thing she had ever seen. Chapter 13 Remy almost teared up to see row upon row of collapsed bookshelves, their contents now nothing but heaps of ash. She didn't need Daniel to tell her the fire had started here. It had obviously been much hotter at this spot. The wooden beams were almost burnt through, the walls blackened and cracked, the books all but vanished. It was her worst fear confirmed. The arsonist had targeted the library. He's been all through here. Daniel whispered, as if afraid to disturb the ghosts of the dead scholars. Remy looked where he pointed and saw blurred footprints through the ash all over the room. If he was looking for books that survived, he couldn't have found any, Remy said. He knows this, Sergeant Esposito said. It is obvious, and yet he looked anyway. Why? And he might have started the fire in the first place, Daniel said. That makes the why bigger the police sergeant said. Sure does, Daniel said. Maybe he was searching for something here, found it stolen and burned the library out of a sense of rage. Or maybe he burned the library to keep someone else from getting whatever it was he was looking for. Or maybe he stole something and covered up his crime by burning the library. None of these explains why he would come back. Daniel gave a little shrug. You're right. None of those ideas make much sense. Actually, none of this makes much sense. No one had any better suggestions. Remy watched from the doorway as Daniel and Sergeant Esposito picked their way through the rubble of the library. After a few minutes they returned. Nothing, Daniel said. Not that I expected to find anything. Remy shook her head. No, nothing could have survived this. Without speaking, they retraced their steps to follow the more used path, the one that circled the altar to the right around a second large pillar. This one led them to another open door. Beyond, they came to a room that looked like it had once been the vestry. Scraps of ecclesiastical garb were mingled in with the ruins of several wooden closets. At the far end of the wall stood a door that was still intact and shut. They approached with care, noticing the rubble in front of it had been cleared away. "'This must lead to the crypt,' Remy said. "'We're almost to the back of the church. There's no space for another room.' Let's see what he was after down there, Daniel said. Remy stepped back. She did. Daniel positioned himself on one side of the door and nodded to Sergeant Esposito, who got on the other side of the door and grasped the knob. Remy stayed behind Daniel, holding a little can of pepper spray. She had bought a new one just before going on this trip. 
She'd been going through them pretty quickly lately. She reminded herself to ask the nice couple that ran American Pride Guns and Ammo if they gave bulk discounts. Silence. Then Sergeant Esposito wrenched the door open. It opened out, blocking him for a moment. Alone, Daniel ducked around the corner, gun levelled, to face nothing but an empty stairwell. Stairs led down. Daniel pulled out a mini mag light from inside his jacket and held it under his gun. Sergeant Esposito pulled out a larger flashlight from his belt. Remy had to content herself with the flashlight on her phone. She reminded herself to get something better at American Pride Guns and Ammo. Since the last case, she had become a regular there, practising her aim on the gunnery range with rental weapons, since she couldn't own one in the United States. Stone stairs descended into darkness. There was little soot here and no rubble. The stone roof and surviving door had protected the lower level. Slowly they made their way down, their footsteps echoing loudly. The steps took a right turn. Daniel darted around the corner, gun levelled, then relaxed. Remy and Sergeant Esposito followed. They stepped down into a large vaulted crypt. The air felt cooler here, and clean after the gritty cloud that hung over the burnt building above. The flashlights barely penetrated the gloom, for the crypt was almost as big as the church itself. Large marble sarcophagi stood waist-high like cereal coffee tables all around the room, their tops carved with the names of the deceased. Some even bore likenesses of their occupants in bas-relief. These watched them with stony eyes as they made their way through the room, treading on flagstones that bore the names and dates of more of the dead. Remy shuddered and turned away from the scene, shining her light slowly across the ceiling. She saw no cracks. They had descended fairly deep, so the ceiling between them and the church above must have been thick. They seemed safe enough, at least from cave-ins. When she looked back at the others, she found Daniel shining his light not on the ceiling but on the floor. Sooty footprints crisscrossed the room. Father De Sanctis, or whoever, had been here and walked several times around the crypt. At the far end of the crypt, they saw a small shrine with a statue of the Virgin Mary. To either side stood small open portals leading to darkness. As they approached the shrine, Remy stopped short, taking in a sharp breath. Behind one of the sarcophagi was a rolled-up sleeping bag and several shopping bags filled with food and bottled water. "'Think he's still here?' Daniel whispered. The sudden sound made Remy jump. "'We must follow procedure,' Sergeant Esposito whispered back. Then, in a louder voice in Italian, he shouted— "'Father de Sanctis, or whoever is hiding in this crypt, this is the police. Come out with your hands up. We have you trapped here, and there is no escape. Please give yourself up at once.' Silence. The three looked at each other. "'You take the right door,' Daniel told the policeman, "'and I'll take the left. Remy, stay well back. No time for heroics.' "'All right,' Remy said. While she was eager to find out who was down here and why— she did not want to go into one of those darkened rooms. She took several paces back, shining the flashlight of her phone on the back of the crypt, to give a little additional light to both men. "'Father de Sanctis and whoever else is in this building, this is your last chance!' Sergeant Esposito shouted, his words echoing eerily through the vaulted chamber for the dead. He and Daniel nodded to each other and stepped through their respective doorways, guns at the ready. Just then, Remy heard a movement behind her and to her right. She spun around and saw a dark figure leap up from behind a far sarcophagus and dart for the exit. Stop! Remy shouted in Italian. The figure didn't even slow down. Remy ran after him. Remy, no! Daniel shouted from behind her. She didn't listen. They'd never catch him. She was much closer. She sprinted past the sarcophagi, gaining on the man who ran before her, her phone's light bobbing up and down as her arms pumped from running. She caught glimpses of an older man in sooty clothing. He sprang onto the staircase and disappeared around the corner. She ran up the stairs and around the corner after him, and realised her mistake. He had stopped and turned. She nearly ran right into him. He reached for her, and with a cry Remy leapt back, stumbling on the stairs and falling backwards. Daniel watched helplessly as Remy, who had just disappeared around the turn at the base of the stairs, reappeared, falling backwards, her arms pirouetting as her feet stumbled, desperately trying to regain her balance. There was no hope for that. Still more than ten yards away, Daniel was powerless to help as she slammed against the stone wall, hitting her head, knees buckling. The fugitive dove for her, arms outstretched. 
Remy just managed to raise her hand and shot her pepper spray at him. It was an unaimed shot, but good enough. It caught him in the face just as he grabbed her. Remy, her eyes screwed shut against the noxious red cloud, kept spraying, waving her hand around as she blindly tried to defend herself. It worked. Father de Sanctis, for now, in the spotlight of his maglite, Daniel could recognise him, got a second blast full in the face. He staggered back, hands up, coughing, and fell. Daniel made it to the landing, dropped his maglite, and grabbed Remy by the arm, all the while keeping his gun aimed at the choking, writhing priest, who lay at an awkward angle on the stairs. Sergeant Esposito rushed past him as Daniel pulled Remy out of danger. He heard the police officer shouting in Italian. From his half-remembered lessons from Uncle Roy, he understood Sergeant Esposito was telling the suspect to keep still. "'Keep still,' was one of the phrases Daniel especially remembered. Shoving that foul memory aside, he bent over Remy. "'Are you all right?' he asked, his words cut with anxiety. Remy opened her eyes, glanced in De Sanctis's direction to make sure she was safe, and then slowly rotated her shoulder, wincing from pain. "'I hit the wall pretty hard. I'm glad I didn't hit my head.' You looked like you did. No, my shoulder took the blow. Are you hurt badly? Oh, no, I don't think so. Daniel gave her a lift up, pulling on her good arm. She didn't object and stood there for a moment, rubbing her shoulder. Twin sets of coughs made them turn. Sergeant Esposito had handcuffed Father de Sanctis and led him out of the stairwell, where some of the pepper spray still hung in the still air. The police officer had wisely kept one eye closed. The other was red and flowing with tears. He didn't look as bad as De Sanctis, though. His face was scarlet. Both men coughed. Congratulations, Daniel told his partner. This time you've managed to pepper spray a priest and a cop. You're getting to be quite a star with that thing. Even in the half-light, he could see Remy blush almost as red as poor Father De Sanctis. He put a hand on her shoulder. For a brief instant he felt her tense, and he was about to pull his hand away when she relaxed. "'You did good,' he said. "'But I'd like you to be more careful.' "'It is us who should be careful,' Sergeant Esposito said. "'He slipped by us in the dark.' "'True enough,' Daniel said. He picked up his mini-maglite and shone it in Father de Sanctis's face, and took a step back at the hostility he saw there. He'd faced many suspects, many people gunning for him, but the rage and hatred he saw in those bloodshot eyes was more than he had ever seen. "'You know nothing of what you do,' Father de Sanctis said in heavily accented English. "'If you are not careful, you will all die.'" Chapter 14 Back at the local station, Daniel sat across from Father de Sanctis. He hadn't said a word as they brought him to the station and processed him. But now he sat in the interrogation room, facing himself, Remy, Sergeant Esposito, and some local cop whose name Daniel didn't catch. Now he would have to talk. "'So why were you camped out in the crypt of a burnt church?' Daniel asked him, snapping the words out in order to intimidate him. The Sanctis gave him a contemptuous look, and asked something in Italian to the officers. The local cop replied while Sergeant Esposito translated. He asked if he's going to face charges. We told him yes. He is under arrest for criminal trespass and assaulting Remy Laurent, and will be held until he answers our questions. I also told him he might even face charges for murder. Good job, Esposito, Daniel said, then turned to the priest. To make this easier, Father, why don't we speak in English? I know you speak it, and the FBI has some questions for you. Very well the priest grumbled in English. Daniel glanced around at the others in the room. While they had cleaned up and allowed the prisoner to wash, everyone's clothes were soiled and the room smelled of smoke. Who burned the church? Daniel asked. Now that Daniel had had some time to think, he didn't think this guy was the arsonist. Daniel theorised he had entered the ruins hoping to find something the fire spared. Given all the food and water in the crypt, it looked like he had been searching for a while. I don't know, the prisoner replied. Got any ideas? I don't know. Daniel frowned. You better cough up something other than soot if you plan on ever seeing the light of day again. 
Why were you hiding in the crypt? I was afraid of whoever killed Signor Jax and Father Neri, and I apologized to the lady. When you three came in, I thought the arsonist had come back with accomplices to kill me. I ran and panicked. I never meant to hurt an innocent woman. Any idea who might have killed those two men? Daniel asked, unconvinced. Father de Sanctis looked down at the table and shook his head. Your phone was off. Why? I was afraid they could trace me with it, so I used it as little as possible. Daniel resisted the urge to laugh. This man obviously needed a lesson on surveillance technology. On second thought, it's better to let the public stay ignorant. Who are they? The people who want to trace you? Father de Sanctis grimaced. I don't know exactly, and that is the truth. But those who delve into the secrets of the faith often uncover things others want to keep hidden, and then reveal them to the world. Such as? The priest stayed silent. Remy asked in a quiet voice, Such as the Gospel of Longinus? Father de Sanctis's head jerked up, eyes widening in surprise. Then he looked down again. Is that what you are looking for in the burnt library? Remy went on. Father de Sanctis shook his head. You saw it. No book could have survived. Then why look? Sergeant Esposito asked. I was hoping to find a secret niche that might have contained it. I have been through that library many times before and never found it, but I hoped the fire might reveal something. I found nothing. Father de Sanctis slumped a little. And you stayed in the crypt for the last few days. Why? Daniel asked. To hide and to continue my search. Why do you think this gospel is hidden there? I think they want to destroy it. That's why they burned the church. But it wouldn't be hidden in a place where it could be eliminated so easily. It would be in some niche in the wall or some sealed chest that could resist fire and the elements. Daniel cocked his head. You're in the Association of Devout Students. Yes. Who told you? Never mind that. Does the Association have the Gospel of Longinus? Father de Sanctis didn't reply. Answer me. Your members are being killed one by one. You might be next. Hell, you even think that yourself. Cooperate so we can keep you and your colleagues safe. The priest sighed. We may have it. Stop playing with me, Daniel snapped. You're already being charged with criminal trespass and attempted assault. You want to go to jail? The local policeman tried to object, but Daniel waved him off and jabbed a finger in the priest's direction. That collar isn't going to save you. If you don't cooperate, we're going to hold you. Father de Sanctis did not look intimidated. I'd be safer in a jail cell. Daniel looked him in the eye. Think of your colleagues. Your silence could lead to their deaths. You're the one who is in danger. Yeah, you said that back in the church. Why are we in danger? Father de Sanctis gave him another of his contemptuous smiles. Fool. You think you can bluster in here with your American arrogance and solve a dispute that's been going on since the time of Jesus Christ? There are many people, many institutions, that do not want true knowledge to be revealed. Like the Association of Devout Students, Daniel said. The priest looked stunned. I beg your pardon? You've never seen this gospel, have you? Otherwise you wouldn't have been looking for it. Your association probably leads you on with hints and little revelations, but never gives you the real stuff. Father de Sanctis stiffened. It is only for those who have spent many years on the spiritual path and gained sufficient wisdom to... So you haven't seen it. And you said yourself that you searched that library several times trying to find it. You won a shortcut, so don't get all high and mighty. Only the higher-ups get to see it, right? Has Father Ambrogio seen it? I don't know. Those who have seen it are sworn to secrecy. Just as I thought. A typical cult. You spend years working for the cult thinking you'll get some great revelation. But all the so-called wisdom and all the power stay with the people in charge. It's like a mockery of the Christian religion. In real religion, the wisdom is laid out in a book everyone can read. 
Hell, most churches will give you one for free. While Daniel was not a religious man, he didn't consider himself an atheist. He had never really given the bigger questions of life much thought. He was too busy trying to keep civilians alive. But he really, really did not like cults. They weren't religious, they were predatory power trips by those who started them, and he had seen them hurt too many people. How do you know it exists? Daniel asked in a quiet voice. Daniel hoped to get a rise out of the priest and make him slip up. Suspects who got angry often did. But Father de Sanctis had obviously dealt with doubters before. Many reasons. Firstly, if you delve into the history like I have, or Father Neri or Signor Jax, you will find many references to the association and many mentions of the book itself, mostly by elders of the incorrect faith who look on us as their enemies. Of course, that doesn't prove the book still exists today. But it does exist, I'm sure of it. If you look at the history, there are just as many references to it, if not more, in the recent times than in the distant past. And the existence of the association itself is proof, if not to preserve the book, why exist? Why preserve a book that you can't read? Remy asked. If we search enough, we do get to read it. The association puts you on a path, one in which they encourage you with proper reading and intellectual connections to find your own way to the book. The journey, as with any spiritual journey, is just as important as the destination. Indeed, the destination cannot be appreciated without the journey. Once someone is sufficiently advanced, once they are sufficiently ready, they find their own way to the book. Only then are they ready for its revelations. How convenient, Daniel thought. Everyone struggles for something they don't get to see. But you wanted to take a shortcut. Father de Sanctis shifted in his seat and said in a voice that didn't carry quite as much authority as before, I feel the association is too strict with who can and cannot read the book. I feel I'm sufficiently advanced to read the revelations. Of course you are. But why all the secrecy? he asked out loud. I mean, you could just publish it, couldn't you? Father de Sanctis shook his head. That would be the worst thing we could do. Most people are not ready for the revelations in the Book of Longinus. And the mainstream church would crack down hard on us. Is that why you're not an official Vatican organization? Remy asked. That's right, he replied, and Daniel could hear a heavy disappointment in his voice. Remy thought for a moment and then went on. So, if you've been an organization for as long as you say, why have the murders only started now? We faced much persecution over the years, especially in the early centuries when we were more vocal with our beliefs. So many of us were executed and so many copies of the book burned that we learned to stay secret. We haven't had any trouble since that I know of. So, why now, do you ask? I really don't know. All I can think of is that someone is trying to destroy the book once and for all, or take it for themselves. And the tattoos? Daniel asked. What do they have to do with it? Father de Sanctis gave a little start. What do you mean? Now we're getting somewhere. Daniel leaned forward. Father Neri and Mr. Jax both had a small section of skin removed with a straight razor. The only thing I can think of is that the killer was removing a tattoo. Some sort of evidence. Valuable evidence. He could have just taken a photo. But no, he wanted the evidence to himself. Maybe he thinks someone else is on the trail. Maybe that's you. Maybe he saw Jackson Neri as rivals. Father de Sanctis fell silent. Do you have a tattoo, Father? Sergeant Esposito asked. I do, he admitted. May we see it? The Italian policeman asked with more respect than Daniel could have mustered. The priest hesitated a moment, then rose. He unbuttoned his shirt halfway and pulled it down off his shoulders. Turning around, they saw a small letter T written in Gothic script. Even finding the association of devout students is a difficult task, Father de Sanctis said. 
I suspect Professor Laurent did not even know of its existence, despite her deep knowledge of the Middle Ages. Yes, Professor Laurent, I've heard of you. We all have. Your studies into the cryptex are fascinating, and I do pray that one day you find it. Once someone approaches the association and requests membership, their background is checked. If approved, they swear themselves to secrecy and are blessed with this tattoo. Daniel looked at the little letter. What does the T stand for? I don't know. Wait, it doesn't stand for anything, Daniel realised. Otherwise, there would be no reason to remove the tattoos from the victims. Each tattoo is different. They spell out something. I have come to the same conclusion, Father de Sanctis said, turning around and buttoning up his shirt. What does it spell out? Remy asked. I don't know. Daniel looked at his partner and saw that hungry, eager gleam in her eye that he'd seen so many times before. He knew that look. It meant that she'd find out what this priest couldn't find out. And she'd get in a whole lot of trouble in the meantime. Chapter 15 Remy's heart beat fast as she stared at Father de Sanctis. The original book. That's what they're looking for. And that's what he was hoping to find in the burned church in Cavideglia. But they must have copies. After all the persecution they said they've suffered, they wouldn't have just one copy, would they? Unless they think it's too dangerous to copy. Possibilities swirled in Remy's mind. A lost gospel. Of course, several had been found before, and hadn't caused all that many ripples. After so many centuries of having the approved books of the Bible set in stone, New Gospels, such as the Gospel of Judas, could be dismissed by theologians as not truly part of the Bible. Much of the general public, assuming they heard about the books at all, remained indifferent. Whoever ran the Association of Devout Students obviously thought this book becoming public would have a different effect. Would it? Perhaps, perhaps not. But in the meantime people were getting killed over it. Remy reminded herself that, as an investigator, solving the crime was of primary concern. The book was secondary. Yes, the book was secondary. Remy was startled at this insight. When people were being murdered, everything else became secondary. Does that mean I'm an officer of the law more than I am an historian? You are not an officer of the law, Remy reminded herself. Unless you decide to take the FBI's offer and completely turn your life on its head. All these thoughts flashed through her head in a couple of seconds. You say you don't know what the tattoos spell out, Remy said, trying to rein in her thoughts and focus on the man sitting before her. Did the association give you any indication? None. Are all the tattoos just one single letter? Remy asked. As far as I know and they are all placed somewhere that it would not normally be seen. Daniel cut in. How many members are there in the Association of Devout Students? I'm not sure. Hundreds, at least. I myself know several dozen. There is no list available, but if a member is going to a new city, they can ask the secretary to connect them with members there who share their interests. Hundreds of members, eh? Maybe thousands? That's possible. Daniel and Remy exchanged a look. If there were that many members, the tattoos could spell out a whole text. Or some sort of cryptogram like the one that was currently stumping Remy. Remy leaned forward. Father, are you telling me that you have no idea what these tattoos spell out? No. But you do have your theories, Daniel said. Father de Sanctis opened his mouth and then seemed to think the better of it. After a pause, he said, I have taken an oath not to reveal any secrets about the Association of Devout Students and the book it protects. I cannot even share my educated guesses. Father, people are being killed, Daniel said, exasperated. Your colleagues are being killed. And I do want to help, he turned to Remy. I'd like to give you something. When the police emptied my pockets, they took two keychains. On one are several keys. Those are mine. On the other is a single key. This unlocks the library on the Via Carlo Catania in Rome. 
just behind Santa Maria Maggiore. It is the best of our libraries set up by a patron in the seventeenth century and added to ever since. Take this key and study for yourself. While I cannot give you any more information, someone like you could certainly find what you're looking for. Although there is no sign, you can recognize the library because it has the sign of the four Gospels above the door. Won't someone stop me if I try to go in? The library does not have any permanent staff. If you go after six in the evening, no one will be there except perhaps another student, and he or she will presume you are with us. Thank you, Remy replied, her skin prickling as if someone had just offered to translate that code the cryptex had led her to. Please don't tell anyone in the association that I gave you this key. It might mean my dismissal. I only give it to you because I want the killing to stop. He gave her an enigmatic smile. Perhaps you can conquer by this. Remy cocked her head at the odd turn of phrase. Before she could reply, the chief of police, an older pot-bellied man, walked in. We checked with the convenience store, he announced, and found Father de Sanctis has been coming in every evening. He couldn't be the murderer you are looking for. Even Father de Sanctis's great service to the church and the innocuous nature of his crimes, we have decided to let him off with a warning. He broke into the church because he was frightened. An unwise move, but hardly worth bringing the man of the cloth up on charges. He tried to assault Professor Laurent, Sergeant Esposito objected. Remy shrugged. We were both scared, and he didn't touch me. Remy translated all this to Daniel. Daniel cursed under his breath and turned to the priest. Now what are you planning on doing? He growled. Father de Sanctis raised his eyebrows. Getting very far away from here. We need to know where. I have a cousin in the country not far from here. I'll go there on the bus. We need that cousin's name, address and phone number before you go. Sergeant Esposito gave him a pen and paper and he wrote the information down. The police chief looked at it. It's not far, he said in English. We will drive him there. Daniel nodded. Good. That'll keep the priest safe and under the eye of the law. I need to get back to Rome and take a look at that library, Remy said. All right, Daniel said reluctantly. Remy shared the feeling. They were running all around central Italy and not getting anywhere. He wrote down his number and Remy's and handed it to the priest. If you have any problems, if you think anyone is following you, call the police and then call us. Don't take any chances. Father de Sanctis nodded somberly to him and turned to Remy. I am putting my faith in you. I know you are an excellent researcher and you might be able to get on the track of this horrible sinner if given the right information. I apologize for not being able to give it to you myself, but I swore on the name of the Most Holy God. Thank you, Father. Come, Sergeant Esposito said. I will get the key the priest mentioned and we will go, yes. The policeman here will take Father de Sanctis in a car to the village. You'll be safe there. I sure hope so, Remy thought. The question is, if the killer is still hunting for tattoos, who is he going to go after next? Out in the hall, Daniel stopped her. So, what do you think the tattoos spell out? Maybe the entire text of the Gospel of Longinus? No, Remy replied. That couldn't be it. It wouldn't be long enough. And anyway, the tattoos were in Latin letters. A gospel that early would most likely have been written in Aramaic or ancient Greek. Of course, in later years it would have probably been translated into Latin, which everyone used in the Middle Ages. But the original would have been kept in its original language. But Longinus was a Roman legionary. The gospel was almost certainly not written by the man himself. And it doesn't matter that Longinus was a Roman soldier. Living in the province of Judea, he would have learned Greek, as Greek was the lingua franca of the eastern half of the Roman Empire. Even official reports were often written in Greek. I see, Daniel said. Remy looked pensive. So, to answer your question, I have no idea what the tattoos spell out. All I know is that two letters aren't enough to give the killer what he wants. Finally, the last convert had begun to lose patience. He had despaired of ever getting Professor Lawrence Winkler alone. 
The man seemed to be friends with half of Italy. Every night, every lunch break, he had one or more companions. The last convert had begun to make plans to kill him in front of a witness, and then kill the witness. Thank God he didn't have to go through with such a risky move. Just as he had begun to lose hope, Professor Winkler had left the library at closing time as usual, took a solo walk through busy evening streets, and then dined alone at a small restaurant. The last convert had dined with him, two tables away. And now Professor Winkler was walking off his dinner with a stroll through the smaller streets at the edge of town, breathing in the fresh air away from the clutter and noise of downtown. Like many of the smaller cities of Europe, Ravenna was very compact and had few to no suburbs. The last convert knew that Professor Winkler was heading through a neighbourhood that would suddenly stop. The apartment buildings and shops, replaced from one street to the next by open farmers' fields. Perfect. After all those social afternoons and evenings with friends, Professor Winkler wanted a quiet night in the countryside. He'd get anything but. The last convert trailed him from half a block behind as the professor strolled past the last built-up block and followed a country lane between two fields. He did not look around him, only up at the brilliant night sky, now that the lights were dwindling behind him and the stars shone more brightly on a moonless night. The last convert increased his pace, closing the gap between them. He got within twenty yards of Professor Winkler before the man heard him and looked over his shoulder. Buona serata, the professor said. Good evening. The last convert only nodded in response. He did not want to reply, and give away the fact that he spoke Italian with an American accent. Professor Winkler looked ahead of him once more and continued walking. Trying to move more silently, the last convert increased his pace even more in order to close the final gap keeping his hands in his pockets, one grasping the garrote. This time he managed to get within ten yards before Professor Winkler looked around again. The academic stepped to the side, either to let the stranger pass or out of a sense of rising caution. The last convert tried to look casual as he continued straight, appearing intent on passing the scholar. Professor Winkler moved a little further to the side and nodded a greeting again. The last convert pointed beyond him and said, Look! the oldest trick in the book, but used on a soft, unsuspecting man who had never known violence. It worked every time. Professor Winkler looked away from him, out across the darkened field. With a motion, practised to perfection in front of a mirror for hours on end, the last convert pulled out the garrote, grasped it with both hands, and rushed at the professor. Winkler turned just in time to see what was coming for him. He cried out, putting up a hand, and the last convert ended up wrapping the garrote around the professor's hand and his neck. Professor Winkler struggled, his hand crushed against his neck, and partially stopping his breath. His free hand clawed at the constraining rope. The last convert was stuck, facing the professor, a terrible way to try to strangle someone, and a slow one too. There was no one in sight the last time he checked, a few seconds ago, but they were so close to the city's edge someone could come along at any moment. The last convert wrenched Professor Winkler to the side, making him fall. As he did so, the last convert eased up on the rope. The professor then did what he expected him to, the natural thing for him to do, and the worst possible thing for him to do. He pulled his hand free of the rope, and got on his hands and knees, trying to rise. That gave the last convert, standing above him, the perfect opportunity to get the garrote around his neck properly. With a heave he yanked the professor to his feet. A sharp pain jabbed through the last convert's abdomen. He cursed. He knew he shouldn't lift a heavy weight like that. With a snarl, he tightened the cord cruelly around the professor's skinny neck. He glanced to the left and right, still no one in sight. He raised his knee to put it in the small of Professor Winkler's back, and felt another twinge of pain in his abdomen. Damn it! he cursed under his breath, the words drowned out by the professor's choking gasps. Not now. I need to get it done. In the end, he didn't need the extra leverage of a knee to the professor's back. The man was weak, and the last convert had a good firm grip around his neck. Within a minute he slumped. The last convert kept the cord around his neck for another minute to make sure, then dragged the body into a drainage ditch by the side of the road. Again his abdomen twinged as he pulled his victim's dead weight. Once he got Winkler out of sight in the ditch, he grimaced and put his hand inside his pants, rubbing his sore abdomen. He'd had a hernia operation the year before, and the doctor had warned him about straining himself. Ha! <laughs> what did the doctor know about his great work? 
After a moment to catch his breath and allowing the pain to ease, the last convert bent over the professor and searched his pockets. No notes. He cursed again. They must be in his hotel room out of reach. It didn't matter. He had enough of the puzzle that once he had all the right tattoos he could figure it out for himself. The last convert pulled down Professor Winkler's pants to expose his left hip, where the tattoo was clearly visible even in the faint starlight. He began to cut. Chapter 16 Remy studied the nondescript façade of the library Father de Sanctis had led her to. As he had mentioned, above the plain door were the four signs of the Gospels, a man for Matthew, a lion for Mark, a calf for Luke, and an eagle for John. This was a common decoration on many medieval and Renaissance buildings, but this one had a new twist. In the centre was a blank circle, as if to denote a fifth hidden Gospel. Remy didn't need any hints as to what that Gospel might be. The only other strange aspect of the front of the building was that there were no windows. Since it adjoined buildings to either side and perhaps the back, Remy wondered if there were any windows at all. That would fit with their desire not to be observed. I bet they don't have Wi-Fi either. Remy sensed this was a more important library than the one Father Ambrogio guarded so jealously. That one had hidden in plain sight. This one was all but invisible. She took a short flight of stairs to the front door. There was no plaque or any other sign. I can't even tell if anyone is here. What if I'm challenged? Heart beating fast, Remy glanced both ways down the street. A few people walked on the sidewalk, ignoring her. I haven't seen any female members. What if I stand out? What do I do if someone asks me about the association? What if this is a trap somehow? She glanced around again. Don't just stand here. It looks suspicious. Remy wasn't only feeling a case of nerves, she also felt a bit guilty. Daniel had gone back to the police station to talk with some CSI experts, and told Remy to go get some rest, since she was clearly exhausted. The library can wait until the morning, he had said. Remy had agreed in order to avoid an argument, and then had promptly come here after he had left. Daniel looked exhausted too, and he was working. So why couldn't she? She took another look round, scanning for security cameras. She didn't see any. Odd, these people really didn't like electronics. Taking a deep breath, she slipped the key into the lock and turned it with a click. The heavy wooden portal needed a good push to open. She stepped into a small foyer with a marble floor and a small chandelier that provided her with soft light. There were no furnishings, only a second door with a sign above it showing a mobile phone and laptop circled with a line through them. Keeping up with their anti-technology attitude? The door had a keypad next to it. Remy cursed, checked the door, and found it to be locked. There was a keyhole for a backup, like with most electronic doors, but her key didn't fit it. The bastard, she said, stomping her foot. He must be laughing at me right now. She took a few steps back and forth in the small foyer, growling and pacing like a caged animal, until something Father de Sanctis had said came back to her. Perhaps you can conquer by this. Of course, the most famous quote from late antiquity, at the Battle of Milvian Bridge, when Constantine marched on Rome in order to win his bid to become emperor, he faced a pagan army under the Emperor Maxentius. His army was also mostly pagan, but the legend went that the night before the battle, Constantine saw a glowing cross in the sky and the words In hoc signo vinces, Latin for conquer by this sign. Interpreting it as a command by the Christian god, Constantine had his men paint a cross on their shields. The next day he won the battle. When he installed himself as emperor, one of the first things he did was to make Christianity, so long persecuted, the official religion of the Roman Empire. Paganism would take another two centuries to die, but historians have always marked this battle as the true beginning of Christian Europe. And what year was that? 312 AD. Remy went up to the keypad and, holding her breath, punched in 312. The door clicked open. Letting out a little shiver, Remy opened it and passed through. She found that the flat façade actually hid a circular building. Bookshelves branched off from the centre like spokes on a wheel, with a cluster of desks in the middle. She looked up to see two more floors. 
Past banisters of polished wood she could see that they too held tall bookshelves. The dome was painted with an image of Christ arisen, the stigmata on his hands, feet and side clearly visible. Christ pointed to the wound on his side, while a man in the armour of a Roman legionary, with a halo around his head, knelt before him, hands clasped in prayer. Lunginess, Remy whispered. A movement off to her left made her jerk around. Someone sitting at one of the desks had looked up when she spoke. Remy bit her lip. Silence was golden in libraries. She had known this since she was a little girl. It would be no different in this secret collection. The man who wore the robes of a Franciscan bent down to continue reading, the bald spot of his tonsure gleaming a bit in the bright reading light affixed to his desk. Remy moved out of sight into one of the aisles. Now what? She had a whole library to look through and didn't know what to look for. She studied the books nearest to her. They were a variety of tomes from Renaissance volumes bound in vellum to rare self-published books by radical investigators from the twenty-first century. They were organised alphabetically by author, but she saw no numbers for the Dewey Decimal System or any other system. She did notice that all the books she saw in this aisle related to the lives of the saints. Baffled, she went to the end of the aisle and found it was labelled in both Latin and Ancient Greek. Hagiography 1. Beyond this she saw aisles labelled Hagiography 2 and Hagiography 3. She moved on and found aisles for Theology, the Reformation, Papal Conclaves, and several other topics. All the labels were in Latin and Ancient Greek, imitating the labels on the aisles of the great lost library of Alexandria. No signs were in Italian or English. Everyone given access to this library would know the ancient languages. All right, so now she could find books, assuming she knew the subject and author, assuming she knew what she was looking for, which she didn't. Now what? Another idea struck her. She went around the circumference of the room, looking at all the subjects. She didn't find what she was looking for. She did notice, however, that there were only two people studying on the ground floor. A spiral staircase of metal took her up to the next floor. It was loose on its moorings and rattled a little as she ascended, making Remy wince. A man in the black robes and high-peaked hat of a Greek Orthodox priest sat reading at a desk near the staircase. Interesting. So it wasn't just Catholics in here. Well, if they wanted to upset all of Christian teaching with their supposedly hidden knowledge, they wouldn't care about a student's creed, would they? She continued to search the titles. Halfway around the circular room she found what she was looking for. A shelf labelled History and Rules of the Association. Heart beating faster, she walked down the aisle, perusing books in several ancient and modern languages. To her delight she found one from France printed during the Enlightenment. She plucked that off the shelf and also one in English that looked recently printed. Taking these she found a desk as far away from the Greek Orthodox priest as possible. She didn't want a member of the association seeing her looking up what should be basic knowledge for her. First she skimmed both books and found that the hint Father de Sanctis had made of the association dating back to the time of Jesus Christ was correct at least according to their literature. Remy suspended judgment on that, but as she read more deeply, she found that both books included detailed histories of the Association of Devout Students, running from the time of the Apostles right up to the time they were published. She did a bit of cross-checking between the old French book and the more modern English one, and found several minor discrepancies, especially in the early years. That made Remy smile. In a way, it strengthened the case for the association being old rather than undermining it. If the group had been created out of nothing a few centuries ago, they would have set a history for themselves that would be passed down in a single authoritative volume. But if they had developed over two millennia, then the traditions and stories about the organisation would have become muddled as some information was lost and other facts became obscured by time. The two books did agree on the basics, as she scanned both books, wishing she had time to read them more thoroughly, she learned that the order had been founded by the Apostle Judas himself, who lived to a hundred and ten years by the grace of God. This was odd. She had thought the association would have been founded by Longinus. As the Roman soldier who stuck his spear into Jesus' side while he hung on the cross, it was his conversion to Christianity that was the most miraculous, 
and it was his gospel that was supposed to be the foundation of the association. But perhaps having the gospel written by another figure who was supposedly a sinner, Judas himself, the gospel was given extra force. It also, she reasoned, gave it an extra layer of verisimilitude. The idea that Longinus, a humble soldier, could not write his own gospel carried a ring of truth. Remy leaned forward, suppressed a yawn that threatened to overcome her excitement, and read on. This was interesting. Theologians had spent years discussing the apparent contradiction in the account of Judas's death. In Matthew, the apostle is said to have tried to return the thirty pieces of silver to the priests out of remorse. The priests refused the coins, saying they were blood money, and Judas threw them on the ground and then hanged himself. The book of Acts has an entirely different account. In it, Peter says Judas used the money to buy a field, and one day fell dead in it, his body bursting. There was no mention of suicide. The death appeared to be a punishment by God. The two books she read now told an account that differed from both biblical texts. It didn't mention Judas trying to return the money or buying a field. Instead, he used the money to buy ink and vellum of the finest quality, so that he could write down the true words of the Son of God as given to him by the soldier Longinus, who could not read or write. Ah, now it was making sense. The texts went on. Judas had not been present at the sacrifice of our Lord, for the other apostles did not believe that he had acted on the command of the Almighty, and turned their faces from him. Interesting. This agreed with the writings in the book of Judas, which hadn't been rediscovered until the late twentieth century and the English book bore a date of 1927, while the French text was 18th century. Here was a tradition that confirmed some of that book's teachings. Perhaps the association had a copy of the Gospel of Judas they had never shared with the public. What other precious books might they have hidden away? Remy kept reading. Longinus was, by the grace of God, shown the errors of paganism just as did the repentant thief who was crucified next to Jesus. Longinus stood sentinel by the side of our Lord until he was removed from the cross and taken to the tomb. During this time the Lord taught him much, giving him his final gospel, the teachings of which made all previous gospels as children's fables to the noble truth. Unfortunately, neither book went on to give any detail as to what was in this final gospel. Remy groaned in frustration. Wonderful. So she gets into the library, finds books on the order, and they don't even tell her what it all means. In a way, she wasn't surprised. The association of devout students was based on the hope of learning something secret, and guarding that secret from a world that was not ready to have it revealed. Someone sure wanted to find out, though. She gave a glance around her. The library had grown quiet. She hadn't heard any movement from any of the few other readers she had seen. Another yawn threatened to overcome her. She had been reading for some time now. How late was it? Best not to look at her watch. It would only make her more tired. The best cure for fatigue was more work, she thought, remembering a favourite saying of her old adviser. As fascinating as the history of the association was, it wasn't telling her what she needed to know. What were these tattoos the murderer so desperately wanted? The French book had several chapters on Traditions of the Association. The English edition had a section on induction into the devout students. Deciding the more modern text would be more relevant, she read the English book first. It didn't take her long to find what she sought. After an applicant's background and level of devotion was checked, senior members of the Association would interview him or her to gauge the level of their scholastic knowledge. Only the most learned would be accepted. Then they had to swear an oath of secrecy, swear to protect the gospel of Longinus with their life, interesting, Remy thought, and promise to make a lifelong study of all scripture, both canonical and apocryphal, in order to prepare them to read the great text itself. Only then was the applicant accepted into the association of devout students. As part of the induction ceremony, the applicant is given a part of the great secret a single letter tattooed on his or her flesh in a place normally covered by clothing. This letter, combined with others, gives the location of the gospel which we are all sworn to study and protect. Thus, all members are given a part of the secret, although they must swear never to show their tattoo to other members. 
Remy gasped and sat back. So there it was. The murderer wanted to get the tattoos in order to find the location of the Gospel of Longinus. And he or she removed the tattoos so no one else could find it. But how to pick which member to take? If there were hundreds, perhaps thousands of members, not all the letters could be a part of the location. Most wouldn't be part of the directions. An added level of security. Plus members died and new ones came in. There had to be a system to ensure that the proper letters remained in circulation, while the majority of tattoos didn't spell out anything. Someone had to be in charge of that. Someone had to know all the answers. Father Ambrogio? He claimed to only be the association's secretary. Was someone above him, perhaps several people? Or had he misled them about how powerful he was? Another massive yawn sent a wave of fatigue through her. Now that she had found what she had been looking for, her stamina faltered. She felt her eyelids growing heavy. Damn this jet lag. It usually didn't hit her this badly, but on the other hand, when she travelled for academic conferences, she wasn't constantly stressed and missing out on sleep. Remy's head sank to her chest. Just a little rest, and then she'd get back to it. The sound of a phone snapped her out of it. For a moment she was disoriented, groggy as if woken from a long deep sleep. She wondered where she was, and why her head was resting on a desk. A library. Oh, right, the library of the Association of Devout Students. She fumbled with a phone, hurrying to answer it, as its ring echoed through the domed building. She hated people whose phones went off in the quiet places of study, and here she was doing it herself, and in a library that she wasn't even supposed to have access to. Daniel's voice came over the line, and it did not sound happy. "'Hey, Remy, where the hell are you? The front desk said you didn't go up to your room.' "'Um,' Remy tried to shake the fog of weariness from her head. How long had she been out? "'You're at the library, aren't you? I'm already on my way.' Um, yes, she whispered, and I found out something important. I can't talk here. I'll wait for you outside. All right, Daniel grumbled. He hung up. Remy looked at her phone and saw it was past midnight. She must have slept for at least a couple of hours. Rubbing her eyes, she looked around. The library was dimmer, and for a moment she couldn't understand why. Then she realized that all of the individual lights on the reading desks were off. Everyone else must have gone home. She got up, stretched, yawned, and went over to the railing to look down at the rotunda below. As she had guessed, the desks at the centre were all unoccupied, and none of the others she could see on her floor were taken either. Silence reigned. Better put the books back. She moved over to the desk and picked up the two volumes. Just then she heard the rustling of robes. That made her jump a little. She had thought she was alone. She turned to the source of the sound and saw nothing. Skin prickling, she moved around the circular building towards the shelf where she had found the two books. Time to get out of here and get some proper sleep. She would have some choice questions for Father Ambrogio in the morning. Another rustling of robes behind her. She gave a nervous look over her shoulder. No one. Wait, was that a shadow passing behind the last bookshelf? A passing of dark cloth between the narrow gap between the top of the books and the bottom of the next shelf? Remy increased her pace, looking behind her every few steps. Again she saw the shadow flit behind a nearby bookshelf. Yes, there was definitely someone there. And that someone was following her. Chapter 17 Remy hurried down an aisle and ducked to the right to loop around down another aisle back the way she came. She hunched low, hoping to keep out of sight of her pursuer. For a second she thought she'd succeeded, but then she heard soft, fast footsteps pursuing her. Her throat tightened. She fought an urge to scream for help. That would only reveal her location, and there might be more than one man out there looking for her. She came to the end of the aisle, peeked around it, and didn't see anyone. For a second she hesitated, then sprinted several metres before ducking down another aisle. There she crouched, staying silent and hoping not to be seen. Her ears strained to hear any sound, but her pursuer or pursuers had gone quiet. Had they stopped too, or were they moving more carefully, hoping to sneak up on her? The moment stretched out. Sweat beaded on her forehead. A drop fell from her skin to land on the cover of the book she gripped with a soft tap. 
Then, so softly, that at first she didn't think she'd really heard it, she heard the rustling of robes, and the nearly silent tread of shoes on the marble floor. It sounded quiet, yet close. The next aisle? She dared a peek between the top of the books next to her and the bottom of the upper shelf, and her heart clenched. A curtain of black robes passed right by her. Remy held her breath. The robes stopped, bunched up as the man crouched. A pair of hard blue eyes glowered at her from beyond the row of books. Remy screamed, leapt up and sprinted down the aisle. The man moved too fast for her. Suddenly he was there, blocking a passage. Remy caught a glimpse of a burly man of middle age in the loose, flowing robes of the clergy, with the priest's collar around his neck. That's all she got time to see. She threw the two heavy books in his face, hearing him cry out as they thudded into him, and she turned and bolted. Remy raced across the library to the spiral staircase, hurtling herself down it three steps at a time, slamming into the railing more than once, and nearly toppling over. She got to the ground floor and sprinted across the rotunda, a feat given extra speed by the clattering of the spiral staircase behind her. Getting to the front door, she tore it open, dove through, and slammed it shut behind her, catching a glimpse of the priest just a few steps away. In a second she made it across the narrow foyer and opened the front door, nearly bashing into Daniel standing on the other side. "'Someone's after me!' she panted. Daniel pulled out his gun. "'Who?' Priest, she took a big breath, right behind the door. She punched the code 312 into the keypad again. When the door clicked open, Daniel opened it, holding his gun at the ready. The priest had vanished. Stay close, Daniel whispered. Then loudly he shouted, This is the police. Whoever is in here, come out with your hands up. Remy translated into Italian. Despite her scare, calling herself police gave her an extra level of confidence even if it wasn't strictly true. And she wasn't scared now, not with Daniel by her side with his gun drawn. He may have been a bore with no table manners, but he could handle himself in danger. A darting shadow and soft footsteps to their right told them where the man had fled. Stop! Daniel shouted and went after him. Remy kept right behind him. They ran to the stacks, keeping to the centre of the rotunda in case the priest tried to cut past them to get to the door. But no, he was going elsewhere. Remy heard the tell-tale metallic rattle of the spiral staircase. This way, Remy said, pointing. They ran to the staircase. Daniel stopped at the bottom, peering up the stairwell, leading with his gun. They saw no one. Is there another way out of here? Daniel whispered. Not that I know of. Good, we got him. Carefully they climbed up. When they got to the top they peered around and couldn't see him. If we leave the staircase to go search for him, he might slip past us. Remy whispered. Then we won't, he said. He gave her a wink and crept a couple of stacks to the right, keeping the staircase within view. Then he selected a thin paperback volume and flicked it further down the open space between the wall and the aisles. It landed on its cover three aisles away, making a soft sound. Then they ducked out of sight behind one of the aisles of books, Daniel peeking around the end of the bookshelf to watch the spiral staircase. Remy nodded in appreciation. Daniel was more clever than he often acted. She'd appreciate it if he could be clever without throwing books around, though. It turned out the priest was even more clever. They heard a sound coming from the opposite side of the library. They moved down the aisle and looked out just in time to see him clamber over the banister across from them, hang from his hands on the lower edge, and drop the ten feet to the marble floor below. Remy winced, thinking he would snap an ankle for sure, but instead he rolled with the fall, sprang up, and without a pause, sprinted for the door. Daniel cursed and raced for the staircase. Remy, her heart sinking, followed. There was no way they would catch him now. Sure enough, by the time they got to the street outside, he was long gone. Damn it, Daniel said. He turned to her. Could you please stop sneaking around behind my back and getting into danger? You know what could have happened to you. Remy flushed. I'm sorry. Yeah, real sorry. Until next time. You're gonna get yourself killed. What am I supposed to tell Cyril? I'll be the one who'll have to explain it to him. And how the hell do I explain it to my boss? Well, I wouldn't want my death to get you in trouble, Remy said, aggrieved. It's not just that and you know it. Remy blinked. I beg your pardon? Daniel paused for a second. Never mind. 
he said, holstering his gun. Let's go. Go where? If I was smart, we'd be going to the airport so I could send you on the first plane back to the States, he snapped. Sorry, Remy mumbled. Daniel was right. She had been foolish and impulsive. Again. And having this FBI agent dressing her down was more than a little humbling. Yeah, that's what I'd do if I was smart. But I'm not smart and I still need you, so we go into the police station. Why? He held up two fingers. Two reasons. One, the CSI folks have a way of reading the tattoos even though they've been removed. Only the epidermis and upper dermis got removed, and traces of the ink make it down to the dermis. They can photograph it under a certain type of light to reveal the tattoo. And two? Remy asked. Daniel gave her a grim look. There's been another murder. Remy and Daniel sat in the police station with a very sleepy Sergeant Esposito. On the screen were several photos taken that night at the crime scene in a field just outside Ravenna. We put out an alert to all police stations in Italy to look for murders where they remove the flesh, the sergeant said, knocking back some coffee. The Ravenna police just sent us this two hours ago. He pulled up a police file and then looked at Remy uncertainly. I've seen these things before, Remy told him, although on the inside she felt a bit queasy. Some teenager coming back from a party found him, Sergeant Esposito said, clicking through the pictures. He was strangled by the garrote. He clicked on a close-up of the neck, where a livid bruise creased the flesh. Thick, Daniel said. Looks like the same cord used on Gareth Jacks. Sergeant Esposito clicked on another photo that showed the upper body, with the victim lying on his back in what looked like a ditch by a field. The face, with jaw slack and tongue extended, stared sightlessly at the camera through bugged eyes. "'Professor Lawrence Winkler!' Remy cried. "'You know this man?' the sergeant asked. "'He's a leading researcher at Cambridge. "'I've been on panels with him. "'My God!' "'Remy leaned back, suddenly afraid. "'While she had heard of Gareth Jacks, "'she had actually known Winkler. "'They had been to several conferences together, "'drank wine together at receptions. "'He had a jovial sense of humour a terrier named Rosie, and a university-aged son who studied engineering, dreaming of developing more efficient solar panels. Remy wiped her brow with a trembling hand. Daniel put a hand on her shoulder. Sorry about your friend. The rough man meant it. You could see the concern and pity in his eyes. Remy didn't want to correct him. Winkler had never been a friend, just a friendly colleague. But even so, it was enough of a shock. She cleared her throat. Daniel's hand remained on her shoulder. "'Go on,' she said. "'Are you sure?' Sergeant Esposito asked. She gave a quick nod, and regretted it immediately. The next photo revealed that the killer had pulled Winkler's pants down. The genitalia were clearly visible. A rectangular section of the flesh had been removed from the left thigh. Remy felt something rise in her throat. She turned away. Daniel's hand, still on her shoulder, gave her a reassuring squeeze. "'There's a branch of the University of Bologna in Ravenna,' she said, her voice sounding hollow distant. "'He was probably doing research there.' "'Can you think of what he might have been studying?' Daniel asked. "'He was an expert in religion in late antiquity, especially the pagan-Christian transition. The same general research area as Gareth Jacks and Father Neri. Remy pulled out a phone and fired a quick email to her graduate student, asking her to delve into Winkler's publications and any reference to apocryphal books of the Bible. The men continued clicking through photos of the crime scene, but Remy didn't pay attention. She had seen enough. By the time she had sent the email, they were done. "'This killer is very good,' Sergeant Esposito said. "'He leave little evidence, no fingerprints, no heirs as of yet.' But he make mistake. He leave footprints in the soft soil. Dress shoes, size 43. That is, I believe, size 10 in America. Something like that, Daniel said. At least we're sure our guy is a man now. Not many women have feet that big. Ravenna is four hours away by car, Remy said. 
Are we going to go there? Daniel shook his head. I don't think there's a need, at least not yet. The police have checked the crime scene and there's not much we're going to find there. Despite feeling Winkler's loss, Remy felt a sense of weary relief. They had been going back and forth enough already, missing the murderer and not having enough time to spend in any one place to really get a handle on the situation. Now that she had access to the Library of the Association of Devout Students, she didn't think she needed to see these other libraries, assuming it was safe for her to return. She wasn't going to go back alone, that was for certain. Suddenly a thought struck her. But if these three men were all members of the association, why would they go to other libraries to do the research? Remy wondered aloud. Wouldn't the library I visited have everything they need? Good point, Daniel grunted. That's another thing to ask Father Ambrogio tomorrow. Tomorrow? We should go there now. Tomorrow, Remy. There's no good hauling him out of bed at two in the morning. Remember what I said about sleep? You need it, I need it. Sergeant Esposito here, he clapped the police officer on the shoulder, definitely needs it. Learn to pace yourself, Remy. CSI will have the tattoo scans by the morning, and that will give us more ammo to fire at good old Father Ambrogio. Remy ground her teeth at the delay. Another scholar dead, another person whose work she admired. They had to get to the bottom of this, now. But she saw Daniel's reasoning. She needed to keep in mind that he was the more experienced partner, and she could understand why Daniel got so angry with her when she ran off to do her own thing. To him, these impulsive moves of hers acted as a distraction. They needed to act more as a team. And that meant listening to Daniel when he said something sensible. So she wouldn't rush over to the church right this moment and yank Father Ambrogio out of bed. But God help him if he didn't give them some answers tomorrow. Chapter 18 Remy found that Daniel was right about rest, because after snatching four hours of sleep, the morning hit her with several worries at once. The first came when she woke the next morning and checked her phone, a curt text from Cyril. You didn't give me your opinion. Her sleep-addled mind couldn't figure out what he meant for a second. As she sat up rubbing her eyes, it hit her. The house. Remy let out a groan. She was supposed to give a response about that house he wanted them to buy. He wanted them to buy. After a deep sigh, she texted back. It's a big step. I need to see the house first. A valid response, but one she knew he wouldn't be satisfied with. The next issue was an email from Kimberley. I looked into Professor Winkler's publications. His period is way earlier than yours, so I guess you haven't read much of his stuff. When the Gospel of Judas was first published in English in 2006, back when I was still playing with Barbie, lol, Remy rolled her eyes. These kids had a talent for making her feel old. He published a couple of papers saying that the book should be considered part of the biblical canon. That didn't get a good reaction. Everyone else said it was apocryphal. He also made a reference to other accounts of the last days of Jesus that will one day come to light. Maybe that's the Longinus thing you're looking for. I couldn't find anything else. Oh, except that he got a lot of flack for his position on Judas. The biblical scholars absolutely reamed him. He went silent about Judas after that and wrote about other things. As Remy showered and got dressed, she mulled over what her graduate student had found. Kimberly was right. That veiled reference to other Gospels was almost certainly a reference to the Gospel of Longinus. Jackson Neri had never made public hints like that. Is that what got him killed? No, probably not. Those publications came out more than fifteen years ago. She wouldn't be surprised if the Association of Devout Students had told him to keep silent, though. Professor Winkler had a reputation for enjoying a good academic scrap. Those biblical scholars denouncing him wouldn't have stopped him from continuing to publish on the subject. It appeared not all members of this shadowy organisation marched in lockstep. She went down to the breakfast room and found Daniel tucking away an enormous bowl of neon-coloured cereal. Revisiting your childhood? Remy asked. Couldn't believe it. Who would have thought that the breakfast buffet would have fruity pebbles? They do get a lot of American tourists, 
Remy quipped. Let me get a coffee and a croissant, and I'll join you. I'll come with, Daniel said, standing up and grabbing the bowl. I need a refill. You're going to kill yourself eating like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He said it so automatically, Remy got an image of his ex-wife and him having the same conversation countless times, with an equal lack of success on the wife's part. Hey, look, fruit, Remy said when they got to the breakfast buffet. A large bowl was filled with bananas, oranges and apples. That's not a food group, Daniel replied, heaping his bowl with more neon sugar bombs or whatever they were called. Winkler was a champion of reinserting the Gospel of Judas into the Bible, Remy said. Needless to say, this stance received some backlash. I can imagine, Daniel replied. It would get the religious scholars all angry, and even the secular ones probably wouldn't like that either. Academics aren't exactly big on innovative ideas. We're not all so narrow-minded, Remy sniffed. The FBI agent raised his eyebrows. Oh, so academia is accepting your cryptex research with open arms now. Point taken, she grumbled. Anyway, what I wanted to say is that Winkler was famous for enjoying debates, but he backed off and went silent on the issue after a short time. Maybe our friends in the association told him to shut up, Daniel suggested as they walked back to their table. That's what I'm thinking. Once they sat down, Daniel looked around and leaned closer to her. I got something for you if you can stomach it over breakfast. We're in a hurry, Daniel grinned. You're always in a hurry. You need to slow down and take stock of what's going on. Weird that I have to tell this to an academic. He pulled out his phone and brought up some pictures. There were close-ups of the removed flesh under what looked like infrared light. The flesh looked surreal, inhuman, a mottling of different shades of red and orange, with the capillaries and veins standing out garishly. But amid this ugly landscape was a faint series of dots and blotches in black. The first one clearly made a capital P, followed by a dot. Fascinating, Remy said, taking a bite from her croissant. I've created a monster, Daniel snickered. This was Gareth Jacks. The next is Father Nerry. This image showed so faintly that it could barely be read the letter O. The tattoo artist was more careful with this one, Daniel explained. The needle isn't supposed to go so deep into the dermis. Only the epidermis and the top level of the dermis. This is what the killer scraped off. He would have cut away any visible trace of the tattoo, but sometimes the needle gun penetrates deeper and leaves traces. These we couldn't see because of all the blood and because they're so faint. This is what the infrared picked up. And Professor Winkler? Remy asked. Daniel switched to the third photo. He had a tattoo of the letter W. Remy leaned back, her mind racing with possibilities. Daniel watched her in silence. He's not done, Remy stated. I can't think of any word in any language made up of just these three letters. Also, the period after the P must be significant. It's a capital P, so it isn't the end of a word. I think it's short for something. Porta, portum? That means port in Italian and Latin. Those are the two most likely languages for them to have used. I'm leading towards Latin. Palazzo. Palatium. That means palace in Italian and Latin. Porta. That's Latin for gate. Ponte. Pontis. Italian and Latin for bridge. And it's not an acronym because only one letter has a dot, Daniel said. What about the other letters? That's where it gets tricky. O could stand for any number of things and we don't even get a hint by it being shortened. The dot after the P hints at a location word, much like you abbreviate road or lane. The O is part of the name of whatever location the tattoos spell out, I think. Because then there's the W. That letter isn't used in Latin or Italian. Well, it's used in Italian for loan words like whiskey, but that's it. And it isn't used in Latin at all. Maybe the code is in a different language. I don't think so, because of the dot after the P. Many Italian place names use that, such as the Ponte Sisto here in Rome. That's often written as P. Sisto. The bridge we see today replaced a Roman bridge, the Pons Aurelius, that collapsed in the Middle Ages. In old text you often see it written P. Aurelius. So that W is probably one of the fake letters, Daniel suggested. Exactly. 
Let's take this information to Father Ambrogio, Remy said. He promised us an interview this morning, and now we can confront him with this evidence. He'll have to talk. Daniel could see Father Ambrogio did not exactly enjoy studying images of murder over his morning cappuccino. As they sat in the priest's office, the FBI agent took a not-so-guilty pleasure in showing him the photos of stripped flesh and their hidden messages, and watching him squirm with disgust. "'Professor Winkler was a member of the Association of Devout Students, wasn't he?' Daniel asked. "'Yes,' Father Ambrogio sighed. "'And when we told you portions of flesh had been cut off the victims, you knew the killer was going after the tattoos of letters, didn't you?' The priest seemed to sink in his chair. Yes, but you didn't tell us. It's an association secret. I don't give a damn about your secrets, Daniel shouted, slamming his fist on the man's desk. Father Ambrogio sat up straight, eyes wide, probably more shocked at his deliberate use of language than the show of force. What I care about is these three dead men, and the men who are going to die after them. Hell, the next one could be you. Father Ambrogio didn't meet his eye. I fail to see how these tattoos could possibly be relevant. Like hell. Now tell us what you know, or I'll get Sergeant Esposito here to arrest you for obstruction of justice and interfering with a police investigation. Sergeant Esposito looked like he wanted to do anything but. In fact, he looked like he wanted to sink through the chair and into the floor. What do these tattoos spell out, Father? Remy asked in a milder tone. A location, Father Ambrogio said with obvious reluctance. The location of the Gospel of Longinus, Daniel asked. The priest only nodded. Good, Daniel grumbled. Now we're getting somewhere. But you have hundreds, if not thousands, of members. So I'm guessing that most of those letters are duds, not part of the code, right? That's correct. Then how does the killer know who to target? Daniel asked. By their deeds ye shall know them, Father Ambrogio replied. I beg your pardon. Matthew 7.16, Remy replied. That's right, Father Ambrogio said, looking at her with a little more appreciation. Daniel stared. Remy smiled and shrugged. The benefits of a Catholic education. Daniel thought of an old joke about Catholic schoolgirls and decided not to tell it. Probably not the right time or place. Instead, he turned back to the priest. So the killer is figuring out who is researching what and targeting those people. But why would people with those particular tattoos be researching a particular topic? Do they know they have the right tattoo? No one knows if they have one of the blessed letters. And of course, there are fewer repetitions to ensure that the secret never dies if more than one member dies in any one day or if there is some disaster such as a war that kills several members in a short time. When one who bears a blessed letter dies, then that letter is given to the next new member, to ensure several remain in circulation at all times. So you don't know which letters are which? I am only the association's secretary, I told you. So who does know? I don't know. Your favourite phrase— who gives you the tattoos? I don't know. Christ on a motorcycle, you're impossible. Three of your members are dead and you won't even tell me who makes the tattoos? Because I don't know, I never saw him. Oh, come on. Father Ambrogio went on in a lecturing tone that irritated Daniel even more than he already was. When a new member is inducted, the secretary, or in my case, my predecessor, calls a number of a mobile phone here in Italy. The person on the other end of the phone is not the tattoo artist, but a devout student who acts as a go-between. He uses a temporary phone with only a few set minutes on it. No name is attached to the account. It's called a burner, Daniel grunted. Drug dealers use them. The flicker of annoyance passed over the priest's features, but that emotion did not make it to his voice which remained lecturing and a bit condescending. The man on the other end gives a time and a place for the tattoos, usually a private house or residence of one of the devout students, and the initiate must go there to get tattooed. The go-between then gives the secretary the number of a new, what do you call it, burner phone, and destroys the old one. 
These guys are paranoid, Daniel thought. I wonder how many other times they've been bumped off one by one. The priest went on. The initiate goes to the designated place. Anyone there leaves, the initiate puts on a blindfold and is then given the tattoo. No one, including myself, gets to see the tattoo artist. No one ever sneaked a peek? I suspect he wears a mask as extra precaution. I suspect you're right. So who is the go-between? I don't know. Daniel groaned and rubbed his temples. You're giving me a headache, father. I apologize. That sure sounded convincing. How about you call this go-between and set up a meeting with a tattoo artist? He has been given strict instructions not to summon the tattoo artist unless it's for a new initiate. Then tell him I'm an initiate. I'll even get the tattoo if it means I don't have to talk to you again. He would know you aren't an initiate. Daniel groaned and looked at the ceiling. I'm sure you can find a way for us to get in touch, Father, Remy said. I'm afraid I can't. We have cast iron security. It is the only thing that has ensured the survival of the Association in the face of two thousand years of persecution. Remy looked sorrowfully at Daniel. So we're at another dead end? Yeah, Daniel growled. A dead end made by the victims themselves. Chapter 19 Remy left the meeting with Father Ambrogio, feeling as frustrated as Daniel appeared to be. They had gotten few real answers and a lot more questions. FBI work was much like historical research that way, except with historical research you don't generally end up with a pile of dead bodies. They stood on the sidewalk outside the church, hesitating since they weren't sure what to do next. I need to go back to that library, Remy said. Now that we know the tattoos point to the location of the book, I know better what to look for. I'm going to look for books on the organisation itself. Having survived for so many centuries, some member must have written up a history of it. Probably several histories. Perhaps they'll give some indication. You got attacked in that library, Daniel objected. Remy suppressed a shudder. Yes, she had been attacked. She tried to exude calm as she replied. Yes, but that was late at night when we were alone. I don't think he would try something with other people there. Hopefully. You do not know this, Sergeant Esposito said. I'm with Esposito here, Daniel said. It's too risky. I might be able to find clues as to what those letters mean. The way they have security all locked up? I doubt it. It's a chance. At the very least I can learn more about the association. That will prove a big help. Daniel shook his head. No, come down to the station with us. We're going to go through phone records. There must be a way this guy knows what the victims were studying. Something they had in common that showed they had the correct letter. I don't know what that is, and until we do, we're not going to be able to unravel this. You don't need to be at the station to do that, Remy said. Just link in via your laptop. The sergeant can direct the efforts from the station and send you files or whatever you need to look through. Instead, you can work from a cafe I saw just down the street from the Association's library. I let myself into the library, then give you the key. The code for the keypad is 312. If I feel unsafe, I'll speed dial you and you can come running. Why should I sit in a cafe? I'll sit right by you in the library. Laptops aren't allowed in the library. Daniel raised his hands in frustration. Like I care. You'll stand out. The other readers will suspect you're not a member and will get thrown out. I'll be all right there by myself. I'll sit next to some of the others and keep my phone ready at all times. Daniel looked at her, the concern plain on his face. He also looked half convinced, because they both knew it was the best course of action. What if I don't get there in time? Daniel objected. If that cafe you mentioned is a couple of doors down, it'll take at least a minute to get to you, perhaps more. A lot can happen in a minute. Remy smiled and held up her bottle of pepper spray. Oh, God, not that thing again, Daniel groaned. If you really want to stop me using it, have the FBI issue me with a gun. Not going to happen. You're not a full agent. I could be. I could accept Ochi's offer. Is that what I want? 
No time to think about that now. Think about it once you've caught the killer. But it keeps popping up in my head. So will we go forward with this? Remy asked. Daniel let out an exasperated sigh, looked to Sergeant Esposito, who gave a it's-your-civilian-adviser shrug, and turned back to Remy. All right, but if you see anything unusual, and I do mean anything, call me immediately, all right? Yes. No, I'm not going to take one of your simple yeses. Promise it like you mean it. Remy put a hand on his shoulder and looked him in the eye. I promise. I know I'm too impulsive and don't have the experience to realise just how much danger I'm in. I'm sorry for scaring you on so many occasions. I promise I'll call the moment anything makes me feel uncomfortable. All right, Daniel said with obvious reluctance. Just remember that when the time comes, OK? I will. I hope so, for both our sakes. The last convert couldn't believe his luck. The next target had walked right into his trap. Yes, it was daylight. Yes, they were in a library. Yes, there were people around. But this victim was usually with other people. Now and only now did he have the opportunity to strike. The last convert checked his pockets. The garrote was coiled and ready in his left pocket, and the straight razor in his right. While he ached from a slight tear to his old hernia operation after the last killing, he was able to move and walk he could still find the prize. But he had miscalculated last time. Although Professor Winkler had all the appearance of being the bearer of a blessed letter, he bore only a W, a letter that was obviously incorrect. What bad luck! The devil must have put that snare in his path. It didn't matter, he was sure he had the right one now. The last convert moved quietly through the stacks, stalking his prey with as much care as a big game hunter stalking a lion. A lion? Pah! more like a little rabbit. No, a sheep. That's what these people were. Still, it paid to be careful. After three murders, the police were certainly on his trail, and while he had taken care not to leave any evidence, he knew that it was impossible to make a crime scene entirely clean. And with all these people in the library, this killing was going to be tricky. He stood near the end of one of the stacks, pretending to look at a book while sneaking peeks at the target, who sat reading at a nearby desk. Professor Antony Serres of the University of Seged and Hungary sat not five metres away, his broad-shouldered frame hunched over a book. A younger man, who looked like a graduate student, sat two desks away. A female student passed by. They were in the library of Rome's pontifical Silesian University, a modern place that didn't have the rare book collections that normally attracted members of the Association of Devout Students. That made the last convert curious. Surely Professor Serres could have found what he needed in a more ancient seat of higher learning. Summoning his courage, the last convert dared to walk closer to the middle-aged professor, passing right behind him. He needn't have worried. Professor Serres was deeply absorbed in reading. A glance told the last convert what he needed to know. The Hungarian history professor was reading the university's theological journal, started in the early 1950s. None of the early issues were online. There must be something he was looking for in particular. Had some members of the association helped found this university right after World War II? The last convert didn't know. It was possible. He'd have to take a look through those back issues himself. Later. Professor Serres had just stood up. The last convert ducked into an aisle and plucked a book off the shelf. The professor walked by. Curious, the man who intended to kill him followed at a distance. Oh, perfect. He was heading to the bathroom. The professor entered. The last convert gave a quick glance around, saw no one looking, and went through the door after him. The bathroom was small, just three urinals and a couple of stalls. Thankfully, both stall doors were open, and no one stood at the urinals except Professor Serres, who was just unzipping his pants. The Hungarian didn't even look at him as he entered. With a practice movement, the last convert pretended to walk past, pulled the garrote from his pocket, grasped both ends, and put it around Ceres's neck. The Hungarian let out a strangled cry, a stream of urine arcing up to splash against the wall. The last convert hauled him into a stall, sneering with distaste, as some of that piss sprayed on his trouser leg, and slammed the stall door shut. The last convert cursed as he felt the urine soak through his pants. The professor must have had too much coffee. 
Even worse, he kept thumping his fist against the stall door in a desperate attempt to summon help. Time to end this. Leaning against the stall door to both brace himself and to keep anyone from entering, the last convert jabbed a knee into the man's back and pulled the grot tighter. He winced as pain lanced through his abdomen. The tear he had made in his hernia suture widened. He gritted his teeth and kept strangling the life out of Professor Ceres. His head swam with pain, and he felt almost as dizzy as his victim must have. But he kept a firm grip. Nothing could stop him now. Even his own life wasn't important. The only thing that mattered was getting the book. The thumping on the stall stopped. Professor Ceres flailed weakly, then slowly stopped moving. A final twitch, and it was all over. The last convert held him in position for another minute, then sat him on the seat. Now to get that tattoo. Just as he pulled out the straight razor, he heard the bathroom door open. He turned round, backed up to the toilet, and pulled up the professor's legs, so it looked like there was only one person in the stall. That couldn't hide the urine sprayed all over the bathroom wall, and running in a line to the stall, though. The last convert heard an uttered curse outside. "'Couldn't hold it, could you?' a young man shouted in Italian. The student, muttering, stormed out of the bathroom. The last convert needed to hurry. The kid was probably only going to the bathroom upstairs. But what if he complained to a librarian? Putting down the professor's legs, he tore at the man's shirt. Ah, finally, a bit of good luck with the bad. He had a tattoo of an S on his left side just under his arm, followed by a dot. The last convert tucked his victim's legs up so they didn't show below the stall wall. The effort made the ache in his abdomen jab with pain once more. Hissing through clenched teeth, he tried to ignore it as he got to work. His cut was shaky, but he managed to remove the flesh. He put it in a small jar he carried for that purpose, cleaned off his razor and pants with some toilet paper, and left the stall, closing the door behind him. What a mess! Anyone coming in here would see the puddle on the floor just like that student had, and anyone would see the damp stain on the lower part of his trouser leg too. This had been sloppy, very sloppy. But now he had the right letter, he was sure of it. Now, with just a little more study, he would know where to go. He ducked out of the bathroom, limping a little from the pain of his hernia. No sign of that angry student. Good. He moved along through the aisles. A female student passed him, glanced down at his trousers and blushed. As he turned a corner to the next aisle, he could hear a giggle behind him. This was bad. He stood out people would remember him. He got to the back staircase, less used than the main one, and hurried down as quickly as his limping gait could manage, each step giving him pain. Now for the hard part. He had to walk across the length of the ground floor and then past an open area where the checkout desk stood. He walked quickly, jerkily, knowing his limping walk and the wet pants must be making people see him. He kept his hand to his face, pretending to scratch while obscuring his features as much as he could, so many witnesses. He told himself it didn't matter. He had the last letter, and with it he could go to his hiding place where no police officer would find him, and study in peace. A library hardly anyone knew of, hidden from the internet and all other public view. And then, once he had broken the code, he would go retrieve the book. There would be a guardian, of course, perhaps several guardians, no book of such importance would simply sit in a hiding place unwatched. He would kill anyone who guarded it, anyone who stood in his way. And once he had the book, he would reveal it to the world, and everything would change. Chapter 20 Remy had been in the library for a couple of hours now, and still hadn't found even the hint of a clue as to the significance of the tattoos. Perhaps Danny was right. Perhaps that's the one topic they didn't include in this library. It didn't help her concentration that she kept looking around her, searching for that burly priest who had chased her the previous night. The man at the next desk had looked at her curiously more than once. Remy sat in the middle of the rotunda on the ground floor, the most visible and busiest spot in the library. The Greek Orthodox priest was here again, absent-mindedly stroking his long black beard while studying a manuscript written in old church Slavonic. Not far off was a wizened old stick of a man, his bald head mottled with age spots, bent low over a Latin text as he squinted at it with a myopic gaze. 
On her desk lay a stack of books taken from the shelf marked History and Rules of the Association. She had been rummaging through them, learning all sorts of hidden church history that may or may not have been true, but she had found absolutely nothing that gave her any insight into the tattoos. She had learned just how international the group was. In a book published in Rome in early 1918, the author bemoaned the fact that, with Italy at war on the side of the Allies, he could not correspond with fellow devout students just over the Alps, in the Austro-Hungarian Empire. He wrote how, Before this terrible conflict, I would enjoy countless hours of enlightening conversation with learned men in the gardens of the Association's many residences in Rome's suburbs, as generations of devout students were wont to do. In the most modern text, one printed in Rome in the year 2019, and titled Updated Rules of the Association of Devout Students, she found some insight into the group's thoughts on technology. The Internet age has given us a great deal of opportunities and a great deal of danger. It is possible now to read many of the rarest holy texts online. We urge students not to give in to this temptation. Our enemies are availing themselves of this technology to track our movements and see what we study. If we give them enough evidence, they will guess at the great secret and try to stop our work. Far better to spend a few hours of discomfort on an international flight to study in one of the great libraries, for there you can learn without being watched, and the Lord God might grace you with the friendship of another devout student who can aid in your studies. Also beware of mobile telephones, for they too are easily tracked. Avoid their use except for the most mundane of purposes, or in the day-to-day -day affairs of your church or monastery. Own a mobile phone, for to not own one attracts notice and suspicion, but do not use it for anything involving the great work. Remy looked around her. These people really were paranoid. But were they paranoid for a reason? At the moment that certainly seemed so, and yet all their precautions hadn't stopped three of them from being stalked and killed. Perhaps it's someone inside the organisation, Remy thought. Daniel had suggested that earlier. Daniel. In case of danger, he was just a screen tap away. That made her feel better. He sat just two doors down in a cafe, working on his laptop and no doubt stuffing his face with Italian sweets. That made her smile. Seeing as she wasn't getting anywhere with these books, she decided to go check on the third floor, a floor she hadn't yet explored. On this trip, she had made a beeline to the shelf she had looked at before, and hurried back to the ground floor where there were the most people. Perhaps the upper floor had a section with something more useful. She kept her phone in her hand as she walked to the back of the library and ascended the rattling metal stairs. Someone should really fix these, she thought as she tried and failed to reduce the noise she was making. The entire library can hear me. She got to the second floor, walked a few metres to the next set of stairs leading up and ascended. These stairs at least were bolted properly to the floor and wall, and didn't sound like they were being shaken by an earthquake. It only made a dull resonant ring at each of her footsteps. At the top she stopped and looked around. She could see several signs at the ends of the nearest aisles for subjects such as Biblical Linguistics, Monastic Orders, Late Paganism, and Vatican II. Unsure where to go, she moved over to the aisle for Late Paganism. That at least was the right era a time when the Bible was being collated and books like the Gospel of Longinus and the Gospel of Judas were being rejected for inclusion. She might be able to find some clues here. But where? The long aisle, running from close to the banister overlooking the rotunda, to within a few feet of the outer wall, must have contained several hundred volumes. She began to walk slowly down the aisle, looking for the oldest-looking ones. Since the books were arranged alphabetically by author, there was a cluster of them closer to the far wall under Anonymous. Early writers often did not sign their work, either from a fear of religious authorities, a pious humility that held that their own mortal name was of no importance, or simply because the book was not the original copy and the author's name had been lost over the centuries. She looked at the various documents, several dated back to the medieval period, old volumes of vellum and a couple of brittle parchment kept in protective binders. It was surprising these would be on a regular shelf and not some case, but she had noticed the entire building was temperature and humidity controlled, 
and the ventilation system screened against insects, and only a few people ever got to go in here. Most researchers weren't even aware of the library's existence. With care, Remy pulled a couple of the books off the shelf at random and checked their languages. Both were in early medieval Latin. Good, she could read those. Despite her broad linguistic education, there were a lot of books in this library she couldn't read. Testament to the Association's international nature. In all her research trips around the world, she had never seen a library like this before. It gave her a thrill of excitement to be here. She rounded the corner, holding the books in one hand and her phone in the other, and stopped cold. The burly priest from the night before sat at a desk with a pile of books, not five steps from her. Remy must have made a little sound, because the priest looked up, eyes widening in surprise. For a second both remained as frozen as a picture, staring at one another. Then the priest sprang to his feet. Remy hit the speed dial on her phone and bolted. She made it all the way to the stairs before a strong hand grabbed her by the shoulder and spun her around. Remy let out a scream and the precious books she carried fell from her grasp. Then the priest did something unexpected. He let out a cry, released Remy and grabbed the books, fumbling with them for a moment and giving Remy a chance to hurtle down the stairs. She burst onto the landing of the second floor as a man in the robes of a Franciscan monk stepped out from one of the aisles. "'What's wrong?' he asked in Italian. "'I'm being attacked!' she shouted, not slowing down as she ran for the next spiral staircase. Just as she made it, she heard the hammering steps of the priest rushing down the upper staircase, and the thud of a body on body as the bigger man pushed the monk aside. At that moment she realised that none of the people here were going to save her. Not the Greek Orthodox patriarch with the belly and the soft hands, not the living mummy sitting at the desk opposite hers, not the skinny little priest she had seen pass by earlier. The man who pursued her was twice the size of any of them. Was he even a priest? The staircase shook dangerously as he got on it behind her. The bolts squealed and rattled as both their weights strained the weakened metal to its utmost. Remy turned around and saw he was almost upon her. She yanked the pepper spray out of her pocket, and gave a long burst up the narrow stairwell. The priest stumbled back up a couple of steps, coughing and bringing his hands to his face. It didn't look like he'd be stopped for long, in fact he looked pretty angry. Giving the priest another long dose, the air filling with red haze, Remy turned and leapt the final few steps to gain some distance from her pursuer, landing hard on the marble floor and stumbling. She steadied herself and made a beeline for the front door, the patriarch and the old man staring at her dumbfounded. The staircase made a final rattle, then a vibrating hum as the man at her heels got off it. A cloud of noxious gas wasn't about to stop him. Help! Remy cried. The front door seemed miles away, and Remy knew as she ran for it that she'd never get there in time. Chapter 21 It turned out she didn't have to. The door burst open and Daniel rushed through, his gun levelled. Freeze! Remy didn't bother to see if the giant priest chasing her had listened. She kept on running until she got to the doorway and behind Daniel. Only then did she stop and turn, panting, terrified, ready to run again. The priest, along with the other two men in view, all had their hands up. "'I don't know who was chasing my partner, but I'm guessing it was you,' Daniel said, stalking forward until he had his gun pointing between the big priest's eyes. Remy noticed that Daniel stopped just out of the man's reach. She'd have to remember that. Daniel taught her so much without his even being aware. The priest looked tense, wary, angry. His face and eyes were red from the pepper spray, but he didn't look subdued in the least. His hands were balled into meaty fists, and his legs were set somewhat apart, ready to spring. "'I didn't hurt her,' the priest growled. "'Not for lack of trying,' Remy replied. She looked up, several heads poked over the banisters of the upper two floors, two circles of staring faces. She'd never be able to sneak into this library again. A pity. A good, long dive into the works stored here could send her research off in incredible new directions. You're thinking about research, while still out of breath from being chased by a killer? Daniel is right. You are an incurable academic. Daniel ordered the priest to get face down on the floor. As the other scholars continued to stare, he cuffed him. Let's question him down at the station, Remy said. Spoken like a true FBI agent, Daniel said with a grin, making Remy smile in turn. 
but first I need to go back to the cafe and make sure no one stole my laptop. It was becoming an all-too-familiar scene to Remy, the handcuffed priest sitting in an Italian police station glaring at them. Remy and Daniel sat opposite him, while Sergeant Esposito had gone to get the priest a cup of coffee. The devout Catholic was obviously flustered by having yet another man of the cloth in the interrogation room. So far that man of the cloth hadn't said a word. They didn't even know his name. He had no identification on him. Daniel stood, walking slowly around to get behind the priest. The man followed him with his eyes, and then turned his head when Daniel got behind him. He did not look intimidated, only wary. Now that our Italian cop friend is gone, let's have a little chat, American style, he said, his voice laden with menace. I didn't hurt her, the priest exclaimed, his voice tinged with a tiny bit of fear. Remy realised that his stony features were a false front. While bigger than Daniel, handcuffed as he was to a metal chair, he was helpless. This was a man who, due to his size and position, was never in the position of being helpless. He didn't know how to deal with it. For a long moment, Daniel simply stood there, silent. Why did you attack her? Daniel snapped. Remy jumped a little. She's going to destroy everything, the priest bellowed. Daniel took a step back, cocking his head and looking down at the suspect. What the hell do you mean by that? You're looking for the book, aren't you? the priest said. We're looking for a murderer, Daniel told him, and I think we have him. Remy wasn't so sure about that, and she knew Daniel wasn't either, but accusing him of murder might be a good way to scare him into talking. You have the wrong man. I'm hunting him too to stop him from getting what he wants. That sinner is killing in order to find the clues to get to the book. If he finds it, all is lost. Who is he? Daniel asked. I don't know. If I did, I would have sent him to hell by now. Did a priest just boast that he wanted to kill someone? Remy felt a chill. This was not the church she had been raised in. I bet you would have, Daniel said. Why are you on his trail? Just as I told you, if he gets the book, he will reveal it to the world. It will cause dissent and confusion. The church will collapse, along with two thousand years of moral teachings. Civilization is already fragile enough with the devil on the ascendant. Such a revelation will tip us over the edge. Remy leaned forward, intrigued. What do you know about the Gospel of Longinus? The priest got a guarded look. It's better if you don't know. The main thing is to stop him before he finds it. Remy's brow furrowed. Wait, you're in the Association of Devout Students. Your entire organization is devoted to this lost gospel. Why do you think it's evil? The priest studied her for a moment. He took a deep breath and spoke. I snuck into the library just like you. I have connections that told me the library's location and the key code. It took years to uncover that information. You are quite resourceful to find them so quickly. That's why I'm asking you, no, begging you, to not let the killer reveal that despicable text. Remy sat back. This whole affair was getting more and more complicated. What had they stepped into here? Daniel leaned forward. We're more concerned with catching a murderer, unless we already caught him. What can you say to defend yourself? Ask the Holy See. They will tell you I am part of the papal police force, charged with stopping this madness. Oh dear, no priest would dare to say he was in the Vatican police if he wasn't. We really have gotten in over our heads. If Daniel felt as shocked as she did, he didn't show it. He merely snorted. Yeah, sure. If you're a cop, why did you attack my partner? Because I thought she was the killer. I knew she wasn't in the Association of Devout Students. We had thought it was a member doing the killing, but when I saw she had sneaked into the library, I thought we had gotten it all wrong. I assumed she had not been able to get inducted into the organization and decided to get the book through violence. Only when you identified yourself as FBI did I realize my mistake. How did you know I wasn't in the association? Remy asked. We have our ways. And why do you think it's an inside job? Daniel asked. Evidence we have gathered. Daniel put his hands on his hips and looked at Remy. 
I'm getting pretty tired of priests not answering our questions. The door to the interrogation room flew open and Sergeant Esposito rushed in. This is not the man we're looking for. Remy spun around to look at him. And how do you know that? Because there's just been another murder in a library on the other side of the city. The body is still warm. Daniel looked at the sad scene in the bathroom and reconstructed what had happened. He saw the almost dry splash of urine on the wall and the trail into the stall. The killer had gotten this poor guy while he was standing at the urinal. What a humiliating way to go. There was more blood at this scene, smeared on the body as well as some drops on the floor. That was what had alerted someone who had come in to use the bathroom. The victim lay slumped on the toilet, his shirt ripped open, and a rectangle of flesh cut away on his side. We'll get the CSI team to use him for a red on the wound, Daniel told a very pale Remy Laurent. We'll get you that piece of the puzzle. Remy nodded. I'm thinking it might be the final piece. I can't be sure, but once I have it, I'll know. At least I hope I will. That gets us the book, maybe. What we need is the murderer. They stepped out of the bathroom as the homicide unit got to work. Some things that the priest who chased me said made me think twice. He suspected me because he knew I wasn't in the Association of Devout Students. That must mean the Vatican's investigation uncovered the fact that the killer isn't a member. Good luck getting him to confirm that. Sergeant Esposito told me that a car with Vatican markings came and picked him up, and a cardinal, a cardinal, gave the precinct commander a good talking to. Remy's jaw dropped. My gosh. Yeah, we're stepping on some pretty big toes here. One of the white-suited CSI team members came out, an older woman with permanent worry lines that Daniel had seen in so many police officers. He wondered if he would get them too. Probably. The investigator held up a camera. I've taken the infrared photo you asked, she said in English. The cut was messy, but you can still read the tattoo you said would be there. Remy and Daniel looked at the screen. Part of an S was visible, along with a dot. Another abbreviation, Daniel said. Maybe it really does spell out an acronym, and the O we found was a false lead. Maybe, Remy murmured. I think we need to talk with Father Ambrogio again. I like your idea of a rejected member. He seems to know all the members, so I bet he'll know those who were rejected. Assuming he'll tell us. You call him, Daniel said, dialing the priest's number, putting it on speaker, and handing her the phone. I can't stand the guy. I wonder if he'll answer, she said, taking it. I told him that he had to if he didn't want to be brought into the station. Remy smiled. Don't tell Sergeant Esposito that. He must think he's going to hell at this point. The phone rang and rang. Remy began to look worried. What if Father Ambrogia was the next target? What if the killer had already gotten to him? Whoever it was knew enough about the association that he surely knew about the Church of St. Lazarus and its library tucked away in back. Hello. Daniel let out a gust of relief to hear Father Ambrogio's gruff voice come over the line. Is everything all right? she asked. Who is this? Professor Laurent. Yes, everything is all right. I was busy. That final statement carried a very noticeable hint. Remy ignored it. I have a question for you, Father. I suppose you do, he said with a note of impatience. Do you know of any members of the association who have left recently, or been kicked out? No, membership is for life, and we vet our candidates very carefully. We've never had to kick someone out, at least not for several decades. We had a member die recently, but never have we had anyone who wanted to leave. What about people who have attempted to join the association but got rejected? Oh yes, that happens sometimes. Wait a moment. Justin Ziegler. Who? Justin Ziegler. He runs a business selling antiques, many of doubtful provenance. His speciality is medieval church artifacts, church plates, codices, even saints' relics. When he applied to join us, he seemed eager enough and certainly knowledgeable. But when we looked into his background, we realized he was just a treasure-seeker, out to take what he could for himself. 
Remy gripped the phone tighter. Why didn't you tell us about him before? she asked. Because we have been monitoring his movements, and he left the country a month ago. Now we're not so sure he did. Daniel rolled his eyes. You still could have told us, she said, sounding as exasperated as Daniel felt. What do you know about him? Justin Ziegler is an American citizen from Chicago. His company is Ziegler Christian Collectibles. He is about forty years old, I believe. He is athletic, blond hair that's receding a little, blue eyes. He stands about one meter ninety. Tell your American friend that's a little over six feet. Ziegler was in Italy a month ago. He stayed for about three weeks. We know he had a flight to return to Chicago and that he checked out of his hotel that morning. Our agents did not actually see him get on the plane, however. We are not the Vatican. We do not have a professional police force. You do have people you send out as spies, though, Daniel thought. That's interesting and telling. Why were you monitoring him? And what did he do while he was here? We suspect him of numerous thefts of rare books. He calls himself a researcher. He is enrolled as a graduate student at the University of Chicago, but I doubt he ever goes to classes or works on a thesis. He's been a student for years. It's only to have the ID so he can gain access to academic and church libraries. Daniel moved over to the nearest desk, where his laptop was. Remy followed him so he could continue listening to the conversation. Has he been caught at any theft? No, but works have gone missing from important libraries around the time he visited them, and we've found more than one getting sold afterwards. Daniel nodded. This was a common thing. While books were always stamped in several places with a library's seal, removing such stamps was a simple matter. He started a search on Justin Ziegler. Father Ambrogio went on. While he can't get into the library at the Church of St. Lazarus, we suspect he's researching in other libraries trying to find out as much as he can about the Gospel of Longinus and our organization, much as our own researchers follow the path of history and theology to prepare themselves to read the great work. Daniel felt a sense of smug relief that Father Ambrogio didn't mention the real library for the association. That showed he wasn't aware of her using it, despite the little scene they had made with that officer from the Vatican earlier that day. He hoped it stayed that way, but suspected the news would get to him sooner rather than later. The poor little professor would be heartbroken when that library got closed to her forever. "'Where did he go while he was here?' Remy asked. "'He was in Italy for three weeks. He spent most of his time in Rome, with side trips to Milan and Pavia.' Rome and Milan, two of the places where people were murdered. Did he go to Ravenna? Not that we know. As I said, our monitoring is not perfect. We don't have anyone dedicated to this job full time, and once his flight departed, we stopped looking for him. We don't have anyone in Chicago to check he actually landed there. Daniel scanned the articles he had found on the thief. Oh, this was good. Are you following anyone else? Remy asked. Pause. None that could possibly be connected to this case. Father Ambrogio, your members are being killed one by one in the most horrible fashion. I assure you, if we were following anyone that I thought might be culpable, I'd tell you. I did not wish to reveal the existence of our monitoring program, and only did so because I think Ziegler might still be in the country. All right, Father. Remy said, unconvinced. Call me if you find out anything more, or if you think of anything that might help. I will, I promise. Father Ambrogio hung up. I'm not sure that promise is worth too much, she grumbled. Remy turned to Daniel. Find out anything? In the past two minutes? No, but there's some juicy stuff here, Daniel replied without taking his eyes off the screen or slowing down his typing. I'll have the results soon. In the meantime, you think about those tattoos. Chapter 22 P. Dot S. Dot o What could they mean? Remy sat by Daniel in the police station, not seeing her partner or hearing the general bustle of the officers all around them. 
The ringing of phones didn't register in her mind, and even the shouts of a man being hauled in on a drunk and disorderly charge only broke her concentration for a moment. The full strength of her prodigious mental faculties were focused on the problem of three little letters and two dots, and what they meant to a murderer. But the more she thought, the more confused she became. She had not expected there to be a second letter with an abbreviation. The dot after the P made sense, because it was a common abbreviation for place names. She expected every other letter to be a part of the name of the bridge or port or palace. But that damn S was an abbreviation too. And that made her wonder about the O. The tattoo artist had been careful, and his or her needle gun did not jab too deep. That's what the CSI people said. Remy remembered how faint it was. Could the dot, so small on both the other tattoos, have simply been lost when the flesh was cut away? It was certainly possible. Parts of all the letters they had seen were unclear in spots. It wasn't hard to imagine the dot not making it to the lower dermis at all. So, perhaps she was dealing with an acronym. P.S.O. or O.P.S. S.O.P. The combinations went on and on. Even worse, she didn't even know if she had all the letters. And Father Ombrogio certainly wasn't going to be any help. Protecting his association's secrecy seemed more important to him than the safety of its members. She'd consider him the number one suspect if it hadn't been proven he was far from the scene of at least two of the crimes. But it still could be a member of the association itself, or this art smuggler who seemed to have gotten so close. People like that had ways of getting information. They were diligent researchers, as educated as any museum curator, but as crafty as any criminal, as charismatic as any conman. Ziegler would have ways to ferret out information. Perhaps he even managed to pose as a devout student and trick the real members into giving up information. Daniel's voice broke her out of a reverie. Justin Ziegler has quite the history, he said, still staring at his laptop. He's been listed as a suspect in several art thefts, but has never been brought to trial. Lack of evidence. But where there's smoke, there's fire. No innocent person gets accused of so many crimes over such a long time unless they're actually guilty. Aren't people innocent until proven guilty? No, they're guilty until proven guilty. This guy's just slippery, that's all. We need to make sure he doesn't slip away from us, too. Oh, and I've found out even more. He didn't board that flight back to Chicago, and his name is registered at a hotel in some place called Tuscolano. Remy stood. That's the suburb of Rome. Let's go there. Daniel held up a calming hand. Sergeant Esposito is already on it. He sent a local squad car to check it out. Already? You've been communing with the spirit of Elvis for the past hour. Elvis? or Budder, or George Harrison, or whoever it is you talk to when you draw into yourself. I talk to myself. More like mumble. In French, mostly. Or Latin. When you mumble in Latin, you sound like you're possessed. Sometimes you hum songs. Elvis songs? Remy said, blushing. I don't think so. It's so out of tune, it's hard to tell. Could we get back to the case, please? Right. Anyway, the cops checked the hotel, and he hasn't been seen for two days. He paid up for the first night in advance, but skipped the bill for the next night he stayed there. Then he left. Also emptied the room's minibar. All those miniature bottles they put in your little refrigerator to tempt you. They always overcharge. Serves them right. I'm glad they got robbed. I wonder where he could be. He hasn't registered anywhere else. The Italian Department of the Interior keeps a database on that. So he's not in another hotel, at least not under his own name. But here's the pièce de résistance. Did I pronounce that right? More or less. Cool. Anyway, I had the brilliant idea of checking hospital records. I figure he might have gotten injured or something, and that's why he wasn't in the hotel. You'll never guess what I did find. What? He's in the visitor's log for the Milan morgue. Remy's jaw dropped. The morgue where the Jesuit Antonio Neri is resting. Resting? More like decomposing. That's disrespectful. No, it's realistic. Ziegler claimed to be a relative of Neri's, an American cousin. Fast talked the mortician into letting him see the body. There were no other tattoos on any of the victims. No, there were not. 
but perhaps he thought there were. The code so far seems incomplete. Maybe he thought he had been tricked, and that there was a second tattoo hidden on another part of the body. If he thought there was only one, he wouldn't have spent the time at a murder scene looking for more. Or maybe he's looking for something else on the corpse. It's a bold move to show up at the morgue to look at your victim's body. How did he even know it was there? Remy asked. Esposito tells me it was on the news. Was Gareth Jack's murder on the news? No, it wasn't. Then we should check out the morgue in the Ravenna in case he goes to visit Professor Winkler. I already have the cops monitoring that. I don't think we have to worry about Professor Ceres. It's too soon for that to get reported. And I've told the cops about holding off on the press release. Oh, wait. Daniel tapped away at the laptop for a moment. Oh, crap, he muttered. What? I just googled Gareth Jacks for mentions in the past week. With a name like that, it's easy to follow. I was once researching a suspect named Paul Newman. Different Paul Newman, of course. Pain in the ass. Jax is easy, though. Turns out several online forums have been talking about his death, and something called the International Society for the Study of Medievalism has posted an obituary on his website. I know that society. I'm a member. Daniel stood. Of course you are. We need to get to the morgue in Rome. Is there more than one? Sergeant Esposito tells me there's the central one and a couple in some of the rougher suburbs where the murder rate gives them steady business. Jax wouldn't have been in those areas, so Ziegler would be checking the main one. Let's go, Remy said, already rushing out the door. Remy was relieved to see Sergeant Esposito and another man waiting for them at the front of the hospital. She'd had enough of facing suspects alone. Both Italians wore civilian clothes. As Remy and Daniel got out of their rental car, they came up to them. Hello, my friends, Sergeant Esposito said. This is Officer Brambilla. He speaks a little English, which is why I pick him. Hello, Officer Brambilla said. No other words were forthcoming, making Remy wonder about the extent of his English. It didn't matter. He didn't need English to chase down a murderer. How many exits are there to this place? Daniel asked. It was a large, sprawling facility with two large extensions. Too many, Sergeant Esposito said. But there are only two staircases and one elevator down to the basement where the morgue is kept. Officer Brambilla will watch the service stairs while a member of the hospital security will watch the elevator. A criminal rarely uses the elevator since he traps him. True enough, buddy, Daniel said. You get a walkie-talkie from hospital security so we can keep in contact with that guy. I get three. One for me, one for Officer Brambilla, and one for yourself. We will go time together to the morgue and, as you Americans say, see what what's. What's what? Daniel corrected. That's what I say. Whatever. Let's go. They headed for the main entrance, passing nervous-looking visitors, and a man in scrubs taking a cigarette break by the door. That's bad advertising, Daniel said, then handed the walkie-talkie to Remy. Here, take this. The security people don't speak English. Plus, it'll keep your hands full so you don't pepper-spray any more priests. Santa Maria Madre di Dio, Sergeant Esposito said, crossing himself. Please do not do this again. A member of security met them at the front entrance, speaking to the two plainclothes officers in Italian. No one named Justin Ziegler has signed in to the front desk, and no one under any name as asked to see the morgue except an odd woman who had to identify her husband dead of a heart attack. All right, Sergeant Esposito said. Let's get into position. We will wait for our friend in the morgue. If he signs in, let him pass down to the morgue. That way he'll be trapped. The security guard nodded and left. So did Officer Brambilla, who moved off down a long hallway to cover the service stairs. The rest of them passed through the hospital, through a busy crowd of staff, visitors and patients and went down a flight of stairs to the basement. Dr. Giuliani, the same coroner they'd met before, had been alerted and waited for them in a grim little sitting-room, where mourners waited to identify their dead. Thankfully, no one was in there at the moment. "'So what is this about a suspect coming to see a body?' the coroner asked. She looked a bit pale. "'Yes, an art dealer named Justin Ziegler,' Daniel said. "'He's already visited one murder victim.' and we want to see what he's looking for. 
So when he comes, just act natural and let him see the corpse. Check out what he's looking for. But what if he attacks? He won't, Remy said. His murders are focused. As long as you don't interfere, he'll only want to look at the corpse and be gone. Dr. Giuliani did not look reassured. He might not come at all, Daniel said. And we'll be right out here the whole time. All right, Dr. Giuliani said in a quiet voice. She went back into the morgue. Now what? Remy asked. Now we sit around waiting for something to happen, Daniel said. This is the main thing officers of the law do. It's not all running around pepper-spraying priests. Please stop talking about this, Sergeant Esposito moaned. Sorry, Remy said. I go get the coffee, the sergeant said. You people are tiring. Do you wish one? The mention of coffee made Remy yawn. Yes, I think I do. Get me a Coke, Daniel said. They don't seem to have Mountain Dew in this country. The sergeant left. Remy settled in, and her mind immediately went back to the problem of the tattoos. Something needled at the back of her mind, something someone had said, or perhaps something she had read recently. But what? It wouldn't come to her. So she left that aside, knowing it would arise of its own accord eventually. The worst thing to do with something that's stuck on the tip of your tongue is to try and force it into a conscious thought. Instead, she went through the possibilities. If it was an acronym, if there was a period behind the O that had been obscured when the skin was removed, then most likely the code was complete. Three-letter acronyms were more common than four-letter ones. Plus, longer acronyms were usually turned into words like NASA and SCUBA. So what could it be? The name of a university or other academic institution? She skimmed through her phone, looking at universities in Rome, then all around Italy, and came up with no matches. Next she looked at religious institutions, but came up with nothing there either. They were usually named after saints and not turned into acronyms. So what could it be? She put down her phone in frustration. She picked up a coffee cup to take a sip and found it empty. Coffee cup? She looked down at the paper cup, the dregs of a few grounds in the bottom. She hadn't even remembered Sergeant Esposito giving her a coffee, and here she had already finished it. Missing time. That happened sometimes when she got deep in thought. A glance at her phone told her that she had been mulling things over for more than two hours. And she had gotten nowhere. She glanced at Daniel, who sat next to her, busy on his laptop, and Sergeant Esposito, who paced the small waiting room in an effort to stay awake. He had been working as hard as they had, mostly behind the scenes, compiling information, checking on distant police precincts. What was it that someone had said that had jogged her subconscious? It was Daniel. So what had he said to her recently? The hotel? Ziegler's hotel. She had to tell him that Tuscolano was a suburb of Rome. He hadn't heard of it before. A suburb of Rome. An unfamiliar name. That's it, she said, springing up. That's what, Daniel said, looking up from his laptop. Remy was about to tell him when the walkie-talkie she had clipped to her belt crackled into life. A man matching the description you gave has just signed in at the front desk, requesting to see the body of Gareth Jacks, the security guard said. He claims his name is Bill Jacks, and pretended he had forgotten his ID at the hotel. They let him in. He's coming down now. Remy turned to Daniel. He's here. He's coming down. Daniel put his laptop away. All right, everybody sit down and act normal. We'll jump in when he comes in, Daniel said. Sergeant Esposito placed himself at the seat next to the door. Remy and Daniel sat next to the door leading to the morgue. Wait, let him in, Remy said. I'm curious to see what he looks at when he sees the body. Good idea, Daniel agreed. Go tell the coroner to play along. Remy ducked through the door leading to the cool interior of the morgue. The coroner was filling out some paperwork. Dr. Giuliani had already been informed of the upcoming sting. He's almost down here, Remy told her. When he comes in, let him see the body. Dr. Giuliani licked her lips, obviously nervous. She may have felt comfortable around a room of dead bodies, but the idea of facing a live murderer didn't sit too well. A soft bell chimed. That's the door to the waiting room, the coroner said, her voice wavering. He's here. Oh no, I can't go back to the waiting room now. What do I do? Remy looked around her. The coroner took her by the hand. 
Come with me. She urged her over to the shelves and yanked one open. A body lay inside, covered with a white sheet, making her look ghostly. Dr. Giuliani pulled the sheet down to reveal an old woman's face. It was a broad face, with deeply incised laugh lines and hair dyed bright red. Pretend this is your mother, the coroner said, and moved away. Remy gulped and looked down at the woman. She looked like she had been kind. In her imagination, Remy saw her cooking meals for her grandchildren on Sunday afternoons, and calling up her forty-year-old son to make sure he wore a coat in winter. And now she was a prop for a police investigation. Sorry, Remy whispered to the dead body. Then she had no more time to think of this poor departed stranger, because the coroner, looking so nervous Remy felt certain she was going to give away the show, led in a monster of a man. Chapter 23 Justin Ziegler did not look like a connoisseur of the arts, or a scholar of church history. Remy could not imagine this person sneaking into an academic library, or selling rare books on the antiquarian market. He looked like a thug, through and through. He was a big man, with broad shoulders, and a unibrow over a heavy forehead. Large, calloused hands hung at the end of muscled arms. He simply towered over the coroner, who was visibly shaking with nerves. Remy gulped, wiped a non-existent tear from her eye, and gazed down at the body of the old woman. At the last moment she remembered to bring her purse forward to cover the walkie-talkie clipped to her belt. Out of the corner of her eye she looked all around, seeking a plan of escape if things went badly, which they most certainly would. First there was the door to the waiting-room, where Daniel and Sergeant Esposito stood guard. They would come in at any moment, but if they did, Ziegler would certainly know something was amiss, and there would be a confrontation. They wouldn't get to see what he was after. Of course, catching the killer was the most important thing, but knowing what he was after was almost as important. Important enough for them not to come in for the moment. As long as everyone played their part, they could leave Ziegler alone for a minute, and she and the coroner would be safe. Probably. Remy's gaze flicked around the room. There was the long row of metal shelves containing bodies. On the wall behind her she had seen an open door to Dr. Giuliani's office. A closed door next to it had a sign saying, Laboratory. On the opposite wall was a blank metal door with a sign above it saying, Emergency Exit. Those would be the stairs where Officer Brambilla would be on watch. Ziegler was trapped. On the other hand, they were trapped with Ziegler. Remy did not think a dose of pepper spray would stop this man. She focused on the body in front of her, wiping another imaginary tear from her eye. Her hand shook. Dr. Giuliani and Justin Ziegler approached. The art thief gave Remy a polite nod. She was too nervous to return. Hopefully he'd assumed she was so overwhelmed with grief that she hadn't noticed him. It didn't matter. He looked away a moment later. They walked to a spot on the line of the shelves, not five paces in front of Remy. Ziegler was talking. Remy tuned in. I still can't believe it, he said in perfect Italian. Who would want to kill my big brother? He was so mild-mannered, such a quiet academic, not like me at all. He sniffed. If Remy didn't know he was faking, she would have taken it for real. His voice wavered as he continued. We got along well, though. He was the smart one, obviously. He always helped me with my homework. I could never have graduated high school without him. And I always stuck up for him. The other boys teased him mercilessly, but even though I was the younger brother, I was so much bigger than him or his classmates. I took care of the bullies. Yes, we were as close as two brothers could be. He buried his face in his hands. I'm sorry for your loss, Dr. Giuliani said, her voice shaking. C could we? Ziegler gestured to the shelf labelled Gareth Jacks. Of course, the coroner said in a quiet voice. She pulled open the drawer. The body was covered in a white sheet. Remy shivered for more than just the cold of this terrible room. Dr. Giuliani uncovered the face and upper body. The crushed neck appeared as a horrible purple crease. Justin Ziegler let out a very convincing groan. This man is far more than a thug, Remy realised. He's a master of deception. 
He probably plays off people underestimating him because of his appearance. The police? The police said that he was strangled? Ziegler warbled. Yes, he was, senor. Our father is a policeman. Well, a retired policeman. He wanted me to examine everything. He wants to know exactly what happened. You want to see the entire body? The coroner asked. Ziegler took a deep breath. Yes, please. Dr. Giuliani pulled down the sheet to reveal Gareth Jax's body. The rectangular portion of flesh that had been removed from the inside of his wrist shone a slick garish red on the harsh light. What happened? Ziegler asked, sounding surprised. Your brother had a tattoo on his wrist. The killer removed it. Pause. Ah, I didn't know he had a tattoo. A tattoo of what? We don't know. As you can see, the skin was completely removed. Ziegler turned to her, towering over the diminutive woman. Then how do you know it was a tattoo? Well, we just assumed. Ziegler turned to the body again. Are there other tattoos? He looked at it from head to toe. No, senor. Turn him over, he ordered. Turn him over? You heard me. I want to see if my brother had any more marks. Whatever the coroner was about to say, she never got to say it, because just at that moment the walkie-talkie on Remy's belt crackled. Is the suspect still in the morgue? the security officer's voice asked. Justin Ziegler whirled around to stare at Remy with a mixture of surprise and rage. What's going on is that you just got me killed, you fool? Oyo, Ziegler said, stalking towards her. What was that? Remy fumbled to unzip her purse so she could get her pepper spray. She cursed herself for being an idiot. Not only had she forgotten to unzip it before Ziegler showed up, but she had left the walkie-talkie on. She had to remember that in these situations she wasn't a world expert. No, she was way out of her depth. And now Ziegler was upon her. He yanked the purse from her grasp, revealing the walkie-talkie. Who are you? he bellowed. The sound of the coroner running to the waiting-room door made him turn. His expression turned from one of anger to fear. He bolted for the emergency exit. Daniel had been about to enter the morgue, deciding that the risk to Remy outweighed the chance to learn more about Siegler's motives, when Dr. Gelliani tore open the door and shouted something in Italian. He didn't need to understand the words because he saw Ziegler rush past her, heading for the emergency exit. Halt! Daniel shouted, pulling his gun and rushing past the coroner. He made it inside just in time to see Ziegler pass through the door and into the emergency staircase. Dimly he was aware of Remy shouting on the walkie-talkie and Sergeant Esposito running just behind him. He sprinted across the room past the naked body of Gareth Jacks and made it to the door. Tearing it open, he heard the echoing footsteps of the art thief pounding up the staircase. He had already passed the first landing and was out of sight. Halt! he shouted again. He decided against calling out to Officer Brambilla, who hopefully was posted at the top of the stairs. He didn't want to warn Ziegler. He rounded the landing just in time to see the two men collide. Officer Brambilla stood on the upper landing, the door to the hospital's ground floor at his back. He had pulled out his nightstick and brought it down on Ziegler, who was rushing him with his arms out like he was going to tackle him. Turned out he had something else in mind. With an expert move that showed martial arts training, he grabbed Officer Brambilla's down-swinging arm and neatly flipped him over his shoulder. The Italian officer tumbled head over heels down the stairs. Daniel had to dodge to the side to keep from getting hit. Officer Brambilla ended up in a heap on the landing. Ziegler tore open the door and ran through. Get Dr. Giuliani to look at him, he called over his shoulder to Sergeant Esposito as he hurried to follow the suspect. He passed through the door and found himself in a long, wide hallway. Ziegler was pelting down the hall several yards ahead of him, having already knocked over an intern. Stop! Daniel shouted, knowing that he wouldn't. Patients and nurses stared as Daniel ran after him. Ziegler was obviously more fit and was already gaining ground as Daniel began to sweat, his breathing growing laboured. Ziegler passed an intern wheeling an old man on a gurney, delivered a right cross to the intern that laid him flat, and spun the gurney to block Daniel's way. The patient let out a startled cry. Daniel cursed and stopped to adjust the gurney as gently as his haste would allow. That gave time for Ziegler to disappear around the corner. Damn it! Daniel huffed, picking up speed again. 
He didn't say any more because he was already out of breath. He rounded the corner to find Ziegler already ten yards ahead down another hall. Several people stood staring, and they obviously would do nothing other than stare. Civilians, Daniel griped silently. The security guard, a good six inches shorter and ten years older, stood in the arch thief's path, walkie-talkie in one hand and a nightstick in the other. He'd obviously been alerted by his fellow security officers. But by the easy way Ziegler had dealt with that cop on the stairs, Daniel didn't think this renter cop was going to stand much chance. Sure enough, Ziegler leapt up and landed a kick in the man's chest. The security guard let out a loud oof and fell flat on his back. Then a stroke of luck. As Ziegler jumped over the guard's prone form, the man managed to swipe out with his nightstick. The length of wood hit Ziegler on the shin. Not hard, as the man was too stunned to do more than blindly swing, but it was enough to make Ziegler stumble and fall. And that was enough for Daniel to catch up. No, it wasn't. With remarkable agility, the art thief got up, took a couple of unsteady steps, then found his feet and picked up speed again. Daniel was still several yards behind, and he knew that, huffing and puffing, as he already was, he would not catch up. So he tried a different tactic. He switched his gun to his off hand, plucked the nightstick from the half-stunned security guard, and flung it at the back of Ziegler's head. Thwack! Direct hit. Ziegler went down for the second time in ten seconds, and this time he stayed down. Daniel didn't think he'd stay down for long. He ran the last few yards to get to the thief, and, staying well out of reach of this monster, levelled his gun at him. Just in Ziegler, Daniel said, sucking in another breath. I'm Special Agent Daniel Walker of the FBI, and your ass is grass. I mean, I'm arresting you on suspicion of murder. Same thing, really. Chapter 24 Remy felt much better having a layman in the interrogation room than a priest. It soothed the remnants of her Catholic guilt. Sergeant Esposito was over the moon as well, not that he was here. After they had found a business card to a Rome hotel in the prisoner's pocket, he had gone off to search Ziegler's room. So Remy and Daniel, and a local officer, sat glowering at Ziegler over the plain metal table. The art thief sat there, looking sullen. It's this time we have him,' she thought. "'And I'm going to get some answers.' "'I want a lawyer,' he grunted. "'Oh, maybe not. "'Officer Brambilla needed treatment for a dislocated shoulder.' the Italian officer said in English. I want a lawyer. This man is a professional criminal. He knows he's caught, but he'll still try to get out of it. We're going to have to work on him pretty hard. The security guard is pressing charges too, the officer said, as are the two interns. I want a lawyer. You mentioned that, Daniel replied. Why did you go to the morgue? He looked disappointed when the tattoo had been removed. Remy said. He wanted the coroner to let him examine the body for more. Interesting, Daniel said. So, what do you know about these tattoos? How did you know they were even there? Justin Ziegler remained silent. We know you tried to join the Association of Devout Students, Remy said. And with your research ability, you probably already knew in general what the Association did, the secret it held, and that each member got a tattoo. The art thief grimaced, but did not speak. Daniel's phone rang. He picked it up, turning his back. Yeah? Nice. You sure? Oh, you scored big time, bud. Yeah, nice one. Bring him on in. Thanks. He turned back to Ziegler, put away his phone, and smiled. My associate with the Rome police searched your room and found several rare books with library stamps. Didn't have time to do the old bleach and water treatment to remove them, eh? No, you were hunting bigger game. The Gospel of Longinus. But you couldn't resist stealing a few books on the way, could you? Ziegler went pale. I didn't kill anyone. Yeah, sure you didn't. Remy nodded, glaring at the man who had probably killed two of her colleagues and a man of the cloth. I didn't, he cried, his voice going up an octave. I was on the trail. I wanted to track down Jackson, Neri, and Winkler, but someone got there before me. Oh, so you're going to kill them, but somebody beat you to it. That's a new one. No, I was going to invite them out for a drink and drug them. If you look in the medicine cabinet in my room, you'll find some Rohibnol. 
I was wondering when you were going to get to that. My Italian pal found that, too. What's Roy Hypno? Remy asked. Used to be used for sleeping disorders, Daniel said. Now it's banned in the U.S. because lots of guys use it as a date-rape drug. Knocks you out. It's easy enough to buy on the black market. So we can add possession of a controlled substance to the list. But wait, the toxicology reports on the victims didn't show any sign they were drugged. But it's proof I didn't plan to kill them, Siegler said. It doesn't prove diddly squat. Remy didn't know what diddly squat meant, but she got the idea. Remy caught her partner's eye. Can I speak to you outside for a moment? All right. They left Ziegler with the Italian policeman. Once they were out in the hall, Remy spoke. I don't think he did it. Daniel looked at the door to the interrogation room and made a sour face. I don't think he did either. I was just bluffing with him. Why don't you think he did it? Why go back to the morgue? He looked surprised to see the tattoo missing, and was almost desperate in the hope that a second might be hidden. I think he visited the morgue hoping the tattoo was intact. But he already saw Nery's tattoo was gone. True, but maybe he hoped to find more evidence. It wouldn't be unreasonable that there would be a second tattoo as a backup, one that the killer might have missed. Or maybe he hoped that the second victim hadn't lost his tattoo at all. Daniel nodded. Yeah, and if he was the killer and he saw Nery didn't have a backup tattoo, why risk capture checking out a Jax? Besides, the killer had a bit of time with both victims, and even more with Winkler. Winkler was in the middle of a field at night. He could have checked them more thoroughly if he thought there might be more that he needed. And then there's the fact that Sergeant Esposito didn't find the bits of flesh in the hotel room. Remy glanced at the door. So the real killer might still be out there. We have to operate on that assumption. We have enough on Ziegler that he isn't getting out of jail any time soon. And with him still a suspect, and being an obvious flight risk, the judge isn't going to grant him bail. Let's keep looking. Remy sighed and leaned against the wall, exhausted. Where? What were you about to say in the waiting room? Remy looked at him. What? The waiting room in the morgue. You had a aha moment. But then we got word Ziegler was coming down and you never got to tell me. That's right. I figured out what the tattoos stand for. Well, mostly. Mostly? P, period. S, period. O. The S, period, O, stands for Suburbio Ostiense. It's a suburb of Rome. It took me a while to remember because that's the old designation. The suburbs were reorganized and mostly renamed in 1921. Daniel gaped. How in the world do you know that? Remy smiled, proud. Staring at old maps of Rome to look for patterns of church and palace placement. Part of an historian's job. The Suburbio Ostiense doesn't exist anymore, but the area is still inhabited. But how do you know it stands for this suburb and not something else? Because of a book from 1918 I found in that library. The library you insisted on going back to so you could get attacked a second time? The very one, she replied with a smile. The book mentioned that the devout students were in the habit of meeting and having discussions in houses in the Rome suburbs. So most students would have been familiar with the suburban designations. But why use the old designation? Because when the suburbs were reorganized in 1921, they were given the Roman numerals. Suburbio Ostiense became Suburbio 7 Ostiense. If you put VII on one tattoo, the answer becomes too obvious. If you split them up, then you don't know what the number is. Right. You'd never know if you have the full number. It could be IV or VI or VIII. Exactly. You know your Romans. Daniel grimaced another of his odd reactions to his obviously high level of education. And what does the P stand for? he asked. You mentioned it could stand for palace, palazzo, or palladium in Italian, or porta, Latin for gate, or ponte or pontis for bridge. Remy cocked her head. You have quite the memory. He puffed out his chest. You're not the only genius around here. Well, being geniuses doesn't give us the answer. We know at the very least that it's a bridge or a gate or a palace in the old suburb. 
but how to narrow it down. Isn't the palace the most obvious place to keep a book? Not necessarily. Many old houses are incorporated into bridges and gates. This was normal in the Middle Ages, and a few examples in Rome still survive. Great. I bet Father Ambrogio can help us with that. Oh, is that man right in there? Remy suggested. He might have a general idea what the tattoos signify, even if he didn't get to see them. We can try, but don't hold your breath. They went back inside. Daniel took the lead. You're going down for four counts of assault, several counts of theft, and possession of a controlled substance. If you know anything about the tattoos that can help us, it might help you beat the murder rap, and I'll put in a good word with the judge on the other crimes. I'm not making a deal without a lawyer, Ziegler grunted, giving them a contemptuous look. We don't have time for that, Remy said. If you're not the killer, then he has all the clues, and is probably heading over to find the book right now. And I think that the book is probably looked after by someone, someone who will get killed because he's in the way. To stop another death, you need to tell us what you know. Remy studied Ziegler's face closely. She had never been particularly good at reading expressions. Books about people who had died centuries ago were more her specialty, but she thought she could trace the thread of thought and emotions going through their prisoner. First, wariness, followed quickly by the realisation that she was correct. Ziegler knew enough to know the killer was well ahead of them on the path to the book. Self-interest struggled with the remnants of a human conscience for a moment, and miraculously, conscience won. Mostly. I'll tell you what I know, he said, sighing with resignation. Go on, Daniel prompted. Ziegler looked sharply from one to the other, and finally to the Italian officer. You promised to put in a good word for me. Maybe get the officer and the security guard to drop their charges. The interns, too. I can't speak for them, but I'll try, Daniel said. Get them in here and— We don't have time, Remy snapped. Then, surprised by the heat of her outburst, followed up more calmly with, We need that information to save a life, please. Ziegler looked like he had tasted something foul. All right, it's in a palace, that's all I know. The tattoos lead to an old Renaissance palace somewhere here in Rome. How do you know that? Remy asked. Never mind how I know it. And the Gospel of Longinus is an original. They've kept the original papyrus text— written in ancient Greek in the late first century, ever since it was written down. It's in the handwriting of the Apostle Judas himself. Remy felt a prickling all over her skin. While the rational side of her mind doubted his words, reasoning that at the very least it would be a later copy, and that apocryphal gospels were rarely, if ever, actually written by the person purported to be the author, she could not help but be intrigued. A small part of her, the child who had loved stories of mysteries and buried treasure, felt an overwhelming urge to believe. Damn, Daniel said, smiling at her. You're actually licking your lips. Remy flushed, then flushed more deeply when Ziegler said, You're not all that different than I am, are you? Yes, I am, she growled. I don't steal. Well, not regularly. One more thing, Daniel said. How did you know which members of the Association of Devout Students had the right tattoo? And how did the murderer know? Assuming you're two different people, and we have not proven that yet. Ziegler treated him to a cocky smile. I'm going to have to plead the fifth on that one. I need to talk with Father Ambrogio, Remy said, heading out of the room. You're welcome, Ziegler called after her. She stopped, turned. Studied Ziegler for a moment. The thief, the conman, was back. But he had done one good deed. Thank you. You might just have saved a life. And you did that without any guarantee of personal gain. Think about that. Ziegler blinked. Remy turned and walked out of the room, already dialing the priest at the Church of St. Lazarus. This time he picked up more quickly. What is it? he asked. The killer, we believe, is still on the loose. Somehow he has managed to get all the blessed letters, as you call them. I don't see how he could have done it without being a member of your association. Impossible. We would know. Ever since this started, we have been conducting our own internal investigation. There is no chance it is one of us. 
"'So you haven't been sitting by as passively as you pretend, eh? "'It would have been nice to have known that before.' "'Remy and Daniel, by unspoken agreement, "'were already jogging to the parking lot. "'It must be,' Remy insisted. "'Have you checked everyone?' "'Of course. Everyone has been scrutinised. "'Even I have been investigated.' "'He actually sounded annoyed by that. "'They got to the parking lot. "'Daniel looked at her expectantly, "'wanting to know where they were going. "'We're heading to the suburbia Ostiense,' she told him. "'There are no signs pointing there any more, but I'll give you directions.' "'If it's an entire neighbourhood, where do we go?' Daniel asked. "'This is Rome. Renaissance palaces are a dime a dozen. We need to know which one.' "'I think I know how to find out,' Remy replied. "'You better,' Daniel said, "'or we'll end up driving around all day while more people get murdered.' Chapter 25 As the car sped down one of Rome's main streets, Daniel cursing and struggling with the traffic, Remy tried not to feel carsick, and continued speaking with Father Ambrogio. Father, you mentioned that a member died recently. That's correct. Father Chariton Eliades, one of our members in Athens. We got a call just last month that he had died in an automobile accident. Such a loss. He was in the prime of his life. Are you sure he's dead? I beg your pardon. Turn left here, Daniel. Yes, Father. Did you get confirmation of his death? That investigator from the Vatican thought it was an inside job until he saw me. He never divulged his evidence for that, but I'm betting it's more evidence than we've managed to gather. Each member keeps an emergency contact number in their wallet or purse. It's my office number. Part of my duties is to assist members in trouble. I got a call from the Athens Police Department telling me the news. Remy thought about all the secrets and deception that had been swirling around them since this case began. Are you sure they were the Athens Police? What? Well, they said they were, Father Ambrogio replied, doubt creeping into his voice. Do you have any confirmation of that? Did any member go to his funeral? Well, uh, no. Are you saying he might be the killer? That's entirely possible. It makes sense. An inside job, just like the Vatican thinks. And the only way for a member to pass unnoticed is for the association to think he's dead. He's probably changed his appearance, cut himself off from everyone. Perhaps he's been planning this for a long time. He probably doesn't even need to research anything on association property any more. He can disappear. Perhaps Father Ambrogio went through the same thoughts, because in a quick, determined voice he replied, I'll look into it, thank you. Wait, don't hang up. Take a right here, Daniel. We're already en route to the suburbio Ostiense. Why are you going there? Remy could not tell if he was being evasive or honestly asking, but it was telling that he recognised the old name. Very telling. The tattoos spell out a location there. We have reason to believe it's a palace. Do you know anything about that? The association and its members have extensive property holdings. Anything in suburbia Ostiense? Keep straight, Daniel. It would help if I knew where I was going, a partner said. I'm working on that. Father, do you know of any palaces or other property in suburbia Ostiense? No, but I can check. Please hurry. We're on the main road heading there. We'll be there in a couple of minutes. I'll call you right back. He hung up. Daniel grabbed the phone. I'll call Sergeant Esposito and tell him the news. Can't get any cops to help us until we know where we're going, though. As Daniel talked on the phone, Remy fidgeted in the passenger's seat. They soon passed out of central Rome, moving into a less built-up area with more modern buildings. There were still a scattering of older ones, old stone homes and even a fortified tower from the Middle Ages. Rome had always been a sprawling place, and Daniel was correct in saying that the suburbio Ostiense would have several palaces to search. If they didn't get that address from Father Ambrogio, they would never get there before the killer had come and gone. After an agonising few minutes, during which Daniel got them to the suburb and slowed the vehicle, not knowing where to go next, Father Ambrogio finally called back. 
Father Gentili owns an old palace on Via Santissima 15. He's from an old family, quite prominent in the 17th and 18th centuries. Like so many such families, the last of their income vanished in the war. I've never been to the palace, but the person I just spoke to said it's a grand palace, now gone to seed. He lives there alone. He's an old man, nearly a hermit. Call him and warn him. We're on our way. Remy started punching in the address to the rental car's GPS. She didn't know this area very well. I can't. He doesn't own a phone. Do you know anyone who can warn him? None closer than you. Daniel glanced at the address on the GPS and called Sergeant Esposito again. Father, can you tell me anything more about Father Gentili? Anything that can help? I'm sorry, but I've barely heard of him. He rarely visits this church or even conducts research in the library. He keeps himself to himself. We get there as soon as we can. Godspeed and bless you for protecting us. Father Ambrogio hung up, and Remy looked at the phone, surprised. That had sounded genuine. Daniel put away his phone. Sergeant Esposito says the nearest patrol car is at least five minutes away. It's coming without siren so as not to alert the killer. We are three minutes away. Are we going to wait for the police? Remy asked. Daniel turned to her and grinned. What do you think? I need a gun, Remy muttered. Too bad. I only have one, and you're still not a cop. Daniel sped up as much as Rome's traffic would allow. He honked furiously at the slower drivers, getting many creative Italian hand gestures in return. Remy's phone rang. She picked up without looking at the number. Father Ambrogio, do you have some more information for us? What? This is Cyril. Cyril, why are you calling? Her surprise was mixed with pleasure at hearing a friendly voice, tinged with a trace of annoyance. Now wasn't exactly a good time. Why wouldn't I? But on your mobile phone? This must cost a fortune. Look, Cyril, I'm... I'm about to lose a fortune. If we don't move on that house right now, it's going to slip through our fingers. The house? For a moment, Remy had no idea what he was talking about. Yes, the house. Our house. The one we planned on buying. Daniel swerved between two cars, both blaring their horns. Cyril, I'm a bit busy right now, she said, her annoyance growing. You're always busy. I understand you're on a case, but the real estate agent needs an answer today. Today? I haven't even seen it. This is ridiculous. Now of all times. She glanced at Daniel. Thankfully, he was too focused on the road to pay much attention. Remy, it's a great house and a great deal. We need to jump on it. The GPS said they were just a block away. Daniel pulled the car to the side of the road and parked in front of a fire hydrant, the only free space available. I have to go, Cyril. We're on the brink of solving this case. You and your cases? Yes, Remy snapped. Me and my cases. I have to go right this instant. Not until I have an answer, her lover huffed. Remy took a deep breath. Since the answer is no. Pause. No to buying the house or no to... I have to go right now. Goodbye. Remy leapt out of the car. Daniel was already three paces ahead. Now's not the time for boyfriend trouble, Daniel said over his shoulder. Sorry. No need to apologise, he replied, already breathing heavily. My wife was the same way. Despite the situation, Remy felt flustered at his marriage being compared to her relationship, but on a superficial level it made sense. And on a deeper level, she wasn't so sure. And she was sure how Cyril was going to end his sentence before she could cut him off. No time to think about that now. The palace stood up ahead. The term palace is rather loosely used in Italy, encompassing everything from the splendid papal residence with its hundreds of rooms and army of servants to run-down old buildings that had seen better days centuries ago. This palace was in the latter category. It stood a little back from the street, with an overgrown front garden, shaded by a couple of ancient olive trees. A low stone wall topped by an iron fence surrounded it. An iron gate in front stood slightly open. Beyond this stood the palace itself, a small three-storey stone structure that Remy guessed dated to the 17th century. Grand then, now it was half a ruin. Ivy crept up its cracked walls and the yellow paint on its ornate columns and balustrades had faded and flaked off in large sections, 
A small vegetable garden to one side, however, looked well tended, and the shutters on the windows, all closed, were new and freshly painted. This was a typical example of so many old homes in Europe, where the latest generation of a once great family struggled to maintain their legacy. This family might go extinct if they didn't get in there quick. Daniel and Remy paused at the gate. This was a quiet street, and although a couple of cars passed by, they saw no pedestrians nearby. "'How do we handle this?' Remy asked. "'The direct approach. No time for anything else.' He pulled out his gun, but kept it inside his jacket and out of sight. "'Good thing most Italians don't have guns, eh?' "'He's Greek.' "'What are the gun laws like in Greece?' "'I have no idea.' "'Great.' Daniel pushed the gate open with a creak, and they moved up the cracked and overgrown walk. "'Stay behind me.' "'Gladly,' Remy said, heart beating fast. At the last moment she remembered to pull out her pepper spray, and then wondered how much was left in it. They walked up the three marble steps to the front porch and faced the door. Daniel and Remy listened, but heard nothing. Daniel checked his phone and showed it to her. A text from Sergeant Esposito said the nearest patrol car would be there in two minutes. "'He could be in there right now,' Remy whispered. "'Father Gentili could be in danger. If he's hiding the gospel of Longinus in there, the killer won't stop at murder to get it.' Daniel gave a quick nod and checked the front door. Unlocked. A bad sign. He pushed it open. They found themselves in a large, gloomy front hall that showed hints of past grandeur. A high-vaulted ceiling was painted with a faded fresco Remy could barely make out, as there was no light in this room except what made it through the slats of the shutters. A dusty chain hanging a few feet down from the top of the vault must have once held a chandelier, now gone. The lone chain and the near darkness made the place look like a dungeon. That effect was enhanced by the white sheets placed over several pieces of furniture. Between these ghostly apparitions were scattered a few buckets half-filled with water. The roof obviously leaked. Beyond an expanse of cracked marble tiles, they saw the dramatic sweep of a staircase leading upwards. There was more light there, and they could see a hallway of flaked plaster leading out of sight. Perhaps a shutter or two at the back of the house was open. On the ground floor, beyond the front hall, they saw another hallway obscured by a pair of fine old teak doors, half closed. They paused, listening. Then the sound of arguing voices coming from the ground floor told them where to go. The words were Italian, muffled by distance, and perhaps an intervening door, and Remy could not make them out. The urgency was plain, however, and they hurried across the front hall as quietly as they could. Daniel didn't even bother to tell Remy to stay behind. His partner was beginning to understand him. Despite her heart hammering in her chest and the cold sweat breaking out all over, she had to follow those voices. She had to see it through. They got to the double doors and peeked through the open space between them. They saw a long hallway with several doors on either side, all closed. At the end was another door, open. Daylight filtered through. "'I don't know,' an old man's voice came to them. "'I told you, I don't know.' He sounded afraid, but defiant. Daniel nodded to Remy. She eased the doors open while he focused on aiming down the hallway. Then they paced forward. A younger, deeper voice growled. You must know. You make the tattoos. I told you. Just because I draw them doesn't mean I know what they mean. Killing me will achieve nothing. Remy gave Daniel an urgent signal. The FBI agent only nodded, moving forward at a steady, silent pace. She realised this was better. To hurry might make noise, might alert the madman who had taken the old hermit captive. Even in crisis situations, one shouldn't hurry. That was something taught by the training she didn't have. There's so much I don't know. Maybe that's one of the reasons I love this. I constantly have to learn. She also had to learn to concentrate only on the situation in hand. This was not about her or her future. This was about saving Father Gentili from the grip of a madman. At the end of the hall they found the door opened on the kitchen. The place was clean, obviously more used than the rest of the house, even though the appliances looked like they hadn't seen service since the eighties. Another open door led to a room they couldn't see. It was from there that the daylight streamed. You're burned for this, Eliades. Stop now. Remy suppressed a gasp. 
I was right. He faked his death and killed a string of people just to find this place. They passed through the kitchen and to the open door. Beyond was a study, and beyond that, through another door, the brilliant light of a conservatory filled with plants. An old man in regular clothes sat on the sofa in the study by a large bookshelf. Towering above him was a burly man of indeterminate age, also dressed as a layman and not as a priest. He gripped the older man by the hair. His other hand held a knife to his throat. Chapter 26 Remy realised they must have made some sound, because the man with the knife immediately spun around to face them. Remy's breath caught as she saw his eyes. There was madness in those eyes. "'Father Cheriton Eliades, this is the FBI,' Daniel barked. "'Put down the knife and step away from Father Gentili. You are under arrest.' Eliades yanked on Gentili's hair, pulling him to his feet, and yet it was Eliades who winced. "'What was that? Pain? Had Gentili hurt his attacker?' Considering their respective sizes, it didn't seem likely. But Remy could see Eliades's brow was beaded with sweat. "'Back away,' he said in English, "'or I will kill him.' The Greek stepped behind the Italian, using him as a human shield. "'There's no way out,' Daniel said, his gun not wavering a millimetre. "'Give yourself up. It's over.' "'You have no idea what you're interfering with,' Eliades said. I have nothing to give him, Gentilly said with surprising calm. The devil has led him into a snare. That's not true, Aliadi shrieked. You know where it is. Remy, thinking quickly, said, You thought the tattoos would lead you to the book, but they only led you to the man who gives the tattoos. Yes, Aliadi growled. I found his equipment in another room. For years I've been hunting the secret, keeping close track of who died and who was brought into the order, until I figured out a pattern. Then I knew who had the blessed letters. I only made one mistake with Professor Winkler, but in the end I found out the code. But it didn't lead me to the book, it led me to him. He gave the old man a shake. He's insane. How can I stop him? The book isn't here, Remy blurted making it up as she went along. I bet if we hadn't come you would have ransacked the whole palace, and still you wouldn't have found it. I'm sure it's too well hidden to find. There are a million hiding places in an old palace like this, but he'll tell me where it is. He brought his knife close against Gentilly's throat, the keen edge pressing against pale flesh. Father Gentilly closed his eyes, his lips mouthing a silent prayer. There is no book. Remy said in a flat, hard tone. Daniel glanced at her. Eliades's eyes widened, then his olive skin darkened into the colour of storm clouds. That's a lie. What would you know about it, woman? Always nice to hear the word woman used as an insult. Remy decided to tighten the screws. This was the one thing he'd kill for. If she could pull that away from him, maybe, just maybe, he would stop. It's all smoke and mirrors. There is no book. It's only a symbol, an instructive parable. The point of the Association of Devout Students is to encourage original thinking across all branches of Christianity, to make one question how the Bible was pieced together. Why do you think we are encouraged to study the Apocrypha? What do you mean, we? I'm a member. That got a shocked look from Eliades and a poker face from Gentilly. You're lying. You're some sort of police officer. No, I'm a devout student sent by Father Ambrogio to help this FBI agent with his investigations. Nonsense. I've heard of you. You're Remy Laurent. Remy's heart skipped a beat. This was the second. Third? She had lost count. Killer, who knew of her? While she was aware she was a bit of a minor celebrity among conspiracy theory circles, especially after the Cryptex killer case, she had no idea so many crazies had fixated on her. She wondered if she would ever be in Father Gentilly's place. It was entirely possible. Yes, I'm Remy Laurent. You think I've never heard of the association? I found the references to it scattered through the literature. Otto of Bremen, the letters of Pope John II, hints in the writing of Professor Winkler. You think I'd miss the significance? It led me to the association. 
I've been a member for years, and, unlike you, I've discovered the gospel of Longinus is not an actual book. It is a parable to get us to open our minds, to understand that even the greatest sinner, the man who tortured Jesus on the cross, can teach us something about the true nature of God. Eliade shook all over, the knife scraping against the old hermit's neck, but not drawing blood. Not yet. Of course there's a book. You're lying. He almost sobbed as he said it. She's telling the truth, Daniel said. If you know her, you probably know she's a guest lecturer at Georgetown. Why would a university professor fly all the way to Italy with an FBI agent on a case? Because the association lent her to us to help us track you down. Now, drop the knife. Father Eliades did not take his burning eyes off Remy. If you're a member, show me your tattoo. Uh-oh. Why, so you can cut it off? Remy said, stalling for time. Think, think. You don't have a blessed letter. I don't need your flesh. Prove to me you're a devout student. Show me your tattoo. I'm not in the habit of exposing myself to strangers. Show it to me! Aliades yanked on Gentile's head and shook the knife near the older man's face. I'm not a member of the clergy. I like to go swimming and wear a bikini. So I had the tattoo placed somewhere not normally seen. She managed a smile. I'm surprised Father Gentile agreed to it, although he is an old man after all. Of course, I didn't know he was an old man. I was told to meet a priest in an apartment building. That priest blindfolded me and left, and then the tattoo artist came in. I never saw him. We only figured out this location from infrared scans of the flesh underneath the tattoos, which retained traces of the ink. Both Aliades and Gentili looked shocked that she knew so much about the association's operations. Fine, the Greek snarled. So you're a devout student. That doesn't mean you have all the answers. I've been searching for the book for years. There's so much evidence. They've been writing about it and the church has been burning it for centuries. Yes, Remy said, trying to sound sorrowful. They've been burning it, burned every copy they found until there were none left to find. You're right that in the early days the association did guard the secret gospel of Longinus, written in the hand of the Apostle Judas himself. But that's long since lost. We haven't had a copy since the Middle Ages. That's not possible, Father Eliades screeched. Remy bowed her head. It's hard to accept, I know. I was given this secret because it was essential for me to know in order to catch you. Only the elders know, those above Father Ambrogio, who we rarely, if ever, meet. They showed me a document, one not in the library on the Via Carlo Cataneo. It was written in 1689 in German. It detailed the case of a witch-burning there, where they tortured one of our fellow devout students who admitted under torture that his copy of the Gospel was the last. They burned him and it. He lied. He must have lied. Remy shook her head. They showed me another set of documents. Correspondence between a variety of leading devout students over the next several decades after that poor man was martyred, each student asking the other if they had a copy. None had. It is gone. No, it's our lies. It can't be. Father Eliade shook all over. Fear, anger and deep disappointment tore his features. Cutting through it all was a profound horror. The realisation that he had killed and mutilated several people for nothing— and now he faced the barrel of a gun, his life over. The rage overtook all the other emotions. Liar! he screamed, pushing Father Gentilly aside and charging at her, knife raised high. Daniel's gun sounded right in Remy's ear, stunning her. Father Eliades jerked and stumbled from the shot, a red blotch blossoming on the front of his shirt. But he did not go down. He did not even slow much. He simply rushed forward and slammed into Remy. He landed on top of her, for a moment she thought he had died, but then he gasped, lurched up and off her, and into a half-kneeling position. He raised his knife high. Daniel turned, hesitated. Remy knew he couldn't shoot with her between him and the killer, and he did not have time to grab the priest before the knife came down. Remy grasped the knife hand with both of her own. The little bottle of pepper spray had fallen away somewhere, and there wasn't an instant to spare to look for it. She got a firm grip on the man's wrist just below the knife, but he pressed down hard and the knife edged towards her. 
His face was close to hers, his hot, laboured breathing wafting over her. Remy knew she would lose this contest of strength in the next second or two. Her father had always told her tales of criminals fighting on after being shot. Shock kept them going for long enough to cause serious damage to whoever was facing them. Desperate, she got one foot beneath her and pushed up, slamming her shoulder into his chest while pushing all her weight on his knife hand. To her surprise, as his body twisted, he didn't resist. Instead, he cried out, dropped the knife, and gripped his abdomen. Had he been shot down there, too? Remy didn't have time to wonder. She slammed her fist down hard on the top of his hand, just where he clutched himself above the groin. Father Eliades's eyes bugged. He let out a gasp and rolled on his back, seemingly paralysed with pain. The next moment Daniel was on him, smacking the murderer hard across the temple with the butt of his pistol. The big man got laid flat out, and Daniel turned him over to cuff him. That movement woke him up with a cry of pain, but he remained too weak to struggle as the handcuffs went on. "'You all right?' Daniel asked her as he administered first aid to Father Eliades with a compact kit he always carried. He had turned from fighter to healer in a minute. "'Yes,' she said, not feeling all right. She was scraped and bruised all over, and her blouse was smeared with the priest's blood. She turned to see if Father Gentili was hurt, and found him on his knees, praying quickly under his breath, tears brimming out of his closed eyes, his face racked with misery. "'Are you hurt, Father?' she asked, moving over to him and putting a hand on his shoulder. He opened his eyes and looked at her with such misery that for a moment she wondered if the killer had murdered someone in the house. "'All my life,' he croaked. "'All my life dedicated to a lie.' Remy stared at him for a second before she understood. "'A lie? No. I was the one lying. I made all that up. I'm not even in your association.' "'I thought the other tattoo artist had done you.' "'The other tattoo artist?' "'No, I have no tattoos. "'I hadn't even heard of the devout students until this investigation.' "'He stared up at her in surprise. "'You mean?' "'Remy glanced over her shoulder and then lowered her voice "'so the killer wouldn't overhear. "'I just said that to get him to give up. "'It didn't quite work out the way I planned.' "'A slow smile spread across the old priest's face. "'Oh, my child, giving false witness is a sin.' "'but I think it might be forgiven in this case.' Chapter 27 A few hours later, Remy sat in Father Ambrogio's office. The priest had asked for her to visit alone. Daniel was too busy at the hospital anyway, watching over the prisoner as he underwent an emergency hernia operation and treatment for his gunshot wound, so she had assented both nervous and curious as to what the secretive priest wanted. Father Ambrogio studied her for a moment before speaking. "'I wanted to thank you for saving Father Gentili. I must say I was surprised to learn he was a tattoo artist. I never suspected it would be someone like him, although I suppose that's why he was chosen. Now that his role is known, the elders will have to find someone else to do the task.' "'I suppose you will,' Remy replied wondering how many priests also knew how to handle a tattoo gun. Apparently they always wanted to have two on call. The layers of their security seemed never-ending. Then it struck her. The book wasn't in Father Gentili's palace. It would be too dangerous to put an important man and an important item in the same place. That went against how the association operated. No, the book is somewhere else. But where? And it was his elders he let slip about. She knew better than to ask. She'd never get an answer. It's most inconvenient, but I suppose it was unavoidable, the priest said. Now I wanted to discuss another matter. Another matter? Remy tensed. Father Ambrogio leaned forward, steepling his fingers. Yes, you're famous and for the cryptex. Remy blinked. She hadn't been expecting that. She had thought he was going to berate her for breaking into their secret library. Surely he must know about that. Yes, while the Vatican has purchased the cryptex from the museum where it was found, it appears you managed to open it. Remy froze. How on earth could he know that? Father Ambrogio went on. You see, Professor Laurent, the Church of St. Pantelon of Nicomedia is run by a devout student. 
He reported a couple of months ago that a secret niche had been discovered open on the church wall, one that he had no idea was even there. The niche was empty, but he recalled a strange French woman visiting that out-of-the-way church. He gave us a detailed description, one that fits perfectly with you. I don't... Uh, I mean... Your lie to the killer can be forgiven, since it was done to stop an even greater sin. Lying to me will endanger your immortal soul. You stole church property. That is between you and God. Since we did not know we even had it, and we cannot prove anything was actually in that niche, we cannot very well press charges. And considering the good service that you have granted us, I will, as the Americans say, call it even. But know this, Professor Laurent, and here he leaned forward and gave her a sharp, calculating look. Our association has members all over the world. We watch and we learn. We know much about the cryptex already, enough to know that whatever you found in the Church of St. Pantelon of Nicomedia was only a milestone on the path to whatever secret it ultimately holds. And now that we know the Vatican doesn't have the final answer, only the first stage of the road, we will be looking for the milestones ourselves. Happy hunting, Professor Laurent, and thank you for the knowledge that we have something to look for. Remy trembled. Could these people actually find the cryptex without the code she had found? It was possible. Who knew what resources and secret sources of information they had at their disposal? Why do you want it? she asked through a throat suddenly gone dry. Father Ambrogio smiled and gave a little shrug. Because you do. That's good enough. And because we don't want the Vatican to get it. A new level of fear washed over her. Yes, the Vatican would be looking too. And, just like the Association of Devout Students, they had access to so much more information than she did that they might not need the code she had found in the Church of St. Patalon of Nicomedia. They might have the next step or the final answer already. Remy thought about that Vatican spy who had chased her in the library. The Holy See was watching the Association of Devout Students, and they were no doubt watching her. They would be on the trail. She needed to get that code cracked, fast. Luckily, she had a colleague who was an expert on breaking codes. She was supposed to have had a conference with him, but then this case took up all of her time. Now she needed to get to work. Very well, Remy said crisply. And for whatever the cryptex is hiding. But I think you've found over the past few days that I'm not one to be trifled with. The priest let out a low chuckle. No, you are not. But you have nothing to fear. Unlike our fallen Greek brother, we won't use violence. I wish I could say the same for everyone on this hunt. Did he mean the Vatican or someone else? Father Ambrogio did not look inclined to divulge more. He stood, indicating the meeting was over. I wish to thank you once again for your services, Professor Laurent. The Gospel of Longinus is safe because of you. Something so important should be revealed to the world, she said as they walked to the door. You wouldn't say that if you knew more about it, the priest said in a low voice. Remy thought she could hear a slight tremor in his voice. He stopped by his bookshelf, resting a hand on it and looking over the tidy spines, encasing biblical commentary, church history and theology. So many books in the world, Professor Laurent. So many books to give pleasure, to give knowledge. Some even give wisdom. He turned and managed a smile. You have access to some of the greatest libraries in the world. Be content with the books you have, not the books you don't have. Goodbye. Remy walked out alone into the street, blinking in the late afternoon daylight. He's read it. Read it. P.S.O. Palazzo Suburbio Ostiense. Not there. They wouldn't keep the tattoo artist and the book in the same place. Too risky. But what if the letters give more than one answer? Or what if that answer had simply been a coincidence, not the real answer at all? Yes. Library. Books. Be content with the books you have. Father Ambrogio looking over his books. And on one shelf. Scaffale. Italian for shelf. Scaffale P. Scaffale Pontifex. 
scaffale, papale, ordinazione. Remy stopped dead in her tracks, a woman walking behind her on the sidewalk, nearly bumping into her. There had been a shelf in the secret library labelled Papal Conclaves. That is the elective body of cardinals that ordained the new Pope. The shelf had been labelled in Latin and ancient Greek, so it had read differently, but the clue was in modern Italian, just as the clue to the tattoo artist had been. Another layer of security, because only a member would know about the library, so only a member could figure out where the book actually was. But would the Gospel of Longinus just be sitting on a shelf, able to be picked up by simple chance? No. It must be hidden somehow. How? Maybe there were clues scattered in those books, or a secret drawer in the shelf, or... A phone rang. Father Ambrogio sending a text. She opened it. We've changed the code to a random number. We should have known 312 would be obvious to anyone with an interest. Nobody's perfect. Smiley face emoji. Remy laughed. The foul-tempered old priest had actually used an emoji. She could picture him trying to act cool in some youth meeting, and all the local teens snickering behind his back. But it was he who was getting the last laugh. He knew she had been in there and was warning her to steer clear. Then her laughter cut off short. That hint about the library, the hand on the bookshelf. He had known she would make the connection. He had understood her thought processes well enough that she would follow those clues to their logical conclusion. He had toyed with her, pointing to where the book was and then stopping her from getting it. At least for now. But he had warned her that the Association of Devout Students would be searching for the cryptex. She needed to follow that trail before they figured out the answer for themselves. One mystery at a time, Remy, she told herself, and walked away from the church. And there's no time like the present. She stopped at the little park by the church, the one where she had seen poor people eating the free food Father Ambrogio and his fellow clergy gave out in the evenings, and sat down on the bench. She texted John MacDonald, a Canadian researcher at the University of Toronto, and an expert on ancient and medieval cryptography. Do you have time to chat? The answer came back immediately. Don't have to get to campus for another half hour. Zoom? Remy shrugged. Doing a Zoom call on roaming data would cost a lot, but as long as she was here it was on expenses. The US government could afford it. She set up a Zoom call. John's cheerful forty-year-old face, framed by a tidy brown beard and a full head of hair, appeared on a screen. Hi, Remy. This is a pleasant surprise. I bet it is, she thought with a smile. She and John had a fling a few years ago, and he had always dropped hints that he wouldn't mind another. Those hints had stopped when she had mentioned Cyril. But while he acted the gentleman, she could tell John was still interested. Hello, John, she said, giving him a warm smile. I was wondering if you could help me with a little project. Sure, what is it? I've come into possession of a medieval code, and I thought you'd be the perfect person to help me decode it. Something to do with the cryptex? Yes, John laughed. Still on the hunt. Good for you. John was one of the few people in academia who thought her search for the cryptex counted as valid scholarship. The hunt's gone further than I ever imagined. So can you do it? I won't know until I try. Scan it and send it over. It should make a good article. We haven't been co-authors for years. Remy paused, glancing at the Church of St. Lazarus. That church housed a secret society at odds with the Vatican. Both factions had investigators out hunting for old church secrets, and they had just arrested a rogue priest doing the same thing. Who knew how many other groups and individuals might be out there? I don't think it's a good idea for me to scan it. Um, all right. Why not? Remy glanced around. Security reasons. Security reasons? Yes, I'd rather not talk about it on the phone. Can I come up in person? John brightened. Sure. I'll have to clear it with Cyril, since he's my departmental head. But he's used to my work trips. Oh. John didn't look so bright any more. Better for you not to get any ideas. To his credit, the Canadian professor barely skipped a beat. Sure, you can come up any time. Try to avoid midterms or finals week, although I'm sure you'll be busy then too. 
How about next week? Next week? John looked surprised. Remy thought of Cyril, who was always a bit clingy after she got back from a case. Or the week after? That would be fine. Looking forward to seeing you. Thank you so much, John. If anyone can break this code, you can. No problem. I'll be interested in seeing where it leads. You and me both. Just as they were finishing up the final debriefings at the police station, and Daniel was busy with the last of the paperwork, Cyril called again. Hi, she said. It's so nice to hear your voice. You all right? her lover asked. You sound strange. More like elated. We cracked the case. She was so happy and relieved their previous argument was, for the moment, forgotten. Congratulations, he said, and sounded like he meant it. Are you all right? You weren't in any danger, were you? I'm safe. I didn't get hurt. Well, except for a few cuts and bruises. And my lower back hurts from that fall. But it certainly could have been worse. Thank God. I'm afraid I have some bad news. We lost the house. Relief poured through her. She sat down on the nearest chair. Nevertheless, she tried to sound sorry. Already? I told you there was another offer, actually several offers. Someone else snapped it up. We could have had it. He sounded frustrated, and even worse, hurt. I'm sorry, Cyril. I know you had your heart set on it. But I couldn't buy a house sight unseen. I suppose you're right. I'm sorry. And I know I'm rushing you. It's just that we don't have much time before the end of the semester, and once that's done, your work visa will expire. We need to set a date, and once we do, we'll need a place to live. Remy paused. There it was again. That reasonable, perfectly correct motive for Cyril to hurry things along. But Remy didn't want to hurry things along. It was too big of a step. Cyril, this is all too sudden. Too rushed. I... I can't do this. Cyril started to say something, and she hurried to cut him off. I do want to marry you, I do. It's just that I don't want to marry you yet. I need more time. Please try to understand. What's there to understand? We love each other, and we want to be together. What reason do we have to wait? Cyril, you've been married before. I haven't. This is a big step for me. It's a big step for me, too. Of course, but it's different for me. I'd be changing my country, and there's no guarantee of permanent work at Georgetown, and we've been through all this before. I understand all that. I know I'm asking a lot. But if we don't set a date before the end of the semester, you'll have to go back to France. I don't want to be in a long-distance relationship. The significance of that hung in the air. Many times they had discussed colleagues who had been in similar situations, and in every case the relationship had withered and died. The Zoom calls instead of holding hands, the long intervals between visits, the day-to-day -day life without the other person, the lack of knowing when the couple would live in the same city again. If it went on too long, that sort of relationship was doomed. Remy took a deep breath, and suddenly came to a decision, a decision that had been growing in her mind for months, a decision that had begun to be made on her very first case. Don't worry, Cyril. I have another way to stay in America. Chapter 28 Washington, D.C. Two days later Jet-lagged but relaxed, Remy sat across from Daniel at a table in the city's most exclusive French restaurant. They sat amid a hushed crowd listening to a live string quartet 
in an expansive room with mirrored walls and gilt columns. The only off-note to the calm ambience was Daniel crunching loudly on breadsticks. "'So, what's good here?' he asked, looking through the menu. "'Everything on this menu is in French.' "'Allow me to order. First we should get some wine.' "'Yeah, maybe. What's the best French beer?' "'They don't serve beer here. Are you going to get fish or meat?' I thought we were ordering the wine first. Yes, but I need to know if we're eating fish or meat, so I know whether to get white or red. Oh, right. I knew that, Daniel said quickly. I'm going to get a steak, so we should get... Red wine. Red wine, right. And this is my treat, as an apology for running off on my own so many times. You give me an ulcer and treat me to dinner? Maybe you should have milk instead of wine. Ha, ha. The waiter came and Remy addressed him in French. In this restaurant all the staff and at least half the clientele were French. We'd like a bottle of the Chateau Beau Séjour Beco saint Emilion, Grand Cru Rouge 2016. Very good, madame, the waiter said with a bow and withdrew. And some more breadsticks, please, Daniel called after him. Remy rolled her eyes. Daniel turned back to her. That sounds like a hell of a bottle you ordered. It's one of the finer reds of a recent vintage. A mixture of Merlot and Cabernet Franc with a touch of Cabernet Sauvignon. Well, la di da A waiter ducked over to their table with a silver scraper and whisked away Daniel's breadcrumbs into a salver. He was gone in an instant. Daniel took the last of the breadsticks out of the holder at the middle of the table and crunched away, adding more breadcrumbs to the white tablecloth in front of him. So what did Father Ambrogio want to talk to you about? Remy cocked her head. How did you know about our meeting? I'm an FBI agent. It's my business to spy on everyone. I see. Well, he wanted to thank me. And? He wanted to... I should tell him. He wanted to tell me he knew I was still hunting for the secret of the cryptex, and that they were hunting for it too. Huh? But the Vatican took it. Remy bit her lip and looked away. Summoning her courage, she looked back at him. Not before I opened it. She paused, fearful of his response. Daniel burst out laughing. When? As we were leading away that psycho? Yeah, I guess you had a spare couple of minutes. Less than that. I had to work fast. So the killer had the right combination after all. Yes, he did. So you're not mad? Why should I be? If anyone deserves to open it, you do. That's hardly a crime. What was in it? I might as well tell him everything. A map to a church in Tuscany. In a secret niche I found a statuette of the Virgin Mary. Inside that was a code. I'm still trying to break it. Those medieval monks got you on an Easter egg hunt. It appears so. And how does Father Ambrogio know about all this? The church is run by a devout student. He noticed the niche open and empty and identified me. And the grumpy old priest put two and two together, eh? Are they going to press charges? Remy cringed. She realised she had just admitted to theft to an FBI agent. No, he said, considering my help in catching Father Eliades, that we were even. He says he doesn't need the code to look for what the cryptex is pointing to. Hmm. Daniel fell silent. Remy watched him nervously. The wine came, Remy tasted and approved it, and the waiter poured them both a glass. To cover her concern, Remy breathed in its rich, subtle bouquet, swirling it gently around the glass. Daniel let out a little laugh and raised his glass. To the cryptex. To the cryptex. Their glasses clinked. Daniel took a gulp. Remy savoured a sip. Daniel smacked his lips. This is good. You know, I've never seen you drink. That's because you've only seen me on a case. I like kicking back with a beer and a ball game on Sundays. I keep to a limit, though. I've never liked drunks. Neither have I. So, you're not mad? Mad about what? My, um, acquisition of that statuette. If Father Ambrogio doesn't have a problem with it, I don't either. Well, not much. In any case, it's out of my jurisdiction. Just don't make a habit of it, okay? You may only be a civilian consultant, but you need to act like an agent when you're on the job, all right? Remy smiled. I'll do more than that.
The next morning, Remy sat in the office of Keiko Ochiai, assistant director of the Antiquities Division, the woman who had gotten her into this strange second profession. Remy and Daniel had already had a debriefing meeting with her the previous day, but Remy had called and requested a private talk. So, now, here she was, nervous as a schoolgirl facing the principal. "'I wanted to talk to you about my place in the FBI,' Remy said, her heart beating as fast as when she had faced the killer. "'As I said yesterday, we are more than satisfied with your performance. "'Thank you. I'd... I'd like to take the job, assuming the offer is still on the table.' Assistant Director Ochiai brightened. "'That's great news. But I have some questions first, and I sure hope I get the right answers, or this all could be a huge mistake.' Naturally, the assistant director said with an understanding nod. You said I'd keep Daniel, I mean Agent Walker, as a partner. What will he do while I'm training? We're making special arrangements for you. The FBI Academy has two months of intense training. We have a case coming up that requires your skill, so we're going to have to have you do your training between cases. It's highly irregular, but then again, so is the Antiquities Division, and so are you and Agent Walker. That made Remy laugh. All right, I appreciate that, but I have another question that didn't occur to me until quite recently. Don't you have to be an American citizen to be an FBI agent? I looked it up, and that seems to be the case. Well, that won't be a problem, because you're marrying an American. Remy paused, a deep sadness suddenly washing over her. What could she say to that? Because joining the FBI wasn't just about her changing careers— and it wasn't just about her relieving the pressure of having a wedding date. It was about having another option entirely. Professor Laro? Assistant Director Ochiai said. Remy realised she hadn't spoken for several seconds. The marriage will not be happening immediately. Oh. The FBI woman sounded unsure what to say. An awkward pause stretched out. Well, I'm sure we can make arrangements. We can do that in extraordinary circumstances. Thank you, I'd appreciate that. Now, I have to warn you, Professor Laurel, that the FBI requires vigorous training, both physical and mental. There's also a screening process, psychological tests, and, of course, a background check. Those won't be a problem. I never thought they would. But do you think you're ready for the training? It's considerably more challenging in many ways than your last job. Yes, Remy said, telling herself as much as her future boss. Yes, I can handle it. If I've handled these cases, I can handle anything. The assistant director stood and extended a hand. Remy stood and took it. Then I'm happy to say, Professor Laurel, welcome to the FBI. I think you'll find that you've made the right decision. Yes, Remy said and smiled. Yes, I think I have. This has been The Malice Code, a Remy Laurent FBI suspense thriller, book three, written by Ava Strong, narrated by Kevin E. Green.